Tantor Audio, a division of recorded books, presents Barbarian's Lady by Ruby Dixon. Narrated by Holly Jackson and Mason Lloyd. Chapter 1 Kate Look at how tiny you are, Shale. I'm not sure we're going to have anything to fit you. Maybe one of Josie's old tunics. Seva exclaims as she tries to belt a leather dress around Gail's hips. You humans are so delicate. My shoulders stiffen and I look up from the tunic top I'm sewing, waiting for the inevitable comparison. We've been here a few weeks now, and if there's one thing I've learned, it's that for some girls, it's same shit, different planet. You are nothing like Kate, Seva continues, clucking over Gail's petite figure. She is big and strong like a Saqui female. Yep, there it is. Kate, built like an ox. Kate, beanpole extraordinaire. Kate with the good birthing hips who could double as a linebacker for Green Bay. Strapping Kate who doesn't have blonde hair. That's just a cloud that got lost. I've heard it all before. Gee, Kate, you must have some Nordic ancestry in your blood. Or giants. I stab my bone needle into the leather viciously. I've never been a small girl. Even as a kid, I was taller than the tallest boy in my class, and so there was hope for a while that I'd grow into some tall, willowy supermodel type thing. No such luck. I'm both broad and strong. At six foot one and 180 pounds, I've been mistaken for a professional athlete, or a guy, or the chick that plays the night lady on Game of Thrones. I'm not dainty. I'm not even close. And I'm terribly, terribly thin-skinned about it. It doesn't help that it appears that I've been kidnapped with a bunch of women who seem to average with a height of tiny. Oh, sure, there are a few who are taller, like Liz, or broader, like Maddie and Stacy and Nora. But both? No, I'm that lucky loner. Most of the women who are stranded here on Nodhoth are built more like Gail and Ellie, dainty and ladylike. I'm the only Amazon of the group. Barf. I can't blame the others. It's not like they woke up and decided to be five foot nothing with tiny size zero waists. It's not even like any of us asked to be kidnapped by slaving aliens who apparently have a thing for dainty humans instead of big healthy ones. Worst thing is, I know Seva doesn't mean a thing by it, so I can't say how much it bothers me or let the others know. And considering Seva and Kemley, the older ladies of the Saqui tribe, are about my height and size, I can't even tell anyone that their comments bother me. I might be insulting them by pointing out that, to me, that size is freakish. So I say nothing. I just stab at my sewing. A lot. You okay? Summer asks, leaning in and staring at me with wide eyes. You look pissed. Like I can say anything to Summer. She's a delicate five foot two if she's an inch and probably weighs a hundred pounds soaking wet. And she's beautiful with her almond eyes and gorgeous cheekbones. She would have no idea what it's like to be the corn-fed one out of the group or that it should even matter on a planet where there's no such thing as spring or corn or basketball. I shrug. Just feeling ungrateful, I whisper and I know I shouldn't. I don't want to say too much because Summer's a sweet person, but she's also a nervous babbler. She'll blurt anything and everything when she's anxious, and there's a lot of anxious going on there. Because the clothing is hand-me-downs? Summer asks, nodding a bit of sinew. She holds up the tunic she's working on taking in, of course, and shrugs. I don't mind it. I do feel a bit like a charity case right now, but I suppose that'll go away in time, right? I do wish we had some of Malak's clothes instead of Seva's, because her stuff's really pretty. Some of the other tunics are just kind of... blah. She shrugs. Seems silly to think about fashion while on an ice planet, but I can't help it. I like pretty things. Yeah, but at least you got Seva's clothing. There's a pout in my voice that I hate hearing even for myself. I'm working on a pair of leggings from one of the men because a lot of the women's older clothing has been sized down for the little girls running around in the village and there wasn't anything that would fit me. I'm too broad in the bust for anything Seva or Kemley have, 
so I get guy clothes. Yippee. Besides, I tell Summer, don't feel like a charity case. We're gonna have to make babies with someone here soon enough. You're trading your vajayjay for leatherwear. She makes a horrified face. Don't say that so loud. These people are being nice to us. She pauses for a moment and sets her tunic down in her lap. So, which guy do you think I'm going to have to make babies with? Anyone in particular? She gives an excited little wiggle. It doesn't work as an insult if you're boy crazy, you goof, I tease. I'm cranky, but at least I have friends. Summer's helping my mood even if I do glance over and see pretty pink Brooke being fitted into an adorable tunic with fringe. I want some damn fringe. Instead, I'm letting out the ass in these leggings and hope I don't look too manly. Sigh. Is there anyone you've got your eye on? Anyone you like? Me? She takes my leggings out of my hand and plucks away my needle. You're doing that wrong. Let me. In a matter of moments, she undoes my stitches and fixes them for me and then just keeps on sewing. I let her keep working since she seems to be enjoying this impromptu little party more than me. Josie and Lila have been showing her how to sew while I've learned hunting and she seems to be picking it up pretty well. I'm impressed. She sticks the needle in expertly and then tugs it through again, then casts me a sly look. And as for resonance, I don't know. I mean... I haven't really talked to any of the guys. Have you? I've talked to them, I guess. I shrug. I feel weird around the guys that are single because I feel like a piece of meat. A big one. I can't help but tease Summer a little more, though. And I find it hard to believe that you haven't talked to any of them some. She blushes and makes a silly face. Hardy har, Kate. I can't help it if I get verbal diarrhea. I just get nervous. She focuses on her sewing, not looking me in the eye. They're all really handsome and big. It makes me all jittery. The moment someone even says hello, I'm spouting my life story to him. I chuckle, relaxing on the cushions as she works. You are pretty bad about that, it's true. Why? Summer shrugs. Maybe it's the Asian overachiever in me? I know I'm too much of a tryhard. I'm just not used to being useless. I don't know any useful skills like sewing or growing plants or anything. I know chemistry and philosophy and politics. That's useless here, and the more I think about it, the more nervous I get, so I start talking. And the more I talk, the more I realize I should stop talking, and it just all sprays out like one big word vomit. She grimaces. I think they all think I'm an idiot. No one thinks that, I reassure her. They just think you're... I struggle to find the right word. Bubbly. Yeah, well, I wish I was a bit less regurgitatey. She finishes the panel in my pants and holds it up. How's that look? Better than mine. It doesn't look great, but I figure whatever tunic I have to wear with it will be long enough to cover the diaperish effect the new panel is giving the pants. That's because you're spending all your time with Liz, she tells me. You should hang out with me and Brooke more. She wiggles her eyebrows at me. And we can compare notes on the men. I roll my eyes at that. Slow it down there, crazy pants. They're going to be wandering into your vagina soon enough. Summer gives me a horrified giggle and bats at my arm. Come on. These are all good-looking guys if you ignore the blue and the horns and stuff. She waves a hand at her face, indicating horns or skin or something equally alien. And those probably just take some getting used to. But these guys are hot and built. Don't tell me you haven't seen anything that's caught your eye. That's just it. I'm so awkward and uncomfortable around guys because of my size that I haven't paid that much attention. With one glaring exception. Oh, crap. Here comes Herrick. Don't make eye contact. I grab the pants from her and pretend to bend over the seams, doing my best to appear busy. The jerk's making a beeline over here even though the longhouse is full of people this morning and both Gail and Brooke are standing off to one side talking to Seva and Kemley. Brooke's super cute and she has big boobs. He needs to go hit on her. Instead, he makes his way straight to where Summer and I are sitting, a big shit-eating grin on his face. How do we do this day, lovely females? He nods at the pants I'm holding. 
I see you could not wait to get into my leggings, Kate. Ugh. These aren't yours, are they? He grins and drops to a squat near us, his loincloth hanging low between his legs. Not that I'm looking. His tail flicks close to the fire and he looks far too cocky. Cute, but far too cocky. They are. I donated them once I heard we had a tall female in need of long leggings. Ugh. So he donated them specifically because I'm a stork? What a prince. Well, that explains the stains, I say sweetly. At my side, Summer chokes. Stains? He asks, clearly not getting my joke. Never mind. I get to my feet, vowing to never wear these pants in his presence. They're ruined for me now just because they belong to him. I have to go meet Liz to go hunting. Don't do anything I wouldn't do, Summer calls up to me. Of course, that's pretty much everything, except math. I still like math, but there's not really a place to do math here. So I guess I'll just sit and keep sewing. Women's work and all, you know. Not that this planet doesn't have gender equality. I mean, I guess it does, and it doesn't, because the women tend to stay around the village. But I imagine we can go hunting if we want, like you are. Not that I'm saying you're picking up guy jobs. I wouldn't say that. She gives me a helpless look. I'm babbling again, aren't I? <sighs> it's okay, I tell her with a wink. Poor Summer. I'll catch up with you later. I give Herrick a tight smile and then turn to leave. Do you need help with your weapons? Herrick asks, jogging to my side as I head out of the longhouse. I force myself to remain quiet. The man doesn't know how to buzz off. I have a lot of mixed feelings about life here on the ice planet. On one hand, I'm incredibly glad we were rescued. From the moment I woke up in a cage on a dirty alien spaceship, I knew that things were going to go from bad to worse. I don't remember anything about being captured, and for a few hours I was convinced that I was just having a really bad dream. But then, that really bad dream involved being poked and prodded by alien buyers and being transferred from one ship to another, all while naked, and eventually it sunk in that I'd been nabbed to be a slave. I think I still ended up luckier than most. I was held for a week before the blue guys came to buy all the humans. I know Ellie and Gail were held for a lot longer, and judging by Ellie's filthy, extremely thin appearance, it affected her on the inside. Gail has hinted that things were bad, but she also doesn't like to talk about them, now that it's in the past. Which gives me nightmares, of course, because I imagine just how bad things could have been. Being poked and prodded and dragged around naked is bad enough, and I'm glad it wasn't more than that. I remember being caged with another girl, Chloe, who was everything I'm not. Small, dark-haired, beautiful. She was terrified of everything happening to us and cried in our cell every night. The third day of captivity, someone came in, led by the weird little green guy I'd come to learn was the slave master. The new aliens, reddish and snake-like, inspected both of us, and it seemed they liked Chloe's small size better than mine. They took her away and I still hear her desperate screams in my head. I don't know what happened to her, but I hope it was better than what my imagination keeps serving up. After that week in hell, the remainder of the human captives were taken here to this frosty planet and left behind. We were told that we'd never go home again, we'd have to get a parasite to make living here a reality, and, oh, by the way, we'd have to take the guys here as mates because the parasite is a matchmaker. It's a lot to take in. There's still some gratitude in me, of course. These people are nice, and there's lots of warm clothing and food to go around, which is more than I can say for the slave ship. There are other humans here, and they're all happy and content, despite the fact that they're stranded on an ice planet. I'm trying to follow their lead, but it's difficult. It's hard to be totally happy and okay with the fact that I'll never see home again, never see spring again, Never get to pick my own date. Not that there was a lot of that going on, of course. When you're a girl the size of a linebacker, they aren't exactly lining up to date you. But the fact that my parasite is going to choose a man for me? I can't get past that. Not quite yet. Everyone seems to be quite happy with their mates here, and that's great for them. I can't help but worry that I'll be the first one who hates the person they're stuck with. Or even worse, he hates that he's stuck with me. 
that will just be beyond humiliating. In the week or so that we've been here, I've been doing my best to find a mentor to teach me a viable skill so I won't feel like a big loser that everyone has to take care of. I want to take care of myself. That's the only person you can depend on. So, as much as I like hanging out by the fire with Summer and Brooke and Gail, I've been spending a lot of time with Liz to learn hunting. She's out every day with her mate hunting, even though she has two young children. I've seen her take both her girls hunting with them on good weather days, and on bad weather days, they stay with one of the other women in the village and go to school with the other children. She takes her job as huntress very seriously. I'm told the other women go hunting too, but not nearly as much as Liz, which makes her the perfect teacher. We get along pretty well too. Liz is almost as competitive as I am. Almost. And she's tall and blonde like me, though I still tower over her. I'm not a big fan of her short-tempered mate, but Liz gives him hell, and he seems to like it, so it works for them. She's lucky like that. Me? I don't seem to be quite so lucky, because Herrick's still following me. I cut through the village, heading for the hut I'm sharing with Summer and Brooke. I freaking hate Herrick. I'll never forget the moment I met him. We were all being introduced to the tribe, people crowding around us and making us feel welcome. I felt weirdly comfortable in a village full of tall people, even if they're blue. He'd pushed through the crowd of people, a big smile on his face, and I'd immediately thought he was cute. I liked the warmth in his eyes and his long face that seems made to smile. He's got a big rangy body that looks big even for the barbarian tribe. If this was the type of guy we were supposed to be hooking up with, sign me up. Or so I'd thought. The moment Herrick saw me, all soft feelings I had for him melted away. My eyes, he'd cried out, putting a hand to his chest dramatically. Look at this mountain of a human. And he'd pointed right at me. The others had laughed and Herrick had looked delighted at his joke. Me? I'd wanted to crawl under a rock and hide away. Even among these tall, blue, blue people, I'm still an oddity. So yeah, Herrick's on my shit list. To make it worse, he seems to think that it's fun to pick on me, and so he flirts with me constantly. Since he's already declared I'm a mountain, I know he's not interested in me. He's always laughing and joking, and all of his flirtations come out with a silly grin, and, well... I don't find it funny. I feel like the butt of an ongoing joke, and so I do my best to ignore him. Unfortunately, the more I ignore the dick, the more he decides to pay attention to me. There's not a day that goes past that he's not making some ridiculous little comment or dogging at my heels. It sucks. He knows just what to say or do to make me crazy, too. Wait up, Kate, he calls out as I hustle toward my hut. I'm going to pick up my weapons and then stop by Liz's place to see if she's finished with her morning rounds so she can show me how to practice with my new bow. I'm not very good at it, but that just makes me all the more determined to master it. Kate, Herrick calls again, a few steps behind me. Go away, I tell him and duck into the shared hut. As houses go, it's not much. Brooke's a bit of a slob, and both Summer and I aren't very good with the fire yet, so we tend to let the ashes pile up more than they should. There are furs all over the floors because we're not used to walking on all that cold stone, and the hut itself is pretty crude. It's literally four walls. Though they are carved with some crazy geometric murals of four-armed people, a long counter for a kitchen area, a toilet booth, and a fire pit. My bedding is along the left wall, and I keep my area pretty tidy, mostly because Hurricane Brooke makes me crazy with her mess. My new weapons are neatly lined up and organized, and I move to pick up my bow and the bone arrows that I have prepared. I only have three, but I'm still in practice mode. You should know that a good hunter always makes sure his weapons are sharp enough to pierce hide. Did you sharpen yours this morning? I whip around, gawking at the fact that Herrick is in my damn hut. What are you doing here? You can't just walk in. A confused look crosses his expressive face. But we were talking. You were talking. I was ignoring, I hiss at him. Leave me alone and don't follow me around. What if I was changing? He gestures at the doorway. You did not put the privacy screen up, so I assumed it was safe to enter. The humor returns to his face. 
And if you are undressing, I am glad to assist. I roll my eyes at him. Cool your jets. You know I'm not interested in stripping for you. The last thing I want is a few more Kate the Mountain jokes lopped my way. I sling my bow over my back, shove the arrows into my quiver, and attach it to my belt before turning to glare at him. Goodbye. He chuckles, following me as I head out of the hut again. You act as if I offended you, Kate. Is it because I am trying to share my hunting knowledge with you? He jogs to my side and then begins to walk backward in front of me so he's facing me. I am an excellent hunter, you know. I would be happy to teach you. Oh, brother. I haven't seen much excellence out of your hunting yet, I'm sorry to say. Maybe now that I've insulted him, he'll go away. But his face only lights up and that big, goofy grin spreads. Shall I impress you, then? What would you like for me to hunt for you this day? Whatever gets you the farthest away, I reply sweetly. He considers this, then asks, Fangfish, from the river. I've seen the river he's mentioning, and it's on the far side of the valley. The very first few days I went hunting with Liz, all we did was walk the valley and look at trap lines while she pointed out things I needed to know about. I remember the fangfish. It looks like a bunch of harmless bamboo sticking up from the banks of the river, but pulling one out shows a big, nasty fish with huge teeth and bulging eyes. River sounds good. It's a long walk. Not so long, he boasts. How many fangfish would you like for me to catch for you? I arch an eyebrow at him. How many do you normally catch? He shrugs, the movement fluid and appealing. Two or three. Then catch me eight. That sounds perfectly unreasonable and should keep him away from me all day. Oh-ho! Herrick's eyes gleam. A challenge, eh? Yup. I grin despite myself. He's hard to dislike when he's fun like this. And what will you give me if I win at this challenge? Nothing? A fierce hunter like myself needs more encouragement than that. Will you let me mouth mate you? I feel all flushed and heated at his suggestion. And confused. He's still flirting with me even though the others aren't around? I'm not sure how to take it. Is this legit flirting, or is he still mocking me? No. He makes kissing sound incredibly filthy. Then you will share my furs. His tail flicks back and forth and his grin is wide. This pleases me. I stop in my tracks. Hold up there, buddy. This is not one of those if-you-want-a-kitten-ask-for-a-pony types of things. I'm not kissing you and I'm not sleeping with you just because you catch eight fish. Don't be ridiculous. Then tell me what my prize will be. I cast around for something benign. I'll... Let you take me hunting one day, but only if you come back with eight of those suckers, and good luck with that. Herrick wags a finger at me. I like the way you think, Kate. When I come back to the village tonight with eight fangfish, I shall save the largest one for you. My grin fades. The largest for me because I'm the largest girl? Suddenly this all feels like he's making fun of me again. Day's wasting, I tell him pushing past. You'd better hop to it. He laughs and jogs off. Wait until you see what I catch, Kate. You will be most impressed. Doubt it, I mutter to myself and stalk toward Liz's hut. I can hear the sound of voices inside, but I pause before letting them know I'm here. I'm rattled after my run-in with Herrick, my heart fluttering. I'm unsettled. I can never tell if he's serious or making fun of me, and I suspect he's making fun of me, which makes my attraction to him all the more miserable. I shouldn't like the guy who seems to pick on me constantly, but I can't help it. Which, of course, makes me even more frustrated and confused. I hate the guy when he's away, but when he's around me, I like his humor and his clever words. Until he turns them on me again. I shake my head to clear it of thoughts of Herrick. A kiss, or more, for eight fish. The man's out of his freaking mind. Composing myself, I push my braid off my shoulder and clear my throat outside of Liz's hut. The screen isn't in front of the door, but it just feels weird to walk in, and I think about Herrick's confusion earlier. Liz? It's me. Come in, she calls out. I'm just trying to get these two squirts fed. I duck into the hut and smile at her. 
She's sitting by the fire, her arrows and sharpening stone in hand glaring at her little daughters. Ayla, the younger, looks like she's been crying, and Rochelle, the older, has a smug look on her face. Look at me, Mommy, Rochelle calls out. I ate all of my root cakes and Ayla isn't eating hers at all. Good job, honey bun. And hey, Kate, have a seat. Liz glances at me before looking over at her daughter again. Ayla, I'm going to count to ten, and if you don't eat those cakes... She lets her voice trail off ominously. Ayla's little lower lip juts out and she starts to cry again. I don't like them, Mommy. Does Mommy look like she gives a shit? No, she does not. Eat that or you're having your dinner raw tonight. She looks over at me again since I'm still hovering in the doorway. Kids, oi, I hope you weren't in a hurry today. I'm not. I say, and unsling my bow off my shoulder, then fold my long legs down onto the ground next to her. Mommy, mommy, Rochelle says. Ayla's not eating her cakes. Liz pinches the bridge of her nose. If your daddy was here, Rochelle, he'd tell you no one likes a snitch. And he'd eat those cakes of yours, Ayla, but he's not. So eat them so you can go to school already, okay? Ariana is waiting on you guys. She looks over at me and crosses her eyes. They're always like this when Rahash is gone for a few days. Is he gone? I ask mildly. In a way, I'm kind of glad it's just going to be me and Liz in my lesson today. Rahash is... Well, he's a little glary. Yep, he spoiled my girls rotten. She gives them an affectionate but exasperated look, then reaches over and grabs the last cake from Ayla's plate and shoves it into her mouth. Go on, you two, go to school. Ayla's tears immediately dry, and she launches herself toward the door, quickly followed by her sister. Bye, Mommy. Liz finishes chewing with a little shake of her head. Okay, we're just going to be practicing our aim today, so we'll set up a target on the outskirts of the village and work with that. She reaches over and grabs my quiver, examining my arrows. And the first thing we need to talk about is how dull these arrows are. They need to be sharp enough to pierce hide or else the kill won't be clean. Where's your sharpening stone? Oh, are they that blunt? Herrick was right. I hate that. Chapter 2 Herrick One month later She still refuses to go hunting with me. My Kate is a poor loser. I find this charming, though. Kate is competitive and a poor loser. This is fun. As time passes, I learn more and more about my human female, because I've come to think of her as mine. There has been no resonance between any of the new humans and the hunters except for Beck and strange, smelly Ellie. That suits me fine. If I am not meant to have resonance, at least there are females to share furs with. Since they have not resonated, I have decided that Kate shall be mine. I have been in love with her since the moment I first saw her, I grin to myself as I flex my bad hand. The spot where the fish hook ripped through my palm has healed, but it is still stiff and aches occasionally. I should have been paying more attention, but my thoughts were focused on the tall human with the hair like a cloud, just like it has been every day since the humans arrived. I was never jealous when the first group of humans arrived. I did not resonate, and I figured it was not meant for me. I did not feel strongly toward any of the small, delicate, flat-faced creatures— but I did want a mate. I pursued Tiffany once, long ago, but my heart was not in it like Taushin's was. She resonated to Saluk, and I am glad for my friend. I assumed I would need to be patient, wait for one of the kits to grow up, and see if my Kui sprang to life then. But the moment I saw Kate, I knew she was to be mine. Unlike the other humans, she is tall and strong, her hips curving and sturdy, her teats large and her legs long. She stands tall above them all, and I knew that her body would fit perfectly against mine in the furs. I would not need to bend down to touch mouths to her. I could hold her close and not feel as if I was about to break her. I like that. I also like her strange mane. Out of all the females, she is the palest, her hair like a cloud of snow or a bush in a snowstorm. Unlike Chorshi's big brown curls, Kate's curls are tight and wild, and her colorless mane falls to the middle of her back in a dense nest. I want to touch it and see if it feels as soft as it looks. 
Even her small brows are pale and colorless. Fascinating. She is not completely pale, though. When she is upset, her cheeks flush a bright red. I find this adorable, so I do my best to make her blush. She dislikes my flirting, I think, but she will come around. I will give her time. I have all the time in the world to woo her. I watch as she sits with him, Allo, frowning at the skin in front of her. It's stretched over a frame and bits of gristle and blood vessels hang off of the underside. It is the skin from her first kill, and he is showing her how to clean the hide. Ever since she arrived here, my Kate has done her best to learn what she can. All of the females are, but while Sumer and Bubrook take to learning village life, Kate wishes to learn to be a hunter. She is like Liege, fierce and strong. I like that. I like that very much. I flex my hand again and watch as she picks up her scraper. Dude, you're totally creeping. I glance over and see Madi standing nearby, her son Massan perched on her hip. She raises an eyebrow at me and then looks pointedly over at Kate. What is this creepin? I ask. After seasons of being around humans, I am surprised when new words continue to appear. It means you're being weird around her. Let her breathe. She gives a little shake of her head. You want her to pay attention to you? Freaking lay off her for a few days. Let the poor thing breathe. I do let her breathe, I protest, caught off guard. I do not hover around Kate that much. Do I? Perhaps I do, but I want her to know of my interest. For a strong, smart female, she is rather clueless when it comes to letting a male woo her. I make it a point to say hello to her every day, to challenge her and praise her on her hunting, and tease her to do better. I treat her like I would one of the other hunters, and she responds with feisty, angry words and an upturned nose. Of course, I do not mind this, because she is beautiful when she is angry, but I would like her to soften toward me. Perhaps I am creeping too much after all. You think I should go help her with her skin? I ask Madi. She rolls her eyes at me. You should leave her alone. Aren't you guys all going on a trip to the Elder's Cave tomorrow? Let her have a day off from your clingy ass, hun. She's not going anywhere. She nods at her hut. Come on, I'll feed you and you can come chat with Hassan. I frown as she hands me her son. But I do not wish to chat with Hassan. I know, Madi says. That's the point. You want to stay here and give her googly eyes from the shadows, but you're not going to win her like that, okay? So come sit down and eat and take a chill pill. I have heard this chill pill before. It is not a real thing. I ruffle Massan's hair and chuckle. Well, if your mother is going to feed us, how can I refuse? Massan leans in and squeezes my nose, then waits. I obediently make a honking noise, and he breaks into peals of laughter. Ah, kids, they are such fun and so simple to understand. Not like my Kate at all. With one last look in her direction, I follow Madi back to her hut. I duck inside and raise a hand to Hassan as I enter, holding Massan under my other arm with ease. My fellow hunter sits by the fire, a spread of weapons and supplies near his feet. Ho, oh, friend, readying for a hunt? He nods, rubbing his chin. It is my turn to go in the far trails this time. Madi makes a face and leans over her mate, pulling his face to her teats and holding him close playfully. And I'm going to miss the heck out of him. Mmm. He nuzzles his mate's teats through her tunic, making her squeal and causing Massan to giggle aloud. I ignore their flirting and sit by the fire. Wow, Madi says, moving to the fire and ladling a bit of stew into a bowl. That was the perfect opportunity for you to make a crack about how we need to calm down and nothing from you? You feeling okay, Harak? I rub the scar on my palm absently. My thoughts are elsewhere today. Uh-huh. She hands me the bowl and a carved spoon. With a certain tall blonde? Of course. There is no sense denying it. Everyone in the tribe knows of my determination to win Kate. It has been a full turn of the moon, and I am no closer to winning her into my furs than I have ever been. It is almost as if she truly does not like me. Imagine that, Madi says, and glances over at her mate. She picks up another bowl and ladles it full of food, then sits next to her son and pulls him into her lap while he eats. Or it's like you don't get the hint, Harak. Hint? I stir my spoon in the food, but I am not hungry. What do you mean? Leave it, my mate. 
Harak cautions Mahdi. We promised we would not get involved. Get involved? I echo, questioning. What do you mean? He means we're not taking sides, Mahdi says with a wave of her hand. I'm not going to play matchmaker, things like that. Hassan just shakes his head at his mate. She thinks you need help wooing her. I do. Oh, boy, do you ever, Mahdi cries. You're coming on like a bad rash, dude. When her mate gives her another shake of his head, Mahdi turns to him. I'm not interfering, babe. I'm just offering some advice, that's all. They're all leaving tomorrow for a few weeks, so get your panties out of a knot. I'm just going to give him some tips on how to win his lady. Hassan rolls his eyes. Because you are the expert on wooing. I wooed you, didn't I? She gives him a sultry wink and then pokes her son in the belly. Eat, my son. After you finish eating, Daddy's going to watch you while Mommy does laundry. Because Mommy is rewarding her mate when he does, Hassan says in a low voice, giving Mahdi a heated look. These two are never very focused. Let us discuss Kate more, I interrupt. What do you mean I am on her like a rash? I mean you never let up on her, Mahdi tells me as Masan lifts his spoon to his mouth. Every time she turns around, boom, there you are. Maybe you ease up a little. But how will she know of my interest? I shake my head at her. She does not know Kate like I do. It is clear she has not picked up on my hints. If anything, I need to be stronger in my efforts to woo her. Hassan just snorts and does not look up from his task, stuffing items back into his hunting pack. Oh, sweetie, Mahdi says in a placating voice. People two galaxies over can tell you're interested. It's not that she hasn't noticed, it's that she's ignoring it. My guess is that you make her uncomfortable. I ponder what she is saying as I take a bite of stew. What she is saying could be true. My cape does tend to get stiff-shouldered when I approach her. I thought she was merely shy or unobservant. Perhaps not. So how do I make her comfortable? Has she ever smiled or laughed in your presence? Hassan asks and leans over. And Mahdi, hand me that pack of trail rations. Oh, I thought we were staying out of this, Mahdi says in a sweet voice. Guess that changed, didn't it? She chuckles and hands him two packs. Bring extra. I don't want you starving on me. I ignore their banter for a moment, thinking. Kate's smiling. Kate laughing. It is discouraging that I cannot think of many times where I have made her laugh or smile. Ah, wait. I set my spoon in my bowl and flex my hand, thinking. The day I went fishing to get her eight fangfish. She laughed and smiled as she gave me the challenge, a glint in her eyes. My Kate is competitive. She likes a challenge. And I have not been challenging her. I have simply been teasing her, flirting with her in the hopes that she would flirt back. I have spent every moment in the village near her in the hopes she would encourage me. I should have been prodding at her and challenging her, making her think, making her feel the need to compete, giving her something to focus on to interest her mind. Of course, it is obvious now. I jump to my feet, encouraged, and in doing so, accidentally fling the bowl of stew from my lap and into the fire. Oh. My thoughts full of Kate, I automatically reach over to grab at the small bone bowl before it begins to burn. And I am immediately tackled by Hassan, his large weight flinging me to the ground. No! My head bangs on the stone floor and I lie on my back, dizzy. I grunt with pain as Masan begins to cry and Mahdi soothes him. I rub my head, stunned. Was that necessary? You fool! You almost stuck your hand in the fire! Hassan gives me an incredulous look and then gets off me, holding a hand out to me. Do not harm yourself in front of my mate and son, please. Harm myself? Bah! I get to my feet slowly, ignoring his offered hand. You act as if I would tip into the fire and burn my face off. This is you, is it not? That is exactly what I think, Hassan says with a laugh. He moves to his crying son and scoops him up, soothing him while Mahdi watches me with wide eyes. Bah! I get to my feet and rub the back of my head again. It is not wet, the skin unbroken. I am relieved and my gut churns a little at the thought of my head bleeding. Perhaps I should see the healer. Then again, perhaps not. If word gets out that I was injured again, they will never let me go on the journey with the others to the Elder's Cave, and I plan on being next to Kate every step of the way. I rub my head, lost in thought. I need time to contemplate the best way to get her to compete with me, to make a game of travel, and most of all to make her laugh and smile. 
Kate. Oh, could you carry my pack for me? I would love that so much. Brooke gives the silent Warwick a sugary sweet smile. It's just so big and we've got such a long way to walk, don't we? He takes the pack from her with a nod and settles it on the sled, tying it in. Then he looks over at Gale and Summer, who are standing close by, and puts a hand out. They immediately hand over their packs of supplies, and poor Summer starts to babble about how nice Warwick is for doing this for them, and then proceeds to move right into an in-depth analysis of the day's weather, all directed at Warwick, who's almost as quiet as Ellie. Are you going to go and give him your pack? A too familiar voice says, and Herrick appears at my side, all sly grins, long braids, and blue muscle. He's got a huge pack on his own back, just like all the other hunters. Even Ellie's got a small one that she hasn't given up. There's something about his tone that makes me bristle. Is it because I'm Kate the Beanstalk that he thinks I should be strong enough to carry my own pack? Or is he teasing me that we're all weak ninnies? Either way, I shake my head and hold my straps tighter. If you guys can carry packs, I can too. He lifts his chin in silent acknowledgement. I give it one day. That's so. I bet I can make it the whole damn journey without having to ask for someone to carry my pack. I stand a little straighter in the calf-deep snow. We're at the edge of the gorge, having just ridden up the pulley into the valley. Looming ahead is a long, several-day walk to the Elder's Cave, which is apparently a really old spaceship. It's the same one that brought the ancestors of the Saqui tribe here to Not Hoth, and there are a few tribesmates there that are working to get it running again. Since this is the last window of time before the brutal season, this place's version of winter, it was decided that all the humans should go and get the Saqui language taught to us by the computer, retrieve the tribesmates staying there and bring them home, and stop off at a nearby fruit cave for some last-minute winter supplies. It all sounds legit except for the fact that they picked all the bachelors of the tribe to accompany us. To me, this feels like one big long singles cruise. Tao Shen, Warek, Sessa, and Herrick are accompanying us, along with Beck, who's now made it to Ellie, and Vaza, who's hooked up with Gale. Singles, cruise. The others can sense it too. Brooke's putting on her best flirty mood, even if Warwick and Taushan aren't the most receptive audience. Warwick's so mild and quiet that I don't know that he's even interested in getting a mate. Taushan? Well, he just seems kind of... surly. He's abrupt to everyone and walking ahead of the group, ready to get us moving along on the multi-day journey. And because Brooke's being flirty, it's making Summer edgy, I think, because she's babbling to Warwick about a science camp she went to when she was in eighth grade. Poor Summer and her nervous blabbermouth. Tao Shen's taking off at the front, and Vaza and Gale are right behind him. There's a sled full of supplies, and packs now, that Warwick is pulling for this leg of the trip. Beck and Ellie are going to take up the rear of the group. Of course, this leaves me with Herrick. Herrick the obnoxious flirt. I wonder if I can walk with Ellie and Beck. I'm not particularly close to Ellie. No one is, except Gail. She's quiet and thin, all eyes and her pale, narrow face. When I first met her, she stank and wore several years of dirt and didn't talk to anyone. Now, well, she still doesn't talk much, but she's clean and even kind of pretty. She's not nearly as thin as she was, and occasionally her serious little face turns up in a smile at something Beck says. She clings to his hand, and he fusses over her adoringly. It's kind of cute, and it makes me lonely. I thought Beck was kind of mean and unpleasant, but he's a huge teddy bear around delicate Ellie. Every now and then I catch her whispering something at him that makes him smile, and it makes me feel good to see them so happy. Someone's got a happy ending out of this at least. Gail too, actually. She's older than the rest of us, probably old enough to be my mom. And Vaza's one of the older men in the tribe, a widower. He fell for Gale the moment he saw her, though, and she's let him chase her around, acting like she's in control of the relationship. Though I suspect it's far more mutual than Gale lets on. He dotes on her, though. If I'm going to resonate to someone, why can't it be someone like that? But the three single guys that are left in the tribe? I... Ugh. I just don't know. 
Of course, there's also lanky Sessa, who's just about to hit his adulthood and seems to be all hormones. I don't know if I want that either. Basically, if my cootie decides to go off like a bad fire alarm, I'm screwed. Chapter 3. Kate. We set off, our party moving slowly across the landscape. There's no hurry since we'll be walking for a few days, and I notice that Brooke and Summer settle in near Warwick chatting. Herrick decides to keep walking next to me. Figures. I decide I'll endure it. There's not much else to do other than to be rude and tell him to buzz off, and I don't want to start the trip like that. It's silent for a few minutes, and I glance back to see how far we've come. Not all that far, but I do see Ellie and Beck holding hands. Gosh, they're cute. I feel another lonely twinge. It's not that I want Beck. I just want to be as happy as Ellie looks. And it's not that I want a man for said happiness. I just want to feel like I belong, not like a freak show or someone wanted only for her childbearing womb. That would be nice. This shall be an interesting trip, Herrick murmurs, grabbing my attention. How so? I have to ask. He glances behind us, then looks up ahead. This feels as if we are deliberately being sent off so we may spend time together. He leans in closer to me, his voice dropping. I suspect they wish for all of us to resonate all at once and solve the problem of anyone remaining unmated. I can't help but laugh because he's saying the exact same thing I'm thinking. <laughs> On Earth? We call it a date, though I guess something like this would be a group date. You go out with someone to see if you're compatible. I do not see any pleasure matings happening in this group other than the ones that have already occurred, he tells me and then gives me a sly look. Other than ours, of course. I ignore that part. You don't think Warwick or Taoshen like anyone? Or Sessa? I don't like any of them romantically, but I feel a little bad for both Summer and Brooke, because they're nice and pretty and maybe they want a boyfriend. Slim pickings in this group, though. At his little snort, I say, maybe they're just being nice and giving everyone space. Herrick laughs. Is that what it is? What do you think it is, then? I retort, curious. He shrugs, walking easily next to me. I know all of them. I have grown up with them. I know how they think. Well, now I'm really curious. And what do you suppose they are thinking right now? Herrick gives me one of those sly smiles that makes him so handsome and infuriating. What will you give me if I tell you? A punch to the face? He laughs, apparently amused by my sudden offer of violence. I can't help but smile a little, too. Looks like he takes me about as seriously as he takes himself, which is to say, not at all. You may keep your fists to yourself, but I will share my knowledge with you anyhow, because I am an excellent observer. Oh, the best, I tease. Please, lay your knowledge upon me. Sessa, Herrick begins is not interested in a resonance mate at this time, especially a human one. He very much wished for Farley to pleasure mate with him, but she resonated to Mardok. He is the strange one with the skin etchings and the shiny horns. You will meet him at the Elder's Cave. Strange one, huh? Skin etchings? Dare I ask? He reaches out and touches my arm, tracing a finger over it. Even though I have long sleeves on, I still get goosebumps for some silly reason. Pictures on the skin. Oh, tattoos? I have one of those. You do. He looks astonished, then makes a gesture with his hand. Show me. I wish to see. What? No way, I'm not showing you. Some of the others might be into casual nudity, but I most definitely am not. Mine is on my butt cheek, because that was the only place I could get it without my super strict stepfather seeing it. I think sadly of him and my mother, but the grief has been dulled by weeks of knowing I'll never return and is now merely an unpleasant ache. At least they're happy together and can comfort each other. You grow sad, Herrick says, pausing in his steps. Is it the skin etching? It is personal? I shake my head, staring resolutely ahead at Gale and Vaza. It's nothing I want to talk about. I have made your smile disappear. This wounds me. So dramatic. He has to be joking, and I'm not in the mood for his faux flirtiness. 
Just go on with what you were saying. Sess is in love with someone else, right? Doesn't bother me because I haven't said two words to Sessa, who reminds me of a sulky teenager despite the horns and blue skin. If I notice one of the other girls flirting his way, though, I'll pass it on. No sense in Brooke or Summer getting their hearts broken. Yes, he will get over it in time, but he is young. As for Warwick, he is a quiet one and has never shown interest in a mate. Why is that? Does he not like kids? He seems nice enough, if quiet. Or women? No, he likes both. I suspect he is shy. His mother and sister died in the quee sickness many years ago, and his father grieved so deeply that I suspect he is afraid to risk his heart. Oh, I get that. It's hard to put yourself out there. God knows I'm well aware of that. Which one's his dad? His father died in the cave in six turns ago when we lost our home. Eesh. I'm sorry to hear that. It was a difficult time. He shrugs and gestures at Taoshen far ahead, so distant that he doesn't look like more than a blue speck on the horizon. So much for leisurely walking. That is another one that is afraid to try again. He was very eager to mate when the humans first arrived, and had his sights set on Tiffany. I can see that. Tiffany's gorgeous. But she made it to Saluk? Yes. And then he hoped to mate to one of the sisters when they arrived, but they resonated to others. I think perhaps he wished to mate with Farley as well, but when her queen chose another, he gave up hope. He thinks he will be alone forever. If one of the females wishes to take him to her furs, she will have to approach him. He holds himself back because he is weary of his queen's silence. He glances over at me. You will find this difficult to believe, but Tao Shen was once very happy and eager. He's right. I do find that difficult to believe. The Tao Shen I know is far more cynical and impatient. Guess his glass is no longer half full. He carries many wounds on his heart, Herrick says. So basically, you're telling me that out of the Bachelor crew, we have a teen boy, a shy guy, and a broken-hearted sourpuss. And you. Well, isn't this ducky? Yes, and I am taken. He gives me a cocky grin. Does she know you're flirting with me? I shoot back at him. He laughs. Who do you think has stolen my heart? He puts his hands over his chest and then gestures at me. It belongs to you, beautiful human Kate. Oh, barf. Spare me. He only laughs harder at my disgust. It's a long, long day of travel. I'm in good shape due to the fact that I helped my stepfather and my mom out with the family gym, but even I'm ready to drop at the end of the day. My pack gets heavier by the hour, and I regret letting Herrick goad me into carrying it instead of lobbing it onto the sled next to the others. Of course I'll die before I drop it now, because then he'll think he's won. We all collapse in front of a small cave at the end of the first evening. A big fire is built close to the entrance, and since the cave isn't large enough for everyone to sleep in, it's decided that Summer, Brooke, and I will take the cave. Ellie and Gail are going to snuggle with their men outside, and the others will hang around the fire. I don't complain. The wind is making my face hurt by the end of the evening, and I'm ready to get out of it. What a long, awful day. Summer complains as she strips off her outermost layers of furs inside the cave, and Brooke makes a noise of agreement. I don't know how you managed to walk the whole time, Kate. I was exhausted after an hour. Any irritation I feel at them quickly fades at that comment. I could have ridden with them, it's true. It was only my stubborn pride, and the thought of Herrick's two knowing smiles, that kept me from jumping on board with them. It's clear both Brooke and Summer are exhausted, though. Gail and Ellie are wilting, too, out by the fire. It was hard, I tell them. I should have joined you. You should tomorrow, Brooke says. I promise there's room. Maybe, is all I say. I probably won't, just to show the others that I can hang with the boys. It's that competitive side in me again. After growing up with a stepfather who pushed me constantly to work harder, lift more weights, run faster, I can't bear the idea of being thought of as weak. I'm going to walk if it kills me. I'm going straight to bed, Brooke declares as she lies down, pulling her furs over her body and huddling under them. Summer, come snuggle next to me so we can share body heat. You too, Kate. I will soon, I tell them. I'm going to hang out by the fire for a few, I think. 
The others are talking quietly outside, and I want to hear what's being said over there. I emerge from the cave again after them and move toward the fire. Sessa, Taoshen, Herak, and Warak are standing off to one side while Beck is wrapped around Ellie, a fur on his shoulders, his mate protectively cradled in his arms. Gale is cuddled against Vaza, and the moment I step near the fire, I feel weird for being the only single girl out here. Maybe I should have hung back with the others. I cross my arms under my breasts and hunch my shoulders, wondering if I should go back inside to grab an outer fur. It's a mild evening for the ice planet, but it's still an ice planet. Immediately, the thorn in my side peels off from the group and comes to stand by me. Shall I warm you with my body heat, Kate? Herrick gives me an appealing grin and flexes his arms. I can hold you close. It would be no trouble. Gale chuckles and I see Tauschen smirk. I feel like a big idiot. Why does he always have to embarrass me? I roll my eyes and push Herrick away when he reaches for me. Buzz off. I just came to hang out by the fire. There is time yet, Herrick says, undeterred by my reaction. It is a long journey with many cold nights ahead. Wouldn't you just love that? I would, yes. He grins at me. I'd rather freeze, thank you. Would you? I should like to think I could have you in my arms before we return to the tribe. My face feels like it's burning with humiliation. That will never happen. That sounds like a challenge. Or common sense. You will eventually realize what a good pleasure mate I would make you, Kate. He leans forward, ignoring my angry look. I will be more than happy to explore between your thighs with my tongue. Ah, do you ever let up? I move forward and reach up, slapping a hand over his mouth. He grins under my fingers and removes my hand. Never. How else will you know of my affections? Is that what you call it? I snap back, flustered. More like delusions. The others laugh, except for Beck, who makes an irritated sound. Are you two going to stand by the fire and bicker all night? My Ellie needs to sleep. Ellie pokes Beck in the ribs. Be nice, she whispers, just loud enough for me to hear. No need. I think I'm done here, I tell them. See you guys in the morning. I duck back into the cave, pressing a hand to my burning cheeks to cool them. God, does Herrick have to continue his shtick in front of the others? That didn't take long, Summer mumbles sleepily, looking like a big furry caterpillar on the floor next to Brooke. Changed my mind, I tell them in a low voice. Go to sleep. I grab my blankets and burrow in on Brooke's other side, but I can't fall asleep. Instead, I'm thinking about Herrick and his laughing smiles, the amusement of the others, my embarrassment, and Herrick's comment about going between my legs. I press my thighs tightly together and wish I wasn't thinking about it, but I am. Herrick. She does not like you. Beck declares by the fire two evenings later. Give up and leave her alone. Leave her alone? Never. The thought is unbearable. I have decided that Kate is mine. At his snort, I continue. It is true. I must only convince her of this. Your convincing needs work, he says, surly, and glances over at his mate, asleep in the furs nearby. His expression softens and he moves to be by her side, touching her mane. She turns in her bed, smiles sleepily at him and puts her cheek on his thigh as a pillow. I am glad for my friend, but envious as well. I want what he has with his mate. Beck has changed so much in the last turn of the moons, ever since he resonated to Ellie. He no longer has that hungry, dissatisfied look on his face. He is content. He is happy. I want that happiness. I want a mate and a partner. Not one as delicate or somber as Ellie, I think. Someone fun. Someone who can tease as well as me. And kits do not matter. Resonance does not either. I am tired of being lonely. If resonance will not happen for me, I will not bother to wait for it. I will claim the female I want and we will be happy together. At least until one of us resonates to someone else. But I do not make trouble where it is not and I will not worry about such things. And Kate... Kate is perfect for me, tall and strong, not tiny and far too delicate for my clumsy hands. 
She snaps back at me when she is angry, and the flush on her cheeks is my favorite sight to see. I like her fire. Someday it will not be directed at me, but shared with me. I will wear her down, I tell Beck confidently, and smile to show him I am not worried. She will like me eventually. She just needs to realize I am the right hunter for her. He gives a snort of disbelief. He does not need to believe. That is fine. He just needs to know I am serious about Kate, that she is the female for me. I am more convinced every day that I spend with her that no other female is so perfect, so sharp of wit, so capable, so unique and lovely in appearance. And since being with the group has not made her appreciate my wooing, perhaps it is time to do as the others have done and convince her to travel alone with me for a few days. I have given this quite a bit of thought on the journey, with nothing to do but walk next to Kate, wanting to touch her but unable to, wanting her to realize that I am the hunter for her. She does not seem to realize it, so we need time alone. A few nights by a fire to ourselves in which we can talk without others around, staring and watching our every move. It has worked for so many other couples, Beck and his Ellie included, that I have thought and thought about it and decided upon a course of action. If you see that we have fallen behind the group, I tell Beck casually, do not bother to come looking for us. He gives me a surprised stare. I grin at him to show him I have given this much thought. I will leave behind a boot so you know it was on purpose, and then I will entice Kate into my furs. I will bring her back once her heart is mine. Beck rolls his eyes at me. He does not need to believe. He just needs to remember. A boot, I remind him. If you see it, know I have spirited my female away. And what if she does not wish to go? I cannot let you just take a female away from the group. Oh, she will want to go with me, I boast to him. She will go of her own accord. She might need some convincing to stay, perhaps, but I can get her away from the others for a time, I think. He grunts. She will still need the words from the elder's cave, so you cannot take her away for long. You will meet us there? I nod, pleased. I know it will not be much time away, but I hope it will be enough. We plan to be at the elder's cave for a hand of days, yes? I will have her back by the third day. This I promise. He clenches his jaw, thinking. And I cannot stop you? You cannot? I would do this even if he disapproved. Beck sighs. <sighs> then do what you must, but it is your hide you are risking. You know Vectal does not like it when the humans are stolen. This one will not be stolen. She will come with me willingly. Wait and see. He strokes a hand through his sleeping mate's mane. Your idea of willing and mine seem two very different things, my friend. It is midday before I know how best to steal Kate away from the others. We pass through one of the many valleys between the rocky hills and then crest one of the cliffs, walking along the edge because the snows of the next valley are too deep. After that, there is a canyon that fills with a thick sheet of ice when the weather is colder, and since we recently had a days-long snowstorm, it will be a very large sheet of ice, indeed. On the other side of that ice, though, is a hunter cave not often used, and farther down the valley itself cuts to the far side of this particular set of craggy hills. I could take Kate across the great ice sheet and we could meet the others on the far side. Or we could stop at the hunter cave there for several days and get to know each other in the furs. I like that idea better. Now, of course, the question is how to convince Kate to go to the great ice sheet with me. I glance over at my walking companion. We are only about halfway through our journey, but the humans are showing their weariness. It is a long journey for them, unused to making lengthy treks in the snow. Cessa is far ahead, scouting. At the front of the group, Vaza carries his pleasure mate, Chael, like he would a pack. She has tried to walk much of this journey, but she is tired, as is Beck's mate, Ailey. They walk near to the back of the group, holding hands, their pace slower than normal. In the middle, Warak and Tauschen trade off, pulling the sled with our supplies, the humans Babruk and Sumer riding along. At the very back of the group, I walk with Kate. Every day she wears her pack, and every day she walks. Every day she falls a little bit farther behind the others. And I feel guilty that she is struggling to keep up. Of all the humans, she is the strongest. Her pack is larger than Ellie's, and she has no one to carry her when she is tired. Even Ellie has accepted Beck's help, resting in his arms from time to time. But Kate struggles on alone, and every suggestion I have made that she should hand me her pack is met with an angry glare. 
I have played into her stubbornness too much, and she suffers. She will be glad for a few days' rest, I think, and the sheet of ice will be the tool I will use. As a group we pass the rocky path that leads to the valley of ice. I know we will not go there with a sled. The path itself is far too narrow, and walking on the ice can be precarious. But I think Kate will want to see it. I just need to encourage her. So I glance over at my lovely human. Her cheeks are flushed bright pink with the wind, her white curls tamed into a fat, frizzy braid on one shoulder. Her steps are slogging, and she looks weary, her gaze cast on the ground. I must find a way to get her attention, to make her come with me. I jog up next to her and pretend to give her an up-and-down critical glance. Immediately, her back stiffens. What? You are walking slow today, Kate. Are you too tired to go on? Do I need to carry your pack for you? Her jaw sets, and she gives me an angry look. Don't you have someone else you could walk next to? I could, but I prefer walking next to you. Why? Because you can harass me? It is not harassment. I enjoy your company. Well, I don't enjoy yours, you turd. Go away. I laugh. She is so fierce when she is frustrated with me. It is adorable. But she is walking faster now. I think you secretly enjoy spending time with me and just do not want the others to know it. She makes a face in my direction. No chance of that, buddy. Lies, I say confidently. Who else will educate you on hunting as we walk? I offer my knowledge freely. Yeah, because no one in their right mind would ask for your opinion. Up ahead of us, Beck turns and growls. Are you two going to argue the entire trek? Yes, I shoot back, grinning. And I'm surprised to hear Kate's small laugh of amusement. It makes me feel good. I know she likes me underneath her hard words, or else she would refuse to banter with me. It confirms that my decision is the right one. I just need to figure out how to make her leave with me so I can woo her in private. I think for a moment and then lean in closer as she walks. Do you want advice on how to walk? Kate recoils, looking at me as if I am crazy. Advice on how to walk? In snowshoes. There are better ways to do it, I tell her. And when she pauses in the snow, her hands on her hips, I pause with her and plant my foot on the side of one of her shoes so she cannot walk away. She makes an outraged sound trying to lift her foot. Stop it. You're being a child. You are walking like one. No wonder you are so tired. I gesture at her shoes. You should kick the snow as you step, not lift your entire foot. Kate just stares at me. I am trying to help. I put a hand to my heart. Your suspicion wounds me. She rubs her brow, and for a moment she looks so tired and miserable that my heart wrenches. Why can't you leave me alone for five minutes? Do you truly hate me so much? Perhaps I have read her wrong after all. The defeat on her face makes my spirit hurt. The last thing I want is for my Kate to feel defeated when near me. Her eyes meet mine, and for a moment she looks confused. I don't hate you. That is good, because you have my heart, I tell her, taking this moment of softness to tell her how I feel. I take her hand and clasp it between both of mine. It beats solely for you, my Kate. She looks uncomfortable once more and pulls out of my grip. Stop it, Hark. Just stop teasing me for five minutes, okay? I'm tired. She looks up at the others, who are getting far ahead of us. I'm tired of all this snow and the walking, and I just want five minutes without you giving me shit or making me feel stupid, all right? Making her feel stupid? By declaring my affection? I want to ask about this, but she has given me the perfect opening for my plan to take her across the glacier. If you are tired of snow, we could walk where there is none. She mean like Florida? Kate's hands go to her hips. I do not know that place, but there is an ice sheet in the next valley. I point down the steep hill. We do not go there because the path is too narrow for the sled, but it cuts across these cliffs and comes out the other side. A short way, as your people say. A shortcut? Yes, that is it. She drums her gloved fingers on her mouth, thinking, then glances ahead. What about the others? I lean toward her and step on her snowshoe again so she cannot escape me. I did not invite the others, pretty Kate. Her cheeks flush and she flicks her gaze at my mouth before looking me in the eye again. Are we going to get in trouble if we take a shortcut? Why would we? We will meet the others on the far side of the valley and rest our feet while they jog to catch up. I give her an encouraging smile. 
and the ice is beautiful to see. Is it dangerous? I thought glaciers were dangerous. No more so than walking on the edge of a cliff in snowshoes, I tell her, gesturing at our current path. When she still hesitates, I add, unless you would rather ride in the sled. Her eyes narrow at me, and she gives a toss of her snowy pale braid. That is a dick move. A dick move? I do not know this word. I rub my chin, frowning. I thought I knew most of the human phrases by now. A dick move. You are a dick. That was a crappy thing to say to get me to go with you. It's a low blow. You know I'm not riding in the damn sled. She scowls at me, voice rising, and then looks up ahead to see if the others have noticed our spat. She notices, as I do, that the others are far ahead and getting farther ahead the longer we stand here and argue. And since you've practically dared me, show me the dang glacier already. I just grin at her, pleased. You are lovely when you are angry, you know. Oh, stuff it, she retorts, huffy, and get off my damn snowshoe. I chuckle, obliging her. She adjusts her pack and then glares at me, waiting. Down this path, I tell her, putting a hand to the small of her back and turning her. We will follow this down the side of the canyon. See the trail? As I show her, I loosen one of my extra boots from the bottom of my pack and toss it in the snow a short distance behind her. It is my signal to Beck that Kate comes with me willingly and not to look for us. I see the trail, my sweet Kate says. The ice is just on the other side. From there it is a short distance to the opposite end of the valley. And the cave I wish to take her to first so I can woo her in private. Chapter 4 Kate Herrick's right about one thing. The glacier is really pretty. It looks like a river of snow nestled between the cupped rock hands of the mountains, but as we get closer, I see that it's not snow but ice. Thick, thick ice. It creaks and groans as we approach, and I shoot Herrick a worried look. He's right that there's not as much snow in this direction. It's all rock and ice, but I'm not sure it's safe in the slightest. You're sure about this? Maybe we should rejoin the others. I am positive, pretty Kate. Herrick says confidently, and then begins to climb the sloping side of the ice sheet to the top. It's about four or five feet tall from this point, but I can tell that as it goes into the valley, it gets bigger and wider. Herrick pauses at the edge of the sheet, leans down, and offers me his hand. And even though I should tell him no, to turn around and rejoin the others, I'm still flustered by the pretty Kate comment. There's no one around to hear his silly jokes, so why is he still calling me pretty? And why am I such a doofus to be all flattered by it? I automatically reach my hand up to him and he shakes his head, long black hair spilling over his shoulder like he's a model. Glove off so I can grip your hand, he tells me. Snowshoes too. Oh. I pull my glove off and shove it into the front of my tunic and then strap my snowshoes to my pack. I offer him my hand again. This time, his big hand clasps mine, and I'm immediately shocked at how warm and strong his grip is. The touch of our hands feels incredibly intimate, and I'm blushing as he hauls me up next to him. Of course, he's so strong that I immediately stagger on the ice, losing my balance and have to hold on to him. Herrick chuckles, his other hand going under my arm. Do you have your feet, or shall I carry you? Dick, I tell him but he only laughs and I find myself smiling too. I put my glove back on, my belly still full of flutters, and just when I think I'm cool and calm again, he unstrings his bow and hands it over to me. To use as a walking stick, he tells me, so you can be sure of your footing. And then my flutters all return again. Thank you. I take the bow and use it as a walking stick. The first few steps on the ice are a little treacherous, but I get used to it, and in no time we're walking along the glacier. It's not smooth like an ice rink, but rough and uneven on top, which makes it not that hard to walk on. It's pretty, too. The glacier seemingly so white it's blue underneath. The suns are shining down and the weather's nice enough, and it's a change of pace. It's awfully quiet separated from the group, though. I glance over at Herrick. Do you take this shortcut often? He shrugs. When I come this way in the bitter season, in the brutal season, there is too much snow covering the great ice, and it hides the cracks. Cracks? I don't like the sound of that. 
My steps slow, and I begin to eye the thick sheet of ice underneath us with trepidation. There are cracks? Of course. More are up ahead. He gestures higher on the glacier, deeper between the cliffs. We will just skirt them carefully. There is no need to worry. Yeah, but I can't help but worry. We're on a glacier, and we've split off from the pack. That's horror movie rule number one. You never split away from the group. Maybe we should go back. Bah, come, do not be so scared. He jogs a few steps ahead and then turns back to me. Or shall I tell the others you were too tired to continue and I had to come retrieve you? Such a dick. Seriously. I have no idea why I followed this guy down here. But then he gives me another one of those goofy grins when I growl and start walking after him, and I remember why. It's because I'm an idiot when it comes to this man. I hate him, and I want him desperately to like me all at the same time. I hate it when he pretends to flirt with me, but then I melt when he calls me Pretty Kate. I guess if he was sincere, I'd have a hard time resisting him. But he's so blatant and over the top with his flirting that it's clear it's all designed to make me feel silly. And that's the most disappointing thing. There's a loud crack of the ice and I yelp, flinging myself at him. He laughs, his arms going around me. It is ice, Kate. It will make noises. Do not be afraid. I realize I'm clinging to him a moment later, my arms around his neck, my breasts pushing against his chest. For a brief moment, I feel tiny and girly against him, and it's an amazingly intoxicating feeling. I've grown up being as tall or taller than most men I've ever met, but to Herrick, I barely come up to his chin. That should not be nearly as sexy as it is. Or the smile he gives me. That shouldn't be sexy either. I can feel my face turning red as I push away from him. Sorry. It is ice. It will make noises and sounds as we walk, but you are safe. I will scout ahead for cracks and we will skirt around them. He grins down at me. Unless you would rather I carry you. There's the Herrick I know and don't love. Hard pass, buddy. He just laughs. We continue walking, and as we do, Herrick points out things to me that tell me that he's definitely been in this area before. He points to a stripe in the rocky cliffs carved away by the glacier. He remembers a stream of running water down one side, and we fill our water skins with icy cold runoff. He points out a spot on the glacier where he carved a mark in the ice once upon a time, and how it's moved forward in the last few seasons. I relax when it's clear that he knows what he's talking about. Also, I might be appreciating the fact that he's wearing not much more than the male version of shorty shorts. I can't help but watch his ass flex as he walks, his tail swinging back and forth. His loincloth is pretty much longer in the back than it is in the front, and if I stare hard, and let's face it, I am, I can see a bit of butt cheek. Bright blue, glorious butt cheek. I never thought I'd be the type to creep on an alien, but here I am. It's just that he's so damn built. I watch his glutes move as he walks, the elegant lines of his hard, muscled thighs. His back is broad and strong, and I'm pretty sure he's got zero extra body fat. I never thought I'd be a girl who'd faint all over a well-muscled guy, but you learn something new about yourself every day. Me? I'm learning that I'm a sucker for a man with dimples at the base of his spine, and Herrick has them. Maybe it's because I'm watching those dimples so closely that I miss the fact that he's stopping in front of me. I immediately run into his back. Before I can blurt out an apology, there's an awful crack, and he skids forward a few feet, the eye shifting underneath us. I scream, slipping onto my ass as we both skid forward. Time seems to slow. I watch my legs slide forward as the ice in front of us shatters, revealing the thin lip over an even larger crevasse in the bluish-white ice. I manage to fling my legs up and wedge my body between the ice, my boots stopping my momentum. I skid down a few feet, and then my back lodges against the other side, and I'm stuck. It's a good stuck, though. Here, the ice isn't more than two feet across, and I've managed to lever my body to stop my fall. If I'd gone down feet first... I'd have slid all the way down to the bottom. 
With a little sob, I manage to claw my way up out of the gorge, and panting, I fling myself back over the side. Oh, my God. I nearly fell into a crevasse in the ice. I'd never be seen again. There'd be no way to rescue me. The moment the thought slides through my head, I look around. Herrick? I'm the only one on the surface of the glacier, though. Heart pounding, full of panic, I look down into the deep, yawning crack I just pulled myself out of. The top of Herrick's head and shoulders are all I can see. The rest of his body wedged into the ice. His pack is lodged behind him and his head lolls to one side. He's about six feet below me. Oh, fuck. Herrick? I scream. Answer me! I reach a hand down to him, but I can't reach. He's too far below. I look around for the bow I was using as a walking stick, but it's nowhere to be seen. I must have lost it when I slid. I peer down at Herrick again. He's still, and that's making me freak out. Herrick? No answer. Shit. Shit, shit. I don't know what to do. I want to wring my hands like a damsel in distress, but that won't solve anything. I'm the only person around for possibly miles. I stare at my glacial surroundings with frustration. I could go back the way I came, but it's a long journey, and I'd be hours behind the others. If it starts to snow, I'll lose their trail immediately. I could move forward on the shortcut, but I don't know if I'll remember the way back. And I don't want to leave Herrick, not alone trapped in the ice. I don't know what to do. Herrick? I bellow again, frustrated with him. Answer me! He's silent, though, and I worry he's unconscious or badly hurt. This is my fault. He stopped, and because I wasn't paying attention, I pushed him forward onto weak ice. And I wasn't paying attention because I was too busy staring at his ass dimples. Ass dimples! I moan in a mixture of horror and frustration. Herrick, you have to wake up, I tell him. Please! When there's still no response, I grab a handful of icy, slushy snow and fling it down at him. Wake up, you son of a bitch! The snow splats right onto his thick, glossy hair. But he stirs. I choke back a sob of relief. Herrick! A low groan echoes up from the ice and his head moves, and then his arms slowly rise up, pushing at the ice crushed against his chest. Kate! I'm here! I shift and more ice and snow rains down from the ledge up above. He squints and gazes up at me. There's a bruise on his head that's growing below one of his horns and he looks dizzy. Why? Why are you throwing snow on me? I bite back a crazy laugh of relief. Because you needed to wake up. I am awake he says slowly, and his hands press at the ice on both sides of him and then stop. I seem to be stuck as well. You fell into a crack in the ice, I tell him. I did not fall, he says, bracing his hands at the ice against his chest again. Someone pushed me in. I grind my teeth. I did not. You did. I stopped well away from the edge. He's right, but I'm not about to let him know that. Look, it doesn't matter, okay? We just need to get you out of there. Can you... I study him, thinking desperately. Can you use your feet to brace yourself and climb up? He winces, and as I watch, his face goes pale, the sickliest color of blue I've ever seen. There is something wrong with my leg. I cannot use it. He shifts again and makes a pained huff. It cannot support me. Oh, no... Just wait, then. We'll figure something out. Someone has to be coming by soon to look for us, right? Herrick's head lolls back, and he squints up at me again. I can see the perspiration beaded on his brow, and he's still far too pale. You should run ahead and get help, Kate. What? No, I'm not leaving you. I glance around the glacier for landmarks, and there's nothing but undulating ice stretching out before me. I don't know if I'll be able to find you again if I leave. Then stay and keep me company until I die. He pants, pushing at the ice again. Cannot catch my breath with this pressed against me. Don't push against it, 
I warned, trying to keep the franticness out of my expression. You don't want to dislodge yourself and slide farther down. It's so dark at the bottom I can't see how far it is. It might be a hundred feet or it might be five more feet. It doesn't matter because I can't reach him either way. Tell me what I should do to help. You should leave, he says between gasping breaths. He tilts his head back and gazes up at me. I do not want you risking yourself, Kate. Don't be stupid, I tell him. I'm not leaving you. It will be dark soon. Then it'll be dark, I snap. It doesn't mean I'm leaving you, damn it. This is my fault. A ghost of his normally cocky grin slides over his face. I never said it was not. I wish I had more snow to fling at your head, I mutter at him. I'm especially not leaving you if it's getting dark soon, I tell him. I can't imagine how freaked out he must be right now. Heck, I'm freaked out, and it's not me pinned down there with a possibly broken leg, seconds away from sliding into oblivion. I do not want you in danger, pretty Kate, he says, closing his eyes and leaning his head back against the ice. His horns smack against the ice and rain more chips down on his head, but he doesn't seem to notice them. I'm fine, I tell him, even though I'm not fine. I'm dangerously close to crying. We're going to get you out of there, I promise. The others will notice we're gone and will come soon enough. He says nothing, and for a long time, Herrick is so quiet that I worry he's passed out. Herrick? Are you okay? I am here. Just keep talking to me, okay? It's going to be all right. I picture him bleeding out from his leg where I can't see, and that just makes my anxiety ratchet up a notch. You need to stay awake. That's what they have everyone do in the movies, right? Stay awake no matter what? Keep talking to me until the others get here. No one is coming, he mumbles. Don't talk like that, I tell him encouragingly. They'll notice we're gone and come after us soon enough. You must leave, Kate, he tells me again. Go and cross the glacier and meet them back on the other side. They'll come after us. He shakes his head and more ice pours down, scaring the snot out of me. No one is coming, he says emphatically again. I told them not to. It will be hands of days before they notice we are missing. Hands of days? Weeks? What on earth? What? I yelp out. Why? I told them not to. Why would you do that? I cry out and wince as my voice rings out over the ice. Why? Wanted to spend time alone with you. Well, fucking congratulations. We're officially alone right now. I'm so shocked and upset that I can't even remember to be nice to him considering he's trapped. I can't believe you did that. No one's coming? No one at all? Apologies. He breathes, and his voice sounds faint. He closes his eyes and leans his head back against the ice once more. Wait, I say, slamming down to my stomach on the ice and reaching for him even though he's too far away. I'm yelling at a man who's trapped and might be dying. Herrick, I'm sorry, okay? We can argue after we get you out of there. He makes a noise that might be agreement, might be a groan. His eyes don't open. I'm staying right here, okay? Whatever happens, we're going to be in this together. Herrick looks up at me. I do not wish you to be in danger, pretty Kate. You should leave me. Quit saying that. It grows dark soon. And are there predators on the ice? He shifts, or tries to, and winces. No, not at night. Too many dangerous cracks in the ice. You mean the animals are too smart to cross, but we did it? Are you fucking serious? It was safe until you pushed me. I bite back my hysterical response because, okay, I did push him. It's not solving anything to bicker right now. I'll murder him when we're both nice and safe. Okay, so let's think of how we can manage to get you out of there. I need to pull you up somehow. I look around for a tree or my bow or anything, but there's nothing around but ice and more ice. I lost my weapon when I fell, when you pushed me. Damn it, shut up, I snap at him. 
He chuckles, and the sound is both somehow heartwarming and heartbreaking at the same time because he sounds weak, tired, in pain. I like you when you are angry. That must be why you piss me off all the time, I mutter. Where's your rope or your spear? Rope is in my pack, he says wincing. Lost my spear. You lost your pack, too, I point out, because his back is wedged against the ice. That's okay. We'll figure something out. I sit up and open my pack, pulling stuff out. Something in here has to work for a rescue, surely. Kate, he calls out, a note of panic in his voice. Are you there? I'm here, I reply and peer over the edge again. I'm not leaving. I couldn't see you he murmurs and tries to stretch a hand up to me. I could cry at how far below it is. There's no way I can reach that, even extending my fingers. But I lean over and try anyhow, because I need to do something. Anything. I was looking in my pack, I tell him. There's got to be something we can use for rope. He nods. Talk to me, at least. I will. I'll talk until my jaw falls off if I have to. Chapter 5 Kate I talk as it grows dark. I talk as the moons come out and rise high in the starry skies overhead, filling the world with moonlight enough to see by. I talk and talk even though my throat is hoarse and I'm exhausted. I talk even when Herrick gets quiet rattling on about growing up and what it was like to be kidnapped in my sleep by space aliens. All the while, I rip my clothing to shreds and rebraid the leather into rope. Since I don't have rope, I'll have to make one. I have no idea what I'm going to attach it to, but I'll figure something out. I originally thought about tying my leggings to my tunic and making a rope that way, but I worried the thin leather would tear and then we'd have nothing. So I've cut fat strips out of leather until I have nothing left of my extra clothing but ribbons, and now I'm braiding them into a thick rope that will be strong enough and long enough to pull Herrick up. But I need a lot of rope, which means braiding all through the night and praying that he doesn't slip and fall farther below. So that's my stepfather, I finish, telling him another story about my extremely stern, thoroughly unlikable stepfather. I don't like to talk about him much because he's never been my biggest fan. I'm too big to be attractive in his eyes and too ungainly to be an athlete like him. He loves the heck out of my mother, though, which is his only saving grace. I'm not going to miss him, but I'm going to miss my mom a lot. I'm glad she has him, I guess. I think for a while it's been pretty obvious to me that she loves him more than she loves her kid. That's not me as a bitter child saying that either. He slapped me across the face and hit me harder than any parent should hit their kid, and all she would say was that I did something to deserve it. I was really happy to move out when I did. My teenage years hadn't been fun ones. I am glad this man is not here, or I would wish death on him, Herrick calls up. I chuckle, braiding leather as quickly as possible. <laughs> I don't think he'd do well here. He doesn't like the snow. Then I love it even more because he hates it, Herrick says. But at least you had your mother at your side growing up. I lost both of my parents at a very young age. You did? That makes me sad for him. I lost my father when I was too young to remember him, but I always had my mother. How old were you? Six turns of the seasons, he says, voice full of sadness. Old enough to remember them. Did they die of the quee sickness? I ask, remembering that someone had talked about that before. Many members of the tribe had died at that time, and it had happened about 15 years before Georgie and the others arrived. To hear them talk about it, the saw quee had almost been wiped out. Earlier, Herrick says, my mother and father were fierce hunters, and they loved the Great Salt Lake. They would go there for many hunts. They were hunting a tali, and the hunt went badly. Both of my parents were killed along with three other hunters. My mother carried a kid in her belly, and it died as well. It was a bad time for our tribe. Shit. That sounds terrible. I'm so sorry. 
I don't even ask what a Tali is, even though I'm curious. It's not something I want to prod him over. Who raised you after that? Everyone in the tribe. Warek's father, Eklon, took me in. And when I was old enough to learn to hunt, Warek taught me. They were good to me, but I still remember my parents. I remember my father's laugh and the way my mother would smell before she went out to hunt. She would rub quill beast fat on her boots before every journey, and I always think of her when I sent it. His story makes me sad for him. Maybe that's why Herrick isn't quiet or subtle. Maybe he likes to be noticed because he's lonely. Your mother was a hunter? Oh, yes. She loved to hunt. I think she enjoyed it more than my father. I can hear his chuckle wafting up from the gorge, the sound hollow. After she was killed with a kit in her belly, the chief, Vectal's father, decided that no more females were to go hunting. It was far too dangerous for life bearers. But they hunt now, I point out, braiding away. Yes. Liege and a few of the other humans were quite forceful in their opinions, and Vectal changed his mind. Most of the humans that still hunt stay close to the caves or go out with their mates. Small kits make it difficult to leave for long periods of time. I imagine it does. I add another strip to my rope and continue, spreading it out before me. It looks thick, but I don't know if it's long enough. I bite back my worries and keep him talking. And what about you? If you had a mate, would you let her hunt? If she wished. Do you wish to hunt, pretty Kate? Nice try, Slick, I tease, amused. You never give up, do you? Never, he agrees. Before I can think of another thing to talk about, he continues. If I die here, Kate, don't say that. If I die, he continues firmly. You must go to the edge of the glacier, and when you see the rocks that look like fingers go between them. There is a small valley full of trees there and a cave. There are supplies there. Go there and wait for the others to come find you. You're not going to die, I say firmly, and I hope I'm right. Hyrek. The pain in my leg is intense. The pain in my chest is intense. Even though I am tired and hurting, I do not sleep. I cannot. Kate is up there, alone and scared. I will not abandon her, just like she has not abandoned me. This is a fine mess I have brought upon us. Somehow, when I imagined that I would steal my mate away, I did not imagine her pushing me into a gorge in the ice and being a breath away from death. This is not how I thought our journey would go at all. In my mind, I pictured many more mouth matings and fewer worries about death. But I am so proud of my Kate. I have encouraged her to leave me, and she will not. Instead, she waits above, crafting a rope to save me. I am filled with pride and affection for her, and fear that she will not be safe while I am down here, unable to protect her. I shift in place, pressing my arms against the ice that traps me in place, my chest wedged tight. I cannot think about the fact that I cannot draw a full breath, or that my ribs ache as if they are being crushed. I cannot think about the leg that pains me so greatly that it throbs with every breath I take. Most of all, I do not look down. I focus on Kate instead. The light sound of her voice in the night, the calmness as she works up above me. She must be cold and frightened, but she does not voice such things. Instead, she tries to keep my mind occupied. She is strong and brave, and already she has my heart. She has knotted it between her fingers as surely as she has knotted her rope above. It is near dawn when our conversation lulls, and I fight to stay awake. I am tired and in pain, and even though I struggle, my eyes seem to wish to slide shut. Up above, Kate makes a small worried sound, and I instantly jolt awake again. What is it? I ask. I... I think I'm done with the rope. I hear her moving near the edge of the ice. I don't know if it's long enough. It doesn't look long enough, but I don't know what else to do. You have done well, I call encouragingly up to her. Can you find something to anchor it on? Her head peeps over the edge of the chasm, haloed by sunlight, and I cannot make out her expression. 
I'm going to toss one in down to you so we can see what we have to work with, all right? Very well. It is smart. She is clever, and I am filled with a surge of gratitude that I have set my sights on strong, capable Kate instead of the tiny Sumer or the pink-maned Babrook. We can do this. I have trust in her. Here it comes, Kate calls out, and a few moments later the braided cord slithers down to me. I put a hand out and grasp it, wrapping the cord around my forearm. It is made well enough, and thick. I grab it and loop it through my weapons belt, and then twine it around my arm. This will use more length, but I do not trust my own strength right now, not with waves of pain crashing through me every few breaths. I am ready, I call out to her. I close my eyes and hope she will return swiftly. A few moments later, I hear her voice, faint. I have it anchored. Can you try and pull yourself up? Trying, I bellow, and wrap more of the length around my arm until it goes taut. Not much room there, no more than two loops, but it is enough. I use my other arm to haul my body upward, trying to surge forward. The ice trapping me makes it difficult, and my body is wedged tight. I automatically move one foot, trying to brace against the ice, and bite back a hiss of pain when I realize it is my bad foot. I did not even think I could move it. I suppose that is a good sign. Panting, sweating, I anchor my good foot and heave forward. The ice creaks and groans, and it feels as if the front of my chest is scraped raw, but I am able to climb up the rope by a hand's length. And it is exhausting. My arms shake with fatigue, but I do not have a choice. I pull myself up with my other hand, then the other, moving slowly. Sweat pours down my face, and my leg is in agony. Do not look down, Herrick, I caution myself. You know if you see something, it will be the end of you. You're doing great. Kate calls out, and her sweet, encouraging voice gives me strength. I must get out of here, if nothing else but to protect my female, my mate. I clam up another handful, then another. One more, I tell myself. Just one more. It is many more than that, but one at a time is all I need. Take my hand, Kate calls out. You're so close, Herrick, I promise. One more handful, and then I feel her fingers brush against mine. Her bare arm is flung over the edge of the chasm, and I grip it, testing her strength. I do not want to pull her in after me, but she is strong, her arm flexing, and she helps pull me up to the ledge. I crawl forward, and my bad leg knocks against the edge of the ice. A bellow of pain escapes me, and I nearly black out. No! Kate cries, her hands tighter on mine. You have to be all the way up. Don't stop now. No stopping, I pant, breathing ragged. I belly crawl forward, digging my fingers into the ice for purchase. They will be bruised and painful, and I can feel my nails break as I haul myself forward, but I do not care. Safety. A few more arm lengths and then my feet are on the ice, along with all of me. I flop forward on my stomach, exhausted. The movement hurts my aching, bruised ribs, and I roll onto my back with the last of my strength so I can breathe without pain. Safe. Oh, thank God, Kate cries out, and then she's bent over me, her fingers touching my cheek. Herrick, are you all right? I open my eyes, gazing up at her. Kate's pale face is ruddy with cold, her braid disheveled, white curls floating like the cloud they remind me of. Her tunic is gone, and she wears only a band across her teats. She must have used her leathers to save me. I want to make a joke about it, but I do not have the strength. My bad leg throbs again, and I sit up and automatically glance down to check it. I cannot see much, but my leg looks dark, the lower half completely slicked with blood. Something sharp and white pokes out near the middle of my shin, and the angle looks... wrong. Red. So much red. So much blood. I feel sick. Oh, that looks very bad, I say, surprised at the calm in my own voice. My head spins, and the bile rises in my throat. A moment later, the world goes black around me. Kate The man has fainted on me. I stare down at him in shock, but it's true. Herrick has fainted dead away. He's pale, but breathing. That's something, at least. And he's on solid ground. Again, that's something. I'll take the small wins, because right now they're all I've got. I flop down on the ground next to him, exhausted mentally and physically from the harrowing night. 
One step at a time, Kate, I remind myself, rubbing a weary hand over my face. I want to go to sleep. I want to pull the blankets over my head and forget about the world for a few hours. That would be nice. Problem is, we're nowhere near to safety, and I don't know that staying here on the glacier for the rest of the morning is a wise idea. What if more ice cracks open? I already feel wholly unsafe being here. I'm also topless, since I had to use my tunic for the rope and I'm cold. Even though my body protests the movement, I sit up and nudge Herrick. Wake up. He doesn't wake up, though, and I realize there's a long, smeared trail of blood on the ice. I suck in a breath and scramble to my knees to examine his leg. God, how did I not realize he was injured? His leg is soaked with blood, and I nearly puke in my mouth at the sight of the broken bone jutting from his shin. Oh, gross, I whisper aloud. Maybe it's a good thing he's unconscious. I glance up at his face. He's pale and unmoving, his breathing shallow but regular. This is not good. I remember Georgie and the other humans telling us that broken bones have to be set right away because the cootie gives us a super zippy healing factor and a bone set too late has to be rebroken. God, and there's no one else around to do this. I blanch and press my fingers to my mouth to stifle the rising nausea. I can do this. I can do this. It has to be done, and there's no one else to do it, so that leaves me. Herrick would do the same for me. At least I tell myself this is the case. I'm not sure I know Herrick well enough to think he'd stick a broken bone back in my body. I'm breathing hard as I retrieve my new braided rope and use it to fashion a tourniquet above his knee. I hope that's the right spot and the movies didn't lie to me because this is all new territory. There's no other choice, though. I rinse my hands with a bit of water, rinse some of the blood off of his leg, and then lean in. This is going to hurt you worse than it's going to hurt me, I tell him, but I reserve the right to puke repeatedly. To my relief, I don't puke at all, though I do get nauseous a few times. I do the best I can to set the leg as straight as possible, pushing the bone back into place into flesh that doesn't seem to want to give. Herrick makes a few groans of pain but doesn't wake up from unconsciousness, which is probably lucky. This seems extremely painful. But when I'm done, I know it was the right thing to do. His leg is already bleeding less, healing kicking in. I've done what I can. I push the jagged cut tightly together and bind it with leather cut from my own pants. With that done, I press a shaking hand to my forehead, trying to collect my thoughts. Did I think I was emotionally exhausted before? Clearly, this planet has decided that I haven't seen anything yet. I squint up at the sky. It's daylight, but it's also overcast and gray, darker than it should be. That might mean snow soon, and that means that the glacier is going to have all of its deadly cracks and thin ice covered up by a new layer of powder. I want to kick Herrick's unconscious body. Glacier as a shortcut. Man, am I a doofus for falling for that one. I simply went with him because I was flattered he wanted to be alone with me, that he wanted to show me something pretty. I'm such an idiot. I get to my feet, swiping helplessly at the blood I seem to be covered in. I can worry about that later, I guess. I'm so tired, but I can't stop now. Not with Herrick hurt and the possibility of a snowstorm coming on. I try to think back about what he told me earlier. There's a cave by the rocks that look like fingers. I just need to find those rocks. Right. I grab Herrick by the shoulders of his vest, but the fabric is torn, and when I try to pull him along, he makes a moan of pain as his bad leg scrapes over the ice. I can't do that to him. I think for a moment and then grab his torso and haul his limp body up against mine as best I can. I'm sweating like crazy despite the cold, but I manage to get him semi-upright long enough to grab one arm and then sling his weight over my shoulders in a fireman's carry. I groan at his weight because he's heavy as the Dickens, and I can't stand up straight with his 200-something pounds on my shoulders. I've done weight training in the past, so I know I'm strong, but Jesus. Lay off the fries, I tell Herrick's unconscious body as I hobble forward a few feet, then rest, panting. I catch my breath and then start up again a minute later. 
His weight is distributed evenly over my shoulders, so this isn't too bad, I realize. Just bulky and unwieldy. I can do this. I can do this. I don't have a choice. And cake, I add, wheezing as I inch my way forward some more. Definitely lay off the cake. Chapter 6 Herrick The painful throbbing in my leg is what awakens me from a deep slumber. I ache all over, one arm full of prickles thanks to a soft weight resting on it. There is a rock poking into my back, but it is the pain in my calf that makes me stir. I vaguely remember climbing out of the gorge and landing at a near-naked Kate's feet. And blood. So much blood. I feel queasy just thinking about the memory of it and make a low sound in my throat. Mm, comes a soft voice at my ear. It is Kate, and she sounds sleepy. I was not expecting that. I open one eye and peer around me. The soft weight on my arm causing me to fall asleep? It is Kate's warm body tucked against my side under the furs. The white, curly cloud of her hair rests against my shoulder, and she nestles closer to me in her sleep. Well, this... this is not so bad. I glance around me and notice we are in the hunter cave, just like I told her about. The air smells like snow, and it is cold, and there is no fire in the pit. I debate getting up to test the ache in my leg, but Kate's thigh is pressed up against my hip, and I would not move her for all of the Sasa in Baran's stores. I do not understand how we are here, though. Did one of the others turn back and discover us on the glacier? Did someone carry me all the way here? Or have I been asleep for days without realizing it? And am I still bleeding? I have to know. Just the thought makes me break into a cold sweat. I touch the female nestled at my side. Kate? Herrick? She says my name so sleepy and soft that my cock immediately grows hard. I am suddenly very aware of her scent, the nearness of her body, and the knee that presses a mere finger length away from my cock and spur. My injured leg suddenly seems less important than touching the female I have decided belongs to me. I move my hand and caress her cheek. She is soft, so soft. My hand slides down her arm and I realize she has no tunic. Need surges through me, hot and fierce. I have never mated with a female before. I have been content to wait for resonance. But in this moment, if Kate opened her legs for me, I would slide between them happily. Kate's eyes open and she gives me a confused look, then bolts upright. She blinks rapidly, then adjusts the band across her teats, hiking it up. Are you okay? I groan because now I have no warm, pleasant female at my side, and she is reminding me that my body hurts. I put a hand over my eyes to shield them. Am I bleeding? Are you what? she asks, yawning. Bleeding. I cannot look at it if I am. Oh, ah. Uh, she sounds adorably sleepy and confused. Kate peels back the blankets, and I feel a rush of cold air over my body, withering my now painful erection slightly. I keep my hand pressed over my eyes as she touches my leg, her fingers icy against my skin. No, you're not bleeding. It's healed up pretty well. I peek out from between my fingers. You are certain? Her brow furrows as she looks over at me. What, are you scared of blood? Not scared, I boast, sitting up slowly. Bah. You make me sound as if I am not a fierce hunter. Well, fierce hunter, what is it then? I risk a glance down at my leg. It's wrapped tight in leather with a hint of fringe along the seam, a fringe that seems very familiar. I look over at Kate and she is missing one legging in addition to her tunic. She is all white skin everywhere I look. She reties the knots at the top and bottom of my leg, then glances over at me, still waiting for me to explain why I passed out. My leg looks good, whole. How long have I been asleep? I ask, deciding to change the topic. Most of the day? She glances at the front of the cave. It's almost night. Kate rubs her pale arms absently. And now that you're up, you can tell me how to start a fire, because I couldn't figure it out earlier. That's why I crawled in with you. I give her my best cocky grin, though I'm still not quite feeling like myself. I thought it was simply that you wished to be near me. Keep dreaming. Her snort is a pleasant one, and she moves near the fire pit, dropping a few dung chips in the center and then looking over at me. 
I rub a hand over my face. I hate this helpless feeling. I can do more. I shift my weight, trying to move closer to the fire pit, when I accidentally press down on my bad leg and pain shoots all the way up my side. The breath hisses from my lungs. Wait! Kate yelps, and she flings herself forward. Don't! You'll hurt yourself! She knocks me to the ground, and my horns bang hard against the rock. Dizzy, I bite back a groan of pain as her hand plants firmly into my stomach and she loses her balance. Of course, I forget all about this because in the next moment her teats push up against my face. And I cannot help myself. I put my arms around her and pull her closer. Kate squeals and wrestles out of my grip. What are you doing? Embracing you? If you wish to share my furs, Kate, simply say so. There is no need to push me down to have your way with me, I tease. I am quite a willing participant. Her face turns bright red and she makes an indignant sound. Just tell me how to make the fire, she bellows at me, before I take a rock to your thick skull. You are a violent female, I muse, picking my words to goad her further. First you push me into the ice and now you threaten to attack me. Kate raises a fist and presses it to her mouth. You, she bites out after a moment, are the most infuriating man I have ever met. I just grin at that. She acts as if this is a bad thing. I almost prefer you unconscious, Kate retorts and retreats to the far side of the fire pit. Now just tell me how to start the fire already. I'm freezing. I shift on my bottom, freeing my tail from where it is trapped under me. My leg sends another bolt of pain up my body, but I am ready for it and only wince. Who else is here? What do you mean, who else is here? Kate gives me a confused expression. It's just you and me. But... We were on the ice. I put my hands on my thigh and straighten my bad leg, trying to adjust it. How did we get here? Oh, that. I carried you. She puts a hand on her shoulder and rotates it slowly, wincing. And you're really damn heavy, too. I just stare at her, surprised. You carried me? I did. At my confusion, her cheeks turn pink and she fusses with the fire-making implements. Why is that so weird? What was I supposed to do, leave you there? She looks ashamed, and this confuses me. It is a long way to carry someone, and you are a small female. Not as small as the others, but still fragile compared to me. Are you making fun of me? No, why would I? You saved my life, Kate. I do my best to look earnest. I am humbled that you would carry me so far. Oh. Her mouth turns into a pink circle, and then she snaps her jaw shut. I... You're welcome. And you set my leg, too? Kate nods and keeps her head ducked, not making eye contact with me. She toys with the flint in her hands. Someone said that you guys heal fast, and so I needed to make sure it healed properly. I wasn't entirely sure what I was doing, but I did my best. Again, I am humbled by this female. I am in awe of you, pretty Kate. She licks her lips and looks nervous. And now you'll show me how to make a fire? It seems she is uncomfortable with my compliments. Strange female. I would shower her with affection if she would but accept it. I brace myself, avoiding my bad leg and maneuver a little closer. You must like the smell of dung. What? Kate recoils, looking at me. I gesture at the fire. You have put an entire day's worth of fuel into the fire pit. Oh, she hastily scoops it out. I didn't know. Which is why I will show you. Fire is everything out here, Kate. I shift my weight and lean closer to her. Let me show you how to get a spark. Kate. Herex finally awake. I'm both glad and wish he would go back to sleep again. He confuses me. I feel all nervous and fluttery around him, especially when he stares at me, which seems to be all the time. I'm relieved his leg is healing well, and he's shown me how to make a fire. And he's not dead, which is also good. I'm also torn on how to react around him. He woke me up by stroking my arm in a caress that gave me goosebumps. And I reacted by, well, I wanted to kiss him. Instead, I panicked and acted all weird around him. All he did was ask about his leg and I started being a spaz. God, I'm as bad as Summer. Now I know how she feels when she tries to talk to any of the guys. It's not a great feeling. But at least we have fire now. I'm seated by it with Herrick closer to the mouth of the cave, his bad legs stretched in front of him and propped by furs. 
He leans against the rocky wall, his eyes closed. I put my hands out to warm them, but the snow is steadily falling outside, the wind whistling against the privacy screen over the entrance of the cave, and it's still chillier than I'd like. Twice as chilly, given the fact that my tunic and half of my pants are now gone. I'm not going to complain, though. Herrick's leg is propped up by the blankets, and he looks like he's hurting, his face drawn tight. I wouldn't take them from him. It's weird being alone here with him, though. There's no one else to distract from the fact that it's just us. The silences feel all the more uncomfortable, and I'm acutely aware I'm not wearing much more than my makeshift not hoth bra, which is just a band of tight leather. It's not very warm, and I rub my arms to ward off some of the chill. You are cold, Herrick says from across the fire. I glance over at him surprised. I thought he was resting his eyes, but no, he's got one eye open and he's watching me. I'm fine. You are not fine. He pats the spot in the furs next to him. Come and slide in next to me. I will share my body warmth with you. Oh boy. Why does such an innocent offer make my brain go to such dirty places? Really, I'm fine. Herrick gives me another challenging glance. Are you afraid of me? Pfft. Unnerved? Yes. Afraid? No. Did you ever think maybe I don't want to cuddle? Why? He tilts his head and studies me. Do you hate me so much that you would willingly remain cold rather than share warmth with me? Well, now I just feel like a big asshole. I don't hate you, I mumble. How do I explain that he makes me feel shy and insecure? I can't, of course. If I tell him that, he'll just use it against me. So, when he pats the spot on the blankets next to him, I have no choice but to go to his side. I sit next to him, stiff-shouldered and uncertain. He puts his arm around my shoulders and pulls me in against his good side, and my hand automatically goes to his stomach. His hard, flat stomach. Oh, crap. Do I leave my hand there and perv on him, or do I remove it? If I remove it, where do I put it? Where would seem natural? Your hand is twitching. It's nothing. Relax, he tells me. This is merely a sharing of heat. And that reassurance makes me feel worse. Because I'm a big stork of a girl and he'd never hit on me except to mock me? Ugh. I hate all this uncertainty. Why can't he ignore me like every human man out there? I do my best to relax, though, even if I'm acutely aware of the fact that my cheek is inches away from his skin, or the fact that he feels like swayed to the touch, or that he's warm like a heating blanket and I kind of want to fling my arms and legs around him and soak up that delicious warmth. Thank you for carrying me, he says when I get quiet. I am humbled that you would risk yourself like that. Was it a risk? You could have harmed yourself, strained your back, hurt your muscles. The hand on my shoulders picks up my braid and he begins to flick the tail against my skin back and forth. The ticklishness of it is distracting. You could have left me. I would never leave you behind. That's just wrong. Not even to save yourself. I don't know what to say to that. I don't know if I could have left him behind. Not when it was my fault he ended up stuck in the ice in the first place. So I go on the attack because I'm feeling vulnerable. I don't know why you had the boneheaded cockamamie plan to go across a glacier anyhow. They're freaking dangerous. Why? He sounds genuinely confused. I sit up a little higher and glance at him. Seriously? You fell into an ice crack. You almost died. You broke your leg. Yes, but crossing the great ice is normally perfectly safe. On what planet? He looks confused. This one. Okay, he's got me there. Maybe it is totally safe here if you know what you're doing. Maybe it is a shortcut to these people. It's also full of cracks. It is, but that is why you watch the ground and cross with a friend. The great ice is safe because the Metlaks avoid it, and most predators do as well. Yeah, because they're smarter than us, obviously. Herrick gives my shoulder a small poke with a finger. We were perfectly safe until you pushed me in. 
I did not push you in, I protest. Seriously. You did, he says, grinning. I felt your hands on my back just before you shoved me in. I did not. I was distracted. God, why won't he shut up? Distracted by what? What were you staring at so intently? Like I will ever tell him that it was his ass dimples. No freaking way. Nothing. Then you wished to kill me and return to the others without me. Herrick has the goofiest grin on his face. I can't decide if I want to laugh with him or smack him in the mouth. Or kiss his mouth. I am such a mess. Just shut up already, will you? But I enjoy speaking with you, pretty Kate. He plays with the end of my braid, dragging it along my collarbones in a little back-and-forth motion that makes my nipples go hard. Why is that so hard to believe? I never know what to think around you, I mutter. His fingers skim my skin, along with my braid tip, and I rub at my shoulder, now covered in goosebumps. You love messing with me. Messing with you? I do not understand what this means. Are we going to do this now? Really? Let's just drop it, okay? He feigns more misunderstanding. What shall we drop? The subject? He chuckles, clearly not bothered by my annoyance. You are upset. I can tell because your pale cheeks turn a bright pink. Pale cheeks? Great. Thanks for making that sound weird. I press the back of a hand to my cheeks. Does it sound weird? I find it charming. He nudges me with his body. Perhaps that is why I tease you so much. I like to see you color. Well, that explains why he's constantly embarrassing me, I guess. He likes the way I react. It's not surprising, I guess, though I'm a little disappointed that it's not because he actually likes me. Of course, I guess that was too much to hope for. Not that I want him to like me. Life's easier without having to try to figure out Herrick's brain. It's silly to be hurt. I can't help it, though. With him playing with my braid and his arm around my shoulders, my hand on his stomach, it almost feels like we're a couple. And it's nice. I like it far more than I should, especially since it's one-sided. I sit up, clasping my hands in my lap. I think I'm going to go back to the other side of the fire. Why? He snags my braid before I can get up, wrapping it around his hand. I like you next to me. You fit under my arm perfectly. What do I say to him? That his flirting confuses me? That he's making me upset? Can we just drop the act while we're alone, please? I pull my braid free of his grip. Herrick tilts his head and looks confused. What act is this? He's going to make me say it, isn't he? I press my hands to my forehead and will myself not to feel so nervous around him. I saved the guy's life. We can at least be friends. And I do like his personality when it's not aimed at dismantling me. If I get nothing out of this but friendship, I suppose I'm okay with that. But friends are truthful with friends. The act where you pretend to find me attractive or act like you're in love with me just so you can embarrass me. Just let it go for a few days, all right? Herrick is quiet. Which isn't like him. At all. I cross my arms over my chest and meet his gaze defiantly. I'm not backing down. He watches me, his gaze locked to mine in a way that feels vulnerable and intense all at once. Then slowly a smile spreads across his face. I feel my cheeks heating despite my best efforts to be strong and resolute. You think I do not like you? That I pretend when I flirt with you? Now it's my turn to be confused. What are you saying? I am telling you that what I say is not pretend. That when I tell you I enjoy your company, it is truth. When I say I like the pink flush of your cheeks, it is truth. When I invite you to my furs, it is all truth. Did I think my cheeks were hot before? They feel like they're scorching now. You haven't invited me to your furs. I am now. 
Herrick grins at me and gestures at the blanket spread around him. Join me here. Oh, I... I thought you meant something else. His eyes gleam with amusement. I can mean that as well. I reach out and give his arm a light, irritated smack. God, you're so annoying. Why do you never just come out and say something? He chuckles, trying to catch my hand as I pull back. I enjoy seeing your response. I enjoy your reactions. I enjoy you, Kate. Why would you think I am not sincere? Just because I like to laugh? No, that's not it. I realize I'm twisting my hands and squeeze them tight together. Then what is it? Why would you think when I say things to you they are not sincere? When I make my interest known, you think it is a joke? Because you... Well, you act like I'm a giant. A shy ant? What is this? A huge, tall creature. You make me feel like a freak every time you comment on my height. His eyes narrow, and he looks as if he is thinking really hard about what I'm saying. But you are tall for a human female. You think I haven't noticed? Why is it a bad thing to say something about it? Because men act like it's strange. It makes me unattractive to them. At his disbelieving snort, I add, Okay, human men, maybe. Human males are fools, he says boldly. I like that you are tall. I like that you are strong. I imagine that when I hold you, you will not break. Herrick gives a little shake of his head. I do not even know how Beck can hold his Ellie without harming her. She is so tiny. I would live in fear of this. I much prefer a strong female. These are words I've dreamed of hearing a man say to me all my life, and yet I have a hard time believing them. It's like they're too perfect. You're just saying that. I am not. Why would I lie? Why would I not love a female that is strong and capable? Do you think some Mur could have carried me on her back across the glacier? Do you think Babrook or Chael would have been able to do so? Do you think they would walk next to me for days on end simply because I challenged them to do so? He leans forward, shifting his weight, and his gaze is intent on me. You may be strong, and you may be tall, but that does not mean you are not attractive or worthwhile, my pretty Kate. A wise male knows this well. I don't know what to say. I... I thought you were making fun of me, I whisper. Suddenly, I'm calling into question my every interaction with Herrick. I enjoy having fun. I enjoy making you laugh. I enjoy making you turn pink. But I would never mock you. He looks thunderous at the thought. I would take you into my furs right now if I was not injured and explore pleasure mating with you. Why do you think I took you on this glacier with me? We were headed to this cave. We were? There's an awful squeaky note in my voice. Why? so I could seduce you into my furs. He gives me a goofy grin that belies his words. I do not think my plan has worked out so well. That makes me giggle snort. <laughs> you think? Make no mistake, though. When I say things to you, it is because they are truth. They might be said with a smile, but they are never lies. I would never do such to you. Okay, I breathe, because I don't know what else to say. This is unfamiliar territory for me. I've always been the gawky girl that no man has ever paid attention to. The fact that the man I've been crushing on despite myself is declaring his feelings for me? I don't know how to react. You are the female I want, Herrick declares. Have you seen me tease Sommer or Babrook? Well, no, but... I stare at the expanse of his blue chest, unable to meet his eyes. I thought you guys waited for resonance. Not all do. Some never resonate. I do not think I will. He shrugs and gives me one of those lopsided smiles. It is something I sense, but that does not mean I cannot give my heart. And that does not mean 
I do not wish to have a pleasure mate to take my furs. His voice drops to a husky note that makes me shiver. But what if I resonate to... someone else? Even the thought makes me a little sick with nerves. I don't know that I want to resonate to someone at all. You might resonate tomorrow, he agrees. Or you might not resonate for twenty seasons. Why worry over such things? You weren't waiting for resonance? I ask, surprised. The grin he gives me is wide and warm. I was, until I saw you. That is the sweetest thing anyone has ever said to me. Really? Herrick nods. Standing over all the other small females like a mighty Sakotsk, your mane like a cloud above your shoulders. He gestures as if trying to encapsulate my tallness. I said to myself, that is an impressive female. I stare at him. Did you just compare me to a Sakotsk? A horrified giggle escapes me. You need to work on your compliments. He rubs his chin, pretending to consider this. A very tall dvisti, perhaps, but with a better mane. I laugh harder. That's worse. You need to work on your skills, my friend. You have zero play. Play? You know, the ability to get a woman into your bed? Truly. He looks so sad for a moment that I feel like I've kicked a puppy. Then I have no hope with you, pretty Kate. Oh, no, he's taking me literally. Gosh, flirting with an alien is hard. I don't even know that I'm flirting at all. I'm doing good just to be stringing words together. I'm teasing you. To be honest, I don't know what to say. You are the first guy that's ever shown interest in me. His eyes light up. So you have never had a male in the furs. Then we shall experience things together for the first time. We're both virgins? Oh, boy. I, um, I don't know if you have noticed, but I'm kind of shy about this sort of thing. Herrick's crazy grin returns, and I admit it gives me a warm feeling in my belly to see it focused on me. Oh, I have noticed. And I think I need some time to digest things, to get comfortable with the idea. It's not a no, but I'm not sure if I'm quite ready for yes yet. He nods and rubs a hand on the thigh of his injured leg. And I should heal first. You should, I agree firmly. Waiting for him to heal buys me time. That sounds like a plan. Friends until then? I extend my hand to him because it feels like we should seal it like some sort of agreement or something. Herrick reaches a hand out to mine, but instead of planting it in my grip and giving me a handshake, he tugs me forward, pulling me closer to him. Startled, I let him pull me close. A moment later, our faces are inches apart, and we're so close we could be kissing. Make no mistake, pretty Kate, he murmurs to me. I still intend to woo you. I will give you time to get over your shyness, but just because we have not resonated does not mean that my heart will forget yours. Okay, I breathe, fascinated. Is he going to kiss me despite our agreement? Because I kind of want him to. But he only grins at me, his gaze flicking to my mouth, before he gives my hand a squeeze and releases me. And I'm... disappointed. It's best for now, of course, but that doesn't mean I can't sit back and wish he'd maybe decided to kiss me after all. Chapter 7 Kate Three days later. What are you doing? I shout the moment I enter the cave and see Herrick leaning up against the rock wall, his bad legs stretched in front of him. You're going to get hurt. Bah, is all he says, and holds onto the wall as he tries to put his weight on his leg. His face goes tight as he takes a step forward and then spreads his arms wide. Good as new. Oh, clearly. I snap back, putting down my basket and rushing to his side so I can offer him a shoulder to lean on. You big idiot! You told me you needed to stay off of it for another two days. I am tired of sitting on my tail, Herrick says, sounding grumpy. 
I wanted to see if it was better than I thought. And the verdict? I ask, slipping under his outstretched arm. He immediately leans on me, his weight heavy. Because that look on your face doesn't say it's better. Still hurts, he agrees wincing. But I can move around at the very least and help out. Or you can try to help out, fall flat on your face, and break something else, and then we're stuck here for a few more weeks. I mean, damn, Herrick, I've never seen a grown man as accident-prone as you. He merely chuckles and then hisses as he tries to put weight on his leg again. Yeah, he's got nothing to say to that. You're sitting down, I tell him, and steer him toward the only stool in the cave. Such a fierce female he murmurs in that flirty tone. I promptly ignore it and help him sit. In the few days that we've been here, I've learned quite a bit about my companion. He's thoughtful and kind and funny, always doing his best to make me smile or ease my fears when I worry about something. His humor is ever-present, and while it's taken a little getting used to, now that I've realized it's sincere, I can handle it a lot easier. He's also a hard worker, doing his best to help out from his stationary position by the fire in the cave. He cooks for me, even though I know he prefers his own food raw. He keeps the fire going, and today he's been working on sewing a new tunic for me, since I'm having to wear a makeshift one made from blankets just to not freeze my butt off when I go outdoors. Since he's injured, it leaves me with the bulk of the work. That means I have to get fresh snow for water, change out the baskets that serve as makeshift chamber pots, dump coals, collect more dung chips for the fire, and scavenge for food near the cave. It's not so bad, though, and there's a cache of frozen game close by, which means I just have to go and dig something up so we're not eating all of our travel food supplies. But I've also noticed that it makes Herrick incredibly protective. He hates it when I go out and he's back in the cave alone. Even though I am a strong female, he still feels I'm not ready to hunt on my own and worries over me. Each time I leave the cave, I'm subjected to a lecture on what to do if a wild animal approaches me, or how to look for deep drifts of snow, or how to find the easiest to use path, or to avoid this and that. I try to take it all in stride, even if it does make me want to smack him in the head for being so bossy, but I know it comes from a good place. Really, it's kind of sweet. Overbearing, but sweet. Him trying to walk is a pain in the ass, though. I thought we agreed you'd stay off your leg for at least another day, I chastise him. Remember the conversation we had yesterday after you tried this very same stunt? I've learned a lot about Herrick, but one of the things I've learned the most about this man? My God, is he ever accident prone. I've never seen anything like it. It's not that he's clumsy. He's actually incredibly graceful in his movements. It's that his mind is racing so far ahead of him that he doesn't pay attention. In the few short days we've been at the cave, he's accidentally burned food three times, his hand twice, accidentally cut the rope I worked so hard on, accidentally spilled the baskets full of supplies more times than I can count, and once even knocked fresh snow onto the fire and put it out. It's amazing he's lived to adulthood. Sit, I nag him again you're less likely to get injured again when you're seated. He thumps down on the stool and lets out a groan. I do not like being so helpless. And you won't be in another day or so, I tell him, sliding out from under his arm. He stretches his bad leg out in front of him and rubs his knee. Let me check things and see how you're healing. I'll feel better knowing you're walking around if your wound is totally closed. Very well. Herrick's voice is tight, but he remains still. I fuss with the leather bandages, undoing my careful knots. I check his wound daily, though I'm not entirely sure what I'm looking for other than for it to look, well, like a big red wound as opposed to a big infected wound. The bone seems to have remained in place, and I just hope that it's aligned properly. Today, when I uncover his wound and bathe it carefully, most of the blood has dried away and left just a jagged scab. It's closing up, and I'm actually really happy with that. Your leg looks great, all things considered. Check it out. I prefer not to. His voice sounds funny. I glance over at him, curious. Something wrong? He's not looking. In fact, he's staring quite pointedly at the wall. 
He also looks really pale. Herrick? I prompt again. What is it? Are you hurting? Is it all right? He asks and swallows hard. It looks to be. See for yourself. I wait, but he only gestures at me. Bind it up again, please. You need to look. He gives a tight shake of his head. Is he sweating? Seriously? I cannot look. Erm, um, why not? Just cover it, please. His throat works hard as if he's struggling to swallow. Oh my god. Are you scared of blood or something? That gets his goofy grin to return, though he's still staring pointedly at the wall. Not all blood. Just your own? I rebandage the wound, knotting the leather tight again. Just my own, he agrees, twitching as I work. It makes me... blackout. Oh, is that what happened on the glacier? I thought you'd passed out from the pain. Perhaps. I find myself fascinated by this. Is it any blood or just a big amount? He looks pale and definitely sweaty. His hand swipes over his ridged brow. Is there a lot of blood right now? No, I say quickly. I'm just asking. There's hardly any blood at all. It's all scabbed over. Herrick nods at the wall. Sure you don't want to see? I tease. At his horrified shake of his head, I can't stop the giggle that escapes me. You are a cruel female to laugh at my pain. I pat the bandage. You're all covered up again. No blood to be seen. And I'm not laughing at your pain. I'm laughing at your reaction. When he carefully glances over at his newly rebandaged leg and then relaxes, I ask, does it hurt? Only when I try to walk on it. Then don't walk on it, you goober. Nurse's orders. What is nurse? That's a person who takes care of you, kind of like a healer. Makes sure you're comfortable. Soothes your aches and pains. I pick up the bowl of water I used to clean his wound and take it to the front of the cave to dump. When I return, he's looking contemplative. Do you consider yourself my nurse, pretty Kate? Oh, there's a mischievous look in his eye I'm not sure I'm comfortable with. Well, seeing as how you're injured and I'm not, yes, I suppose I am. And you must soothe all my aches. The sly grin is crossing his face. Before you can even say it, don't go there, I retort. I'm not giving any of the aches below the belt a massage. When he howls with laughter, I know that I've guessed correctly and I can feel my cheeks go pink even as I bite back a smile. I'm learning how to cope with his teasing and, well, it's kind of fun. He makes me smile even when I don't want to. Besides, you shouldn't even be thinking about that right now. All I need to do to get you to lay off is to show you a bit of bloody bandage. He immediately goes pale. I'm kidding, I soothe. But dang, this big, strong, seven-foot-tall hunter faints at the sight of his own blood? You really need to work on that, you know. It might be dangerous for you in the future. Herrick nods. I know it is a problem, but I cannot help it. My mind sees the injury and shuts off. Maybe we can try to work on that together since we're stuck here for a few more days. I can help you become used to seeing it, and maybe if we start with small things, like a finger prick, you can get used to it. What do you think? He watches me with a skeptical look. And what will you work on? What do you mean? If I am to work on conquering my fears, perhaps you should work on yours as well. That makes me pause. What are you talking about? I speak of your fear of my compliments, or your fear of me. I'm not afraid of you. Are you not? It has been days since I told you how I felt. It has. I've been incredibly aware of that. I've been brisk but friendly with him, and the moment he started to flirt, I either shut it down, ignored it, or did my best to find something to do outside the cave. Truth is, it's not that I don't want him to flirt with me. I just don't know how to respond in the slightest. It's easier to just avoid the situation entirely, even if I do think about it all the time. If I must work on my fear, you must work on yours. What if I told you I was afraid of spiders? 
I offer instead. Could we work on that? I do not know what that is. A creature from the human world. At my nod, he laughs. I cannot help with that. But if you wish to work on my fear of my blood, we must work on your fear of my affection. I'm not scared, I admit. I just don't know how to react. You can react however you wish. Do you want me to stop? I squirm in my seat. I hate being put on the spot. No? I feel warm and happy at the sight of his broad grin and add, I like it. I just don't know what to do about it. Then it seems we have much to practice. I fight down the nervous feeling in the pit of my stomach. I guess we do. Harrick. I watch Kate as she pushes her needle into leather beside the fire, her face scrunched in concentration. The weather has grown steadily worse over the day, and now the wind whistles outside and we are trapped inside as snow blankets the ground. It will add another day to our journey, I suspect, but I do not mind this. More time alone with Kate? I am happy to have it. After our discussion this afternoon, I have been thinking. There is no doubt in my mind that Kate is shy. It is not such a strange thing. I know Warwick can be very quiet, and when he is uncomfortable, he gets up and leaves. Kate's response is to get flustered, adorably, and respond with harsh words. It is charming, but it does not help get her into my furs. I need her to feel more comfortable around me. I need to bring us together. And so I think, and think. There is nothing I want more than Kate in my arms, but she will need encouraging to get over her skittishness. I can make her laugh, I think. She smiles more easily around me now and accepts my teasing with good humor instead of anger. Perhaps I need to push harder, to force her to be a little less comfortable around me. As she leans over the fire and stirs the stew cooking in the pouch, then glances at the cave entrance and shivers, I suddenly realize what I must do. I sit on my plan, though I am nearly bursting with anticipation. If this works, I will have my pretty Kate to hold in my arms all night long. She will not be so shy then, I think. Hungry? she asks, looking over at me. I think the stew's ready. I should like a big bowl, I tell her enthusiastically, rubbing my stomach. Her cooking is, well, it is not good. But she is learning, and even if I must choke down mouthfuls of poorly flavored stew, it is worth it for the bright smile she gives me. Kate scoops the bowl into the pouch, wipes the rim off, and then hands it over to me. This is my moment. I take it from her, juggling it carefully. Then I watch as she turns and scoops herself a bowl. As she does, I discreetly spill mine all over my furs in my lap. Oh, no, I say loudly. She turns and her eyes go wide at the sight of me covered in stew. Oh, God, are you hurt? Did you burn yourself? She puts her bowl down and races to my side, yanking away the furs. I am fine, I reassure her, though my lap feels a bit scorched despite the protection the furs offered. I am lucky it landed in my lap. Kate just shakes her head at me. You are such a klutz, seriously. I don't know how you managed to make it to adulthood. I do not give her a word of protest, just watch as she moves with the furs to the far side of the cave. She spreads it out, but even I can see from my vantage point that it will need to be washed and hung to dry near the fire. It's all over the furs, she says after a moment, looking over at me. I can clean it, but we'll have to rebuild the fire to dry it. Her gaze moves to the fire pit where we have let the coals burn lower in anticipation of sleeping soon. Restoking the fire to warmth will take more fuel and will keep us both up until late in the night watching it, and I know she is tired. Do not worry over it, I tell her, shifting in my seat. I will sleep without it. But it's cold. She looks over at the privacy screen covering the cave entrance where the wind whistles and bits of snow drift in, and it's just going to get colder. It is not worth rebuilding the fire, I reassure her. We must conserve our fuel in case the snow grows too deep and we cannot go out for more for days. I'm not going to let you freeze, she exclaims, picking up her bowl and handing it to me. Eat this. We'll figure something out. I wait for her to invite me to her furs. It is the most practical of choices and will allow us to share body heat. I know the thought must have crossed her mind, because her gaze flicks to my bare chest and then skitters away again. Her shyness is winning. We eat in silence and I give a few yawns, hoping she will decide something. It must be her suggestion. I try to get up to rinse out my bowl, but she immediately fusses over me. 
Don't move, I'll get that. I hate being so helpless, I tell her, and it's the truth. I should be wooing my female, and instead she waits on me as if I am a kit. It is maddening. Don't worry about it, she soothes with a little smile as she takes the bowl. You can be in charge of meals when you feel better. I will be more than happy to do so. I watch her move around the cave as she tidies things. The flare of her hips is fascinating, along with the length of her legs. Her teats move slightly as she walks, though the rough tunic she is wearing hides much of her body. I bet she feels soft, despite her strength. The thought makes my cock grow hard with need, and I shift uncomfortably, trying to hide my erection before she can notice it. I am wearing nothing but my loincloth, and I cannot conceal much. At last, Kate stops moving around the cave. She gives the fire one last poke, turning over the cake of slow-burning dung to bank the fire. Are you sure you're warm enough without blankets? Will she still not invite me to her first? I shrug. I will be fine. I will just have to think of a new plan in the morning and endure my night of cold weather. She doesn't look happy, but moves to her blankets and lies down. I lie back on my pallet, trying to get my leg comfortable. It aches with the cold, and my muscles feel stiff from disuse. I cannot wait to be able to run again. I hate sitting around all day. More than anything, I hate being helpless while Kate must work. It does not feel right. The cave grows silent, the fire dying to flickers. Kate tosses and turns in her furs, and then she lies flat on her back and sighs up at the ceiling. Are you cold? I am fine, I tell her, though I am now fighting to keep the smugness out of my voice. Do not worry over me, pretty Kate. Oh, shut up already. I'm coming over there with my blankets. She sits up and begins to gather them. We're going to share tonight, and I'm cleaning yours first thing in the morning. If you are sure, I'm not going to be able to sleep otherwise. I'll feel too guilty. She crosses the cave and sets down the armful of thick furs, spreading them over my body. Scoot over. I roll onto my side, careful to keep my bad leg away from her. Kate drops down and pulls the blankets over our bodies, then lies stiff next to me. I prop up my head with one hand, watching her as she closes her eyes and pretends to sleep. I can tell from her quick breathing that she is not asleep. She is not even trying. I regard her, amused. Up close, her features look so delicate, her nose nothing more than a little bump on her round face. Her springy hair brushes against my arm, and I want to bury my face in it and inhale her scent. But then she will run away for sure. Kate cracks one eye open and peers up at me. Why are you staring at me? I cannot help but grin. I am watching you pretend to sleep. It is adorable. She wrinkles her little human nose up at me. You're an ass, but I am not wrong. Is it because you are near to me? Do I make you shy? I have not put a hand on her soft-looking skin, but, oh, I want to. My tail is twitching at the mere thought. Kate says nothing for a long moment, and then opens her eyes and peers up at me again. Maybe. I chuckle. That is a yes. What would make you less shy, then? I honestly don't know, she admits. I'm still not used to all of this attention. It makes me feel awkward. Perhaps if we mouth-mated it would take some of the edge off? She stares at me. What? How the hell did you jump to the conclusion that kissing is the right answer? Because you are nervous. If we practice mouth-mating, there will be nothing left to be nervous about, will there? Uh, one really obvious thing. I did not think you were ready for truly mating. I promise it has not even crossed my thoughts this evening. My cock, however, aches in anticipation. She eyes me skeptically and gives a little wiggle. Her breathing is speeding up. The thought of kissing you scares me a little, she admits. Why? I am puzzled by this. Kate bites her lip, and I nearly groan aloud at the sight of her teeth on that plump pink skin. What if I'm not good at it? What if you don't like kissing me? Have you never mouth-mated before? Well, yeah, but that was years ago when I was a kid. I haven't kissed anyone since puberty made me shoot up another foot. She looks embarrassed. What about you? I have never tried it, but I do not worry I will be bad at it, nor do I think you will be bad at it. I wish I had your confidence. She sounds so sad. I know that mouth-mating to you will be good, I tell her. I know it will be good because it will be with you. Her lips part and she stares up at me. That might be the sweetest thing anyone has ever said to me, she whispers. I mean every word of it. 
and because she is so near and so tempting, I reach out and brush a strand of her curly, wild hair off of her face and let my fingertips trace her jaw. But if it makes you nervous, we will not do it. She closes her eyes and tilts her head toward me, just a little. That feels nice. All of my jokes, my humor, they have disappeared in the face of her beauty and her vulnerability. May I touch you then? She gives me a little nod, and I explore her face with my fingers. Her skin is just as soft as I have imagined, the texture different than mine. Her cheek is round and full, unlike my own bony face with the hard ridges on my brow and my sharp cheekbones. She is soft everywhere. Her eyes remain closed as I touch her, but her full lips part, and I cannot help but brush the tips of my fingers along them as well. They are even softer, and I did not think that possible. She shivers, just a little. I find you beautiful, pretty Kate, I murmur to her. I could gaze at you for hours and never grow tired of it. I let my fingers skim along her jaw, then down the soft line of her throat. But I admit that it makes me want to put my mouth on yours. Does it? She's breathless, more than anything. I do not, though. I want her to want it as much as me. I continue to explore her, stroking my fingers up and down her arm, and then leaning closer to her so I can inhale her sweet scent. She gives a quiet little gasp when my nose brushes against hers, body tensing. But I only nuzzle her nose with mine and then caress her cheek again. Would you like to touch me as well, pretty Kate? She looks shy and chews on that full lower lip again. I don't know. I do, but there is no one here but you and me. I shall never tell another if you decide I am not manly enough for you. Kate giggles, and the sound is sweet to my ears. Thank goodness I was so worried about that, she teases, and when I clutch my chest as if wounded, her laughter escalates. Sometimes I wonder if you're ever serious, Harrick. Only when I must, I admit with a grin, but I am very serious about how much I like you. Her smile is slowed across her face, but lovely to see. I like you, too, she says quietly. Please don't hurt me, all right? Hurt you? I frown at that, trying to imagine how. With my lips? Her laughter peals out across the cave. No, ding-a-ling! Hurt me by lying to me! She calls me ding-a-ling. I wonder if it is a name of affection. I like it. It sounds musical. Why would I ever lie to you, my sweet ding-a-ling? Her brows go down, and then she snorts with muffled laughter. Now you're trying to distract me, aren't you? I'm being serious, though. Her chuckles die, and she gives a little sigh. It's just that every time I liked someone in the past, it was... It didn't turn out well. Kids can be cruel. She looks sad. I got teased a lot in high school because for a while I was taller than all the girls and all the boys, and so I was picked on a lot. Sometimes the boys would pretend to like me and then go back to their friends and laugh about how I fell for their stupid joke. I do not understand half of what she is telling me, but I know the gist behind it. I would never make a joke of you to others. The very thought makes me sick. To have a female's affection? To have her join you in the furs as a pleasure mate? There is no greater gift save that of resonance itself. I know. I know things are different here and people aren't like that. But when you tease me, it makes me think of that sort of thing and I worry that you don't really like me, that you're just making fun of me. Her hand slides to my chest, right over my heart. I guess it feels too good to be true. Know that even if I am a hunter who can be foolish at times, I would cherish everything you would give me. I put my hand over hers, and if I say or act a certain way, it is because I am addicted to your laughter. Her mouth curves up at the corners. I like yours, too, and I like your smile. Her hand goes to my face, and she touches my cheek, imitating what I did to her a brief moment ago. I like a lot of things about you. Like the way I taste? Her grin widens. I haven't tasted you yet. Then clearly you are missing a great experience. Shall we mouthmate and I can prove it to you? Kate laughs. One track mind much? My mind has many tracks, but they all lead right back to you. Her eyes grow soft, and her gaze flicks to my mouth. Her lips part slightly, and I decide that this is my moment. Perhaps she will not ask because she is too uncertain. She can slap my face away if she must, but I have to taste her lips. She makes a breathless little sound as my mouth grazes hers, but then she presses her lips firmly back to mine, and I am pleased. 
I hold still as I let her take the lead in the mouth-meeting. She has done this before, so surely she must be knowledgeable. Her lips brush against mine, and she presses them softly against my lower lip, and then my upper one over and over again. It is fascinating, and I can smell her delicate scent, feel her skin against mine, her body pressed up to my own. It is not exciting, but it is very pleasant, and I see why humans do it all the time. But then the tip of her tongue touches my mouth, and I am the one left gasping. We break apart, and she cringes. Was that bad? I'm sorry. Was it bad? How can she possibly think her mouth on mine is bad? I do not want to hear her worries. They are unfounded. I bury my hand in her mane and press my mouth back to hers again, silencing her. She makes a little noise and then yields to me, parting her lips. I stroke my tongue into her mouth, eager to explore her. The taste of Kate is maddening, like nothing I have ever had before. I want to growl with need, but I cannot stop kissing her. My tongue strokes against hers, and I realize she is soft here, too. There are no ridges like on my tongue, and I find this fascinating and perfect all at once. She moans into my mouth when my tongue caresses hers, and I must be doing mouth-mating right because it has gone from pleasant to incredible. My cock strains against my loincloth, desperate to sink inside her. I want to claim her as mine. I want to taste every bit of her skin. Mine. My pretty Kate. All mine. Her tongue touches mine, tentative, and I lick at it, wanting her to know that I need more of this need more of her. I could drag my tongue over hers for hours and never get my fill of touching her like this, of pleasuring her with my tongue. The soft noises she makes are making me as wild for her as her taste. Over and over we kiss and mate with our mouths until we are both breathless. When I finally raise my head from hers, Kate's eyes are gleaming in the low light of the cave, and I can see her mouth is shiny and wet, swollen from my caresses. I groan and bend down to nip at her lip, unable to resist. So perfect. Hark, she breathes. That was amazing. It was. I decide that I need her mouth like I need air. I kiss her again, stroking my tongue over the softness of her lips. Are you tired? She whimpers. Of kissing? No. I grin into the dark to hear that. No, I meant are you sleepy? Should I let you rest? Oh, a little breathless giggle escapes her. No, I think I'd like to kiss some more. I do not have to be asked again. I lower my mouth to hers. Chapter 8 Kate The next morning I'm in a toe-curlingly good mood as I head out into the fresh snow to look for more dung chips. Divisti seem to be plentiful on this side of the glacier, and though I haven't hunted one, I'm grateful they're here because it makes picking up more fuel an easy task. I pick one up with a glove that I've designated as my chipping glove and drop it into my fuel bag slung over my shoulder. There's a ton to do today, as there is every day, but I'm humming to myself as I slog through the snow. I slept like a baby last night. Well, once I got to sleep... I giggled to myself, feeling a bit naughty. Herrick and I kissed for what felt like hours, and it was, well, it was incredible. I wasn't sure if he'd be a good kisser given that he'd never done it before, but one stroke of that ridged tongue against mine and I practically orgasmed. That was shocking and addicting all at once. We never made it past kissing, though, and Herrick seemed content to just make out. His hands didn't even travel. That was sweet, but also made me crave more. By the time we'd finished kissing, I was needy, breathless, and unsatisfied. My mouth was bruised, but I still wanted more. I dreamed about Herrick, all dirty dreams, and woke up with my body spooned against his, his breath ruffling my hair, and his arm around my waist. I let him sleep, sneaking out to get started on the day's chores, but I keep thinking about tonight. Are we going to kiss more tonight? Gosh, I hope so. I pick up another dung chip from the ground and then pause. Maybe I should deliberately leave us low on fuel again so we have to cuddle once more. I strike that idea down immediately. It's stupid to risk safety just because I'm afraid to ask a guy to snuggle with me. I just need to be braver, to ask for what I want. But 
gosh, is that hard. For so long, I've been that storky, too tall girl, the one who isn't even lucky enough to be model skinny or model pretty, the one with big shoulders and strong thighs and looks like she should play football. No one ever asks that girl out. No one ever pays attention to her unless they need someone to be the butt of a joke. Herrick's focused attention on me is so flattering and wonderful, but I keep waiting for the other shoe to drop, for reality to step in and tell me, no, you don't get this after all. Troubled by my thoughts, I finish collecting the dung chips and head back toward the cave. The suns are out today, and it feels warmer than it has for the past few days. I suppose that means we can leave once Herrick's leg is healed. I have mixed feelings about that. Part of me wants to stay, but part of me also feels vulnerable and worried at being left behind without anyone knowing where we are. There's safety in numbers, and Herrick recently broke his leg. We got lucky, but it doesn't mean we'll always stay lucky. But after last night's kiss-a-thon, it's hard to imagine leaving so soon. I want to stay and flirt a little longer. Oh, who am I kidding? I just want to make out some more. I'm distracted when I enter the cave, and I don't see Herrick until I step inside fully, and then I'm being kissed with wild, ferocious abandon. Herrick's lips are on mine, and his tongue strokes into my mouth before I can say a peep. Then I forget about saying a thing, because I'm too busy enjoying the kisses. I moan as he licks against my tongue, the movement filthily sensual and as wonderful as it is wet. If I had panties, they'd be sopping at this moment. He's far too good at kissing. Come sit by the fire, he murmurs between kisses. Let me warm you. I whimper because my mind goes to all kinds of dirty places at that invitation. It's not until he takes a limping step backward that I realize he's walking around, that he actually got up to meet me at the entrance to the cave. Your leg, I protest. It takes me another moment to realize he's naked. Well, no, not completely naked. He's wearing the bandages on his leg. That's it. Um, Herrick? Should I go? I half shield my eyes from his nudity, even though I really want to look. Did I interrupt something private? Go? Why? He glances down at his naked body and then back up to me. I did this for you. You what? I squeak out. He might be moving a little faster than I expected. Yes, he says, smiling broadly as he takes my gloved hand. He wrinkles his nose and then frowns, dropping it. Fuel collecting? Don't change the subject, I tell him, and my voice is all high and wobbly. But gosh darn it, he's really, really naked, and I can tell just by looking down, even though I'm trying really hard not to, that he's aroused. I don't even know if you should be on your leg, much less on your leg and naked. He looks down again, then up at me. Have you never seen a naked male before? Well, yes, I have, actually. I had the internet back at home, and cable. But I... I glance down again and suck in a breath because his anatomy looks, uh, different. What the fuck is that? Herrick chuckles. I am surprised you have not seen such things around the bathing pool back at the village. That, he says proudly, and leans forward to whisper to me, is my cock. I want to smack a hand to my forehead. Not that, you dingling. I start to point and then stop myself because I don't put it past Herrick to grab my hand and give me a guided tour. The thing above it. My spur. What the heck is a spur? How did I miss this in conversation? Have I just not been asking the right questions? He's right in that I tend to avoid the bathing pool the moment someone starts to undress. Maybe it's the awkward girl inside me, but I'm not comfortable when strangers start stripping down. Obviously, I've been missing out on a few anatomy lessons. I feel like I need to smack Georgie and Ellie and Gail for not saying a thing about the anatomy differences. Herrick looks confused. He shrugs his shoulders. It is my spur. Do human males not have them? I shake my head. What does it do? Do? He lowers a hand to touch it. Must it do something? 
I stop him before he can reach down and stroke it. Somehow that seems wrong. Do you have any other extra body parts that I need to be aware of? His grin grows wider. How do I know if they are extra? Though I am more than happy to have you explore me. He spreads his arms wide. I am yours, my pretty Kate. I push past him, stripping off my dirty gloves and putting the dung chips into the fuel basket. I think we need to talk about last night, I say, not looking him in the eye. Busy, busy, must stay busy. This is because of last night, he tells me, moving to my side. I can feel his big body hovering close to mine. Really close. Remember our discussion. I'm having a hard time thinking about anything other than his dick proximity. Okay, and the spur. Um, I will help you with your shyness, Herrick proclaims. I am naked so we can get used to each other. By being naked? I cry out, looking up into his face. Seriously? If you are used to my body, you will not blush as much. You will welcome the sight of my cock because you know it will bring you pleasure. I stare at him. And then I start to snort with laughter because it's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. So, my Pavlovian response to when you whip your dick out is pleasure? Is that what we're doing? Seriously? His smile dims a little. You do not think this is a good idea. Oh, I don't want to hurt his feelings, but I'm not sure I'm down with this. Herrick, it's just that, well, I'm going to stare if you're naked. I welcome your staring. He spreads his arms wide. I wish for you to look to your heart's fill. Part of me wants to do that, too. Except I just can't. Right now, I want to cover my eyes. I strip off my gloves and toss them into the fuel basket. Herrick. Kate. He takes my hands in his and turns me to face him. This is all because of your shyness, yes? You grow nervous when I show you my body because you think it is some sort of prank I will play on you. Did you not enjoy our mouth matings last night? He presses my hand to his mouth and kisses my knuckles. I know I did. And I'm lost at that small, simple touch because I did. I really, really did enjoy our kissing. You know I did. Will you not want more than just mouth matings at some point? His eyes gleam. There are many places for a male to put his mouth on his female. I press my fingers to his lips, silencing him. You've made your point. I'm just... a little shocked, that's all. You're very forward. Only because I see what I want. His lips brush against my fingertips. And you said you would help me with my fears, so I am to help you with yours. I'm not afraid, exactly, I tell him. Then why will you not look at my cock? I like to think it is a fine one. Oh, God, this man is determined to make me blush. From what I saw, you looked perfectly adequate. You should look again, if you are not afraid. Damn the man. I look down, but my focus goes instead to the bandages on his leg. You're distracting me from the fact that you're on your feet. How is your leg? It does not ache nearly as much as my cock. I can't help but laugh at that. You are an extremely focused man. Very. He grins at me and shifts his weight on his legs. And I thought to exercise my leg a bit. It is sore, but it feels as if it healed well. I smile, but the truth is, I'm a little disappointed to hear that. If his leg is strong enough to stand on, it means we'll be leaving to rejoin the others soon, and we haven't gotten past much more than kissing. Suddenly I see why he's naked, and I feel my own ridiculous urge to shuck my clothing and move our relationship along. What if I get all weird about things when we rejoin the others? What if he pulls back and begins to flirt with Summer or Brooke? I'd be devastated. For the first time, I don't want to leave the cave or our cozy little pattern we have set up. I want to keep laughing with Herrick and keep having him shock me. And more than anything, I want to keep kissing him. 
but I don't know how to express this without making a fool of myself, so I just squeeze the hand holding mine. We'll be leaving soon, then? He nods. In two, perhaps three days. Ah. You look sad. He puts his fingers under my chin and tilts my head up to meet his, and the expression on his face is pure, infuriating, sexy Herrick. Are you disappointed you will no longer have me to yourself? I push his hand away and put a faint smile on my face. It's just easy when it's the two of us, you know? I just don't want things to change when we're around the others. If you mean my feelings for you, they will not change in the slightest. He puts an arm around my waist and pulls me against him, then pushes my braid aside and begins to kiss my neck. I have felt this way for many weeks, pretty Kate. I see no reason for it to change now. His breath tickles my skin, and then he presses his lips to the base of my throat, working his way up the side. And oh, it feels amazing. I put my hands on his arms, holding him close and biting back the moan rising in my throat. I thought a neck would be a fairly unexciting place to kiss, but it turns out that it's extremely sensitive. The nip of his sharp teeth against my skin makes me shudder, and when his tongue strokes over my skin, I can't help but give a small breathless cry. Herrick groans against my neck, pressing me tighter against him. My sweet human, your scent is maddening. He's distracting me completely and utterly. I should protest. But then he presses his hips up against my front and... I can feel the large, hard length of his erection against my belly. And then I know I need to shut this down. I push him gently away. Can we go a little slower? You wish me to kiss your neck slower? No, I mean, can we not go so fast? Then I realize he's probably going to misunderstand that, too. We just started kissing last night. I like you, a lot, but... I don't know if I'm ready to do more than just share a few kisses. Not just yet. Recognition dawns on his face. Of course. It shall be as you wish it to be, pretty Kate. He smiles at me and leans in to press a kiss to my forehead. We shall go as slow as you wish. I'm relieved, I think because there's an enticing mental image going through my head of him flinging me down on the blankets and having his way with me. It's both exciting and scary, but I'm going to be cautious. If Herrick breaks my heart, I don't know that I'll ever recover. Herrick. My skittish Kate holds my finger, a bone all poised near the tip. Are you ready? No. I wipe at my brow, already sweating. I feel this is a bad idea. She chuckles and moves to my side, her teats pressing against my arm. She grabs a hold of it tightly and gives me a squeeze. Don't worry, okay? Even if you faint, I have you. You are missing the point, I tell her, breathing quickening. I do not want to faint, which is why we're going to work on this, she says, authority in her voice. She gives my arm another encouraging squeeze. You can do this, Herrick. I am not certain I can, but Kate is determined. It has been a pleasant day thus far. I kissed my female many times when she returned to the cave, and we worked all afternoon on cleaning furs and sewing clothes for travel since our old leathers were destroyed on the glacier. I enjoy working alongside her, and we laugh and talk as we sew, and it makes the hours pass quickly. But as night came on, Kate grew quieter and then turned to me. We should work on your fear of blood, she announced. I am not afraid of blood, I told her. Just my own. And now here we are, me with my arms stretched out in front of me, my female and soon-to-be pleasure mate crouched at my side, ready to wound me the moment I give her the word. My stomach is queasy at the thought, and I am sweating profusely. I do not like this. Not at all. Ready? She prompts again. No. I am not certain I will ever be ready. Harak! She turns and gives me an exasperated look, and her full teeth brushes against my arm again. It reminds me that I did not make much progress with her either. Be brave, she tells me. It's just a tiny prick. 
I am brave, I protest. Have I not hunted the Sakotsk? Have I not brought back much food for the tribe, even when the brutal season is at its coldest? I am no coward. Good. Then let's do this. She leans forward with the awl again. I yelp, closing my hand before she can touch my finger. Kate! She turns to me and there's a look of surprise and wonder on her face. Are you okay? You turned to this awful grayish blue. She blinks and then presses her hand to my cheek. Oh my word, you're sweating. You're really afraid. Did you think I would pretend? No, I guess it's just startling to see. She puts down the awl and presses her hand to my cheek. I'm sorry, we'll practice a little every day, okay? You did great, I promise. I do not feel as if I did great, but her hand on my cheek helps. We'll try again when you're ready, Kate tells me, giving my arm a pat and getting up. She crosses the cave, and I watch her as she moves, her hips swaying. I watch her and do not even mind that she has no tail. It makes her bottom that much more charming. And I think about our kisses from this morning. I would do so much more with her if she would let me, if she was not afraid. We can try again, I say. She turns around, curious. Right now? Yes, but only if you wish to work on your fears with me. She pauses and the funny expression crosses her face that tells me she is turning pink. Oh, do you not wish to practice? If you are not interested in me as a mate, that's not it. I gesture at my loincloth. Then come. I will let you prick me, and I will remove this as I do so. Boy, you sure are willing to get naked, Kate says, but she returns to my side, her steps slow. As willing as you are to stab me, I pat my knee. But come, I will keep my loincloth on if you will come sit in my lap as you wound me. Kate sidles closer until her knees are practically touching mine. Just me in your lap? That is all. And if she wants more, it will make it easy for her to ask. In the meantime, I will get to touch her soft skin and inhale her sweet scent. She licks her lips and then nods. All right, as long as it won't hurt your leg? Never. I gesture at my opposite leg, indicating she should sit there. Your weight is slight. My female gives me another skeptical look, but delicately takes a seat on my good knee. She studies my bandaged leg, clearly worried over it. She has fussed over me all day, asking how it felt every time I took a step. It aches and twinges, but it will not grow stronger if I lie around. My cock, however, aches fiercely, and the pain grows more intense with her nearness. Her scent envelops me, and I want to bury my face against her neck and breathe deep, but she looks nervous. So I only smooth her thick, frizzy braid off her shoulder and give her my easiest smile. You sure this is all you want? She arches an eyebrow at me. It is not all I want, I admit. You know what I want. But it is all I will bargain for, for now. Her cheeks turn bright pink. Chapter 9 Harak I wait for her to protest, to tell me that it is too much, that I push too hard. But she only wiggles on my knee and gives me a small smile. Are you going to be okay? Are you? I retort, challenging her. I want that fierce Kate to rise instead of the uncertain one. I want her to realize she has nothing to fear from me. Her soft mouth firms into a hard line and she narrows her eyes at me. Hand, please. The enormity of what I am doing sinks in at that moment and I begin to sweat. I am giving her permission to harm me, to draw my blood all so I can be nearer to her. My breath becomes rapid, my chest tight, and even Kate's nearness cannot distract me from this as she pulls the all out once more. As if she senses my panic, Kate looks over at me. It's going to be okay, Harak. I promise. I focus on her mouth, its plump, pink softness and the little flashes of white teeth when she speaks. I will think about kissing her, not about her pricking my finger. Not about my blood, bright red and spilling from my body. Not about pain and death and bleeding out. You're pale again, she whispers. I nod. I need a moment. I need a moment to focus on her and not what I know is coming. My vision grows hazy even as my breathing speeds up and I focus in on her, her pale brows, her cloud-like mane. Most of all, I lock onto her mouth, imagining mine over it. She reaches up a hand and brushes the backs of her fingers along my jaw. Can you focus on me? Think about something else other than what's going to happen. 
I am thinking about your mouth, I tell her, and where you wanted to go. Her voice is husky, sweet. My thoughts switch just like that. My free hand, the one she is not holding, locks around her waist, and I hitch her closer to me, pulling her tight. I imagine her mouth on mine, her tongue flicking against my own. I think about the soft noises she makes when I stroke my tongue deep, or the way her hip feels when my hand locks onto it. I think about how it felt to hold her close last night and to sleep with her in my arms. It was the best moment of my life, and I want it again. You were looking at me so intensely, she whispers, and her gaze is locked on my mouth. You told me to think of other things. I am. Dirty things? Good things. Very, very good things. I lick my lips and am fascinated when her attention moves there. I was thinking about where I would put my mouth if I had my choice. Oh? She sounds shaky but fascinated. I am told that there is no taste sweeter on the tongue than a resonance mate's cunt, but I bet yours would rival it. I watch her mouth, fascinated when it opens in breathless shock, and I would like to taste you and find out. Oh, oh. Now she is breathing hard, her gaze unfocused, eyes soft as she gazes at my mouth. You want to go down on me? Do I? I would go between your thighs and never come up. I tell her. I would lick you until you leave nail marks on my horns. I would use my tongue to... Trembling, she presses her fingers to my mouth to silence me. Does she think that will work? I lick at them and then take one fingertip between my lips and gently suck on it. Her low little moan is delicious to hear. You're distracting me. I am. I do not deny it. Let's get this over with so we can do... other things. She tears her gaze away from my mouth and turns back to my hand. I spread it wide for her, though I am still nervous. It is just that now my nervousness is mixed with anticipation. What other things will she let me do to her? I would give anything for the privilege of licking her cunt. My mouth waters at the thought, and I barely notice as she strokes my palm with her fingers. Perhaps she will not let me lick her tonight, if she wishes for us to take our time, but soon, I hope. Or perhaps it is something I can dare her into— there is a tiny sting on my finger. My focus immediately rips back to the present, and I stare at the bright red bead of blood welling up on my finger. My blood. My blood. Nausea crashes over me. My body grows cold, and black creeps in at the edge of my vision. Harrick! Kate's hands grip my horns, hauling my head upright. Stay with me. You're okay. She takes a deep, loud breath. Inhale, then exhale. Okay? Big, deep breaths. You can do this. I feel as if I will vomit. My head spins and I breathe deep, though it is not easy. The black at the edge of my vision is waiting to pull me under, and all I can think about is the red of blood, the bright splash against the blue of my skin. Focus on me, Herrick. Kate leans in and presses her mouth to my unresponsive one. Come on, tell me more dirty things you want to do to me. I want to, but all I can think about is the blood. So much blood. Blood and death. All right, Kate says quickly. If you won't tell me, maybe I'll tell you what I want to do to you. Maybe tonight I want to share your blankets again. I liked sleeping next to you and feeling your skin against mine. I struggle to keep my eyes open and her pale face swims in and out of view. To gather? My voice sounds thick, my thoughts racing and scattered. That's right. Together. Her voice is soft and sweet and she presses another kiss to the corner of my mouth. I want more kisses. I want more touching. But you have to stay awake for me, all right? She wants more? I am not sure if she says it simply to distract me or if it is truth, but I will take it either way. Kate, I murmur, chanting her name under my breath to focus in on her. Kate. 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 That's right, she encourages. No blood. Her hand swipes over my fingers. See? It was just the tiniest bit, and I've wiped it away. You can relax, I promise. Kate. I say her name in my mind, and it helps the blackness recede. Kate. Kate. Are you okay? She asks, after what seems like a very long moment. Still going to pass out? I repeat her name in my mind a few more times, and then squeeze an eye open, daring a glance at my hand. There is nothing to be seen but blue skin. No blood. I emit a deep sigh of relief, and the sick feeling goes away. I think I have survived. Survived your finger prick? My champion. 
There's a dry, teasing note in her voice, and she caresses my cheek. Seriously, though, you did amazingly well. Now we just need to practice that daily. Daily? It sounds miserable. Will you promise to sit in my lap each and every time? She giggles. <laughs> of course. Her high, sweet laughter makes me feel good. It eases some of the shakiness remaining in my body and makes me relax. I know it is a foolish fear. We all have foolish fears, she interrupts. I don't like spiders. Some people don't like heights. Pashov's mate does not, I say absently. Now that there is no danger of blood, I am far more interested in the fact that her warm, rounded bottom is perched upon my thigh, of the hand that touched my face and now rests upon my chest. I am not interested in thinking about Pashov's mate or fears. I am interested in Kate's touch and how close she leans to me. I keep my grip on her hip and stroke my thumb over her leathers, wishing it was her skin instead. Her gaze locks on my face and she gives me a fascinated look. Are you petting my ass? Perhaps. When she doesn't get up or slap my hand away, I ask, Should I stop? Kate hesitates and then shakes her head. No. She leans in and very slowly and gently presses her mouth to mine. I groan with need. She is the one who is initiating more. It is what I have wanted and waited for for so long. I kiss her back, my tongue mating with hers, sweeping into the hot well of her mouth like I want to do to her cunt. I would pet all of you, I tell her between searing kisses, my lips, my hands. No part of your body would go unexplored. She shivers against me, and her hands rest on my shoulders. Her fingers curl against my skin, and she presses her lips to mine again. I guess I should work on my shyness, then, since you did so well with your fear. I need to hear no more. I scoop my female into my arms and half drag, half carry her over to the furs. My foot gets caught in the blankets, and we end up tumbling to the ground, and I barely manage to avoid crushing her with my weight. Her little scream of alarm is followed by laughter. I can walk, you know. I am far too eager to touch you to wait for such things, I tell her playfully, and I like how this has ended up. She is now in the ground underneath me, her long limbs sprawled in the furs. Just don't break your other leg, Kate teases, sliding her hand up my arm. I have about reached the limits of my nursing. I would rather have two working legs, I reassure her, because I need my knees so I can spend all of my time licking between your thighs. She sucks in a breath and squeezes her legs together. Sometimes you are so damn forward. Is this a bad thing? I lean over her and nip at the line of her jaw. So fascinatingly delicate, these humans. Just take some getting used to for me. Because you are shy? I kiss along her cheekbone. Her scent is so lovely. Her little nod just makes my heart swell. I am pleased you are trying hard, and I am going to enjoy the trying very much. I grin at her. Well, I hope I do too, she retorts, then blushes bright. Shall I continue to kiss you? Or are you wishing to go slower? I do not know what will be slower than kissing, but I am willing to change what I am doing if it bothers her. I'll tell you if we should stop. Her hand smooths down my chest again, the look on her face fascinated. I realize I am nearly naked and she is fully clothed, and she cannot resist touching me over and over again. Would you like to explore me? Explore you? Her eyes go wide. Indeed. It is clear that there are differences in my body than what you expect. Would you like to touch me and learn for yourself? I lie back in the furs and put my arms over my head. I will not do a thing. She stares at me. Her face is flushed bright, but she looks interested. I don't know. Where is the brave Kate who challenges me so fiercely? I dare her. Is she scared of a cock and spur? You're just saying that because you want my hands on your junk, she mutters. But she sits up and gazes down at me with defiance. What if I decide I don't like touching you? I will mourn the death of our pleasure mating, I say, grinning. She will like touching me. I know it. No, I mean, what if... What if I stop and you're not done? I frown. Is this another human phrase I do not understand? I don't know. She wrings her hands. Human guys have certain expectations. Like, if I start touching you, you need to come. And if I don't finish what I start when I touch you, then I'm the problem. I sit up in the furs, no longer amused. You think I would force you to touch my cock? That I would be angry if you stopped? She bites her lip and looks uncertain. I'm not saying you would. I just... 
want to be clear, you know. Then let me be very clear. I take her hand in mine and press it to my heart. If you do not want to do more than touch my cheek, I will take that and be grateful for your touch. You sure? I am most certain. Human males sound rather terrible. Strange how their females can be so wonderful and the males so brutal. Perhaps they have so many females around that they do not realize what a gift they are. It is their loss. Kate gives me another nervous look. All right. If I touch something you don't like, let me know, okay? I cannot imagine a touch that I would not like. What if I stick my finger up your butt? I stare at her. Truly? I have to admit, perhaps I would not like that. She breaks into peals of laughter, clutching her sides and falling over in the furs. You should have seen your face. She is so adorable in her laughter that I cannot help but join in. I grab her and pull her into my arms, grinning as she squeals. Do you prank me, pretty Kate? Because I am willing to try if it is something you enjoy. When she only laughs harder, shaking her head, I tickle her sides. Clever, clever Kate. Stop, she wriggles, laughing and trying to get away from my hands. It's what you deserve after giving me shit all the time. I think she refers to my teasing. I run my fingers up and down her sides, enjoying her squeals. I would give you everything, pretty Kate, not just my shit. She only howls with more laughter, pushing at my hands. Stop, she pants, giggling. It's too much. You're killing me. I chuckle but let my hands fall away so she can catch her breath. Her laughter fills the cave, warm and lovely, and then she sits up, her face flushed, her unusual mane nearly free from its braid. And she looks aroused. My body instantly responds, my cock surging to life. It takes everything I have not to grab her and drag her back into my arms. I want to touch her again more than anything, and even though it is difficult, I wait. Her breath catches and she sits up, moving a little closer to me. Her hands go to my chest and she presses them there lightly. I think I'm going to touch you now, she whispers. I welcome it. Kate's hands go to my jaw and she presses them lightly on both sides, gazing into my eyes. It is as if she is gathering her courage. She takes a deep breath, gives me a tiny, heartbreaking smile, and then concentrates on exploring me. Her expression turns serious as her hands move along my face, over my cheekbones and brow, and then my ear. She runs her fingers along the curve of one horn, stretching her body to trace its length. Her movements push her teats close to my face, but I close my eyes, unwilling to grab her. You got quiet, she whispers. I do not wish to interrupt. So why me? She asks as her hands go to my shoulders again and then explore the hard plates along my lower arm. Why not Summer? She's pretty. Or Brooke. She's got big boobs and she's really nice. Why me when there are more attractive girls? Because I like you, I say simply, opening my eyes to watch her. The answer does not satisfy her. Because I'm tall? Because you are... you... Because you get angry when I tease. Because when I challenge you, you get this determined look on your face as if you want to prove me wrong. Because you make me smile and laugh and you have a good heart. I'm not sure about the good heart thing. It is true, I reassure her. No one else would help me conquer my fear of blood so sweetly. She gives a little snort and I grin. And you have lovely, long, strong legs. So much flattery. But she sounds pleased. Indeed, I would fill your ears with it nightly if you were my pleasure mate. I would tell you all about the pale cloud of your mane and how I think of you every time I see the sky. I would speak of your soft skin and your pretty smile. I would tell you all about how your rich scent makes my cock hard and how tasting you between your legs is the best thing I have ever experienced. She looks shaken. You haven't tasted me yet. I know already. Mating your mouth with my tongue was incredible. How can mating your cunt with my tongue be any less so? Kate gives a little moan, and her hands move to my chest. Her fingers spread, and then she strokes them over my flat teats and their hard nipples. Oh, wow. These are different than human ones. Her touch is ticklish, and I do my best to remain still. How so? Mine are softer. Her face goes red. Yours are very hard. She slides her fingers over them again, and then she looks up at me. Do they feel good? All of your touches feel good, pretty Kate. She gives a little laugh. Well, if that doesn't feel any better than any other touch, I guess I need to keep exploring. 
I do not mind this. I wait patiently with my hands on my thighs as she traces the muscles in my stomach. Her hands are edging closer to my loincloth, and I want her to rip it off and exclaim at my cock in its hard length. Or she could just touch it. That would make me happy as well. I am easy to please. Her hand glides over my stomach again, and she circles my navel with her fingertips. Man, you have a really hard stomach. I can see all your muscles. Is this pleasing? Perhaps she comments because humans do not appreciate that, though the other males in the tribe have never indicated otherwise. Oh, yeah, Kate breathes. I like it. I like her touch there. My cock aches so close she could just reach down and caress it through the leather of my loincloth. It would take nothing for me to thrust my hips and force it into her hands, but I will not. I begin to sweat with the effort of remaining still as her hands caress my sides and then move to squeeze one of my arms, and she exclaims over their size and strength. Was any male ever so cruelly and wonderfully tortured? Then she leans in and brushes her lips over my shoulder, and I have entirely new things to fantasize about. I groan low in my throat because her skin brushes against mine and her mane is so close I can bury my face in it. I inhale deeply. I love your scent. As if this is a challenge, Kate leans in and sniffs me. I like yours, too. You smell like outdoors and sweat. It's actually really nice. Her fingers trace a thick vein in my forearm. I like almost everything about you. Almost everything? She grins. I'm sure there are some annoying things I'm missing. Never. I am the most charming of hunters. Your modesty, then. That's what's missing. I grin because she is not wrong. I shall work on that to please you. Don't change a thing. Your cockiness makes me smile. She tilts her head, well, and roll my eyes. But it's fun. She reaches up and plays with a strand of my mane, rubbing it between her fingers. This feels different, too. Your hair feels thicker, bigger, not as soft. She strokes a hand down my arm again. Not like your skin. I groan again at her light touch. I am not soft in many places. Yes, you are. Everywhere there's blue. Her fingers skim over my chest. You're like velvet covering steel, though that sounds corny. But it's true. I can't stop touching you. And Kate touches my stomach once more. I do not wish for you to stop, I tell her in a husky voice. Would you like for me to lie down again? Kate licks her lips, looking nervous. I'm, I'm not sure. She closes her eyes and then gives herself a little shake. Actually, you know what? Screw it. Yes, lie down so I can keep touching you. Her face is bright red, her eyes shiny. My brave mate, I tell her, proud. I lie back and then offer, shall I undress for you? No. Her voice rises in a squeak. Then she clears her throat. No, I can do it. I should do it. Her gaze goes to my lap and the bulge of my cock in the loincloth. I will do it. I am yours then. I put my hands behind my head, avoiding my horns. I try to remain still, but my tail is flicking wildly on the blankets next to my leg. I wonder if she will stroke it next. It is as if my wishes are answered. Her gaze goes to it, and then she looks over at me, full of curiosity. Is it okay if I touch your tail? All of me belongs to you, I tell her, but if you are asking if it is sensitive, the answer is yes. Her brows rise, and she looks fascinated. She licks those pink lips of hers, and my cock aches all the more. I'm going to touch it then. Just a warning. No warning needed, though I am amused that she feels it necessary to caution me. Kate scoots a little closer and then lightly runs a finger down the length of my tail, then looks up at me to see my reaction. I shudder slightly because the tail is sensitive, especially at the tufted tip. What's it feel like? What do you mean? I shrug. It feels good. Like... Ticklish good or nipples good? Her cheeks go red again. Or licking things good? I picture all three of those and have to fight for control. Ticklish, I decide. Not nipples. Not your nipples, mine. Now I am the one that is fascinated. Tell me more. She bites her lip and gives me a shy look, squirming a bit. I shouldn't have said that, should I? But since I did... Well, a woman, a human woman, anyhow, has very sensitive nipples... When they're licked and touched, you feel it all over. Her hands stray to the front of her tunic, and then she grips it, hands flexing. It's a really good feeling. Another male has done this to you? 
but I cannot help the surge of jealousy that rushes through me. What? No, that's what happens when I do it to myself. And now we're getting into super uncomfortable territory, so I'm going to go back to touching you. She avoids looking at me and strokes my tail again. I am fascinated. She speaks of touching herself. I want to know what other parts she touches to pleasure herself, but then she pets the tip of my tail and my entire body clenches, my cock jerking. Ah! Oh, her hands fly back. Did that hurt? I nearly spilled in my loincloth. I grip my cock, willing my body to calm down. No, I respond thickly. Felt good. Too good. Oh, do you need a moment? At my nod, she clasps her hands in her lap. Tell me more about you touching yourself. What? Her mouth forms that pink circle again. If I cannot have her touch at every moment, I want her to share more with me. Tell me about pleasuring herself and what she likes. Mostly I just want to hear her lovely voice as she describes touching herself. I close my eyes, tightly gripping my cock in an effort to squeeze myself back to normalcy. I need a moment to breathe, to compose myself, and then I will let her touch me again. She's utterly silent, though, and when I have myself under control, I glance over. You do not wish to say? To talk about masturbating? She licks her lips, then gives a little shake of her head. I, I don't think I can. Her shyness is too great. Shall I tell you about how I touch myself? When she makes another strangled little sound, I chuckle. She is not there yet. That is all right. It will save something for the future. For now, I am content to let her touch me. I will just imagine the rest. I take her hand and place it on my stomach again. All better, she asks. I grunt. I do not know if better is the right word. Better would mean her hands on my cock, stroking me until I come, my fingers buried deep in her cunt as she squeezes around me. Her hand strokes my belly, almost petting my skin, and then she moves forward, nudging closer until she's practically straddling my thigh. Her teats rest against my chest, and she leans in, brushing her mouth over mine. You can touch me, too, you know. You would like that? Kate's little nod is all the incentive I need. I hold her tight against me and roll our bodies in the furs until we are side by side, and I slide the edge of her makeshift tunic up her leg. She's breathing hard, and her hands go to the waist of my loincloth, her lips meeting mine in another hot, wet mating of mouths. I cannot move my hand very high under her tunic, since she lost hers making the rope to save me, she has been wearing one of the bed furs with a hole cut out for the neck and belted tight at the waist. This presents a problem, but only a small one. Can I take off your belt? She gives a little gasp against my mouth. I, I'm naked under it. I don't have a bra on. The band she wears around her teeth? Do you wish me to stop? No, she says breathlessly. I just wanted to let you know that if you reach up, you're going to find boob. I welcome this, I tell her. Me too, she says, and there is such shyness in her voice, it makes me ache. I want her to enjoy my touch, because I want her to crave it as much as I crave touching her. I cannot imagine that a human male would not find her attractive just because she is taller than them. If she towered over me, I would still find her lovely. I would still put my mouth all over her legs and caress her body and woo her to my furs. There is nothing about her that I do not like. I pull at her belt, undoing the knots with my fingers. Tell me if you wish for me to stop. I don't want to stop, she murmurs, kissing me again. I want to touch you, and I want you to touch me. She skims her fingers along the band of my loincloth, teasing at the flesh there. I fling her belt aside, and she sucks in a breath. I press my forehead to hers as I slide my hand up her soft belly. It is gently rounded, and she feels incredible. Hunger rushes through me, and I nearly lose control when I feel her hand move lower, cupping my cock. Oh, wow, that feels impressive. I knew you were big, but, oh, gosh, I groan. My size pleases you? Oh, yeah. And you've got ridges, she breathes, as her fingers outline my shape through the leather. That's going to be interesting. You will like it, I promise her. I will make sure she is wet and flushed with pleasure before my cock ever gets near her. I will make you feel good. I know, she says, and her lips brush over mine. You always do. I move my hand up and brush it over the curve of one teat. She gasps and a little moan escapes her. Oh, 
She is so soft here. I explore her with my fingers, tracing the shape of her teeth under the fur tunic. They are round, plump little mounds, unlike the flat, muscular teats of the Sakhui women. Atop it is a ruched little tip, and it is erect but still soft and pleasant to the touch. She makes a little cry when I brush over it, and I realize she is far more sensitive here, just like she said. I am fascinated by this, and I rub gently back and forth, watching her reactions. Kate squirms, her breath coming in sharp pants as I rub at the tip of her teeth. She arches against my hand and her fingers clench around my cock and she gives me a ragged stroke. I, I should be touching you, shouldn't I? She says between panting breaths. Instead, you're making it all about me. That is because there is nothing that gives me more pleasure than touching you, I murmur, pressing another light kiss to her mouth. I would touch you everywhere, taste you everywhere. I want to put my mouth where my hand is. And I stroke my thumb over her teeth again. She gives me a shaky little nod, and I realize she is giving me permission. I was not asking for this, just telling her how I wish to touch her, but I will give this to her. I want her to feel the same need I feel. Gently, I push aside the leather of her tunic, exposing her rounded teeth to the open air. It looks as soft and lovely as it feels, the pink tip tight. I growl low in my throat at the enticing sight and lean down to taste her. Kate moans the moment my lips touch her skin and her hands go to my horns. Encouraged, I hold her tight with one hand on her hip as she squirms underneath me, dragging my tongue over that delicious little tip that she loves to have touched. The taste of her skin is perfect, the feel of her underneath me maddening, and I am lost to the pleasure of touching her. Over and over I lap at her nipple, learning which touches make her sigh happily and which ones make her entire body jerk and come to life. Hungry to give her more, I rub my hand up and down her hip, digging my fingers into her full, rounded bottom. Do you like it when I touch you? I rasp between licks at her nipple. She makes a soft little noise in her throat and arches underneath me, pushing her teeth toward my mouth once more. I want to touch you more, I tell her, and give her a little nip. I want to put my hand on your cunt and feel your heat. Kate moans loudly at this, and I can feel her entire body shiver. You... You do? More than anything. I press fervent kisses to her soft skin. Will it frighten you? What about touching you? Shouldn't I be touching you? Her hands stroke at my horns, then my mane, then flutter over my shoulders, as if she was uncertain what to do. Nothing would give me greater pleasure than putting my hand between your thighs, I promise her. The little sigh she gives tells me everything, as does the way she relaxes her knees, letting her legs fall open. It is a silent invitation, but the kiss she bestows on me is hot and full of need and encouragement. I slant my mouth over hers, my tongue stroking deep into her mouth, and she clings to my shoulders, rubbing up against me with impatience. She is just as eager as I am, her moans of encouragement making my body shudder with need. I push my hand past the waistband of her leggings and cup her mound. She gives a squeak of surprise, going still underneath me, and I pause to let her get used to my touch. I am fascinated by the way she feels, the tangle of curls underneath my hand and the heat pouring from between her thighs. I want to push deeper, to explore her with my fingers, but I must go slower, as she has said before. I must take my time to make sure she is enjoying herself. Do you wish for me to stop? I nudge my nose against hers and then brush my lips over her mouth. Would you prefer just mouth matings? No, I want this. Her fingers curl against my shoulders. It's just... Startling, that's all. It feels intense. Then she shyly leans in and gives my lower lip a gentle bite, then swipes it with her tongue. The banked hunger inside me roars to a blazing fire. I kiss her hungrily again, devouring her soft mouth, even as I press my fingers against her cunt. Immediately I encounter slickness. She is wet with need from our touches, and I groan as I drag my fingers up and down her soft heat, exploring her folds while she whimpers into my mouth. So sweet. So good. She is impossibly soft here, and I gently touch her, learning her body. I have seen naked females before, but I have never touched one. Her folds are swollen and slick, and she rocks her hips as I move my hand, encouraging me. She pants against my mouth, no longer kissing me. She is too distracted. That is all right. I am too. 
All of my focus is on the hot, wet cunt in my hand. I drag my forefinger along her folds and discover a little bump at the top of the valley. The moment I touch it, she jerks in my arms, the breath exploding from her, and she clutches at my forearm tightly. Oh, God! I pause. What is it? This must be her third nipple, as the others have mentioned. Humans have this, but Sakui females do not, and supposedly they like for it to be touched. Perhaps my Kate does not? I just... She bites her lip and rubs her hips up against my hand. That was a lot to take in at once. It was bad? God, no. She presses her forehead against me. Really, really good, she whispers. So good it scared me a little. I will go slower, as you say. She gives a little nod and I pet her cunt, stroking it with careful, easy motions. I do not wish to startle her or make her frightened. I kiss her mouth again, my tongue dancing along the seam of her lips as my fingers do along the seam of her cunt. When she moans, I go a little deeper, stroking up and down the valley of her sex. I circle a fingertip around her core, my hand coated with her juices. I am dying to taste her, but I am going slow, I remind myself. Licking my hand like a ravenous beast is not slow. But I am eager to touch her third nipple again. I kiss down her neck, then nuzzle at her throat. Put your hands on my horns and feed your pretty teats to my mouth, I demand, sliding my fingers up and down her wet folds. Kate's breathless moan of response makes my cock twitch. She clutches at my horns, bringing her body up slightly, and then her nipples are in my face. I nip at one and then take it into my mouth, licking and sucking at the sensitive tip. She cries out, rubbing up against me, and I slide my fingers along the wet seam of her cunt again. I want to push a finger deep inside her and watch her ride it. I want to push my tongue inside her and let her ride it as well. I nuzzle at her teeth, lavishing attention on it as she moans and rides against me. Her movements become more frantic, the noises she makes more urgent, and I decide to move things along. I stroke my fingers deeper along the seam of her cunt until I am rubbing along her slick valley and still she whimpers for more. I ache to claim her, to take my own pleasure, but I want this to be about her. I want to make her addicted to my touch. Slowly, gently, I push a finger to the entrance of her core and then begin to press it inside. Oh, God, she pants. Oh, God, oh, God. Shall I stop? I lick the tip of one teat teasingly while she rubs up against me. Or shall I keep going? My Kate gives the most startling snarl and grabs at my mane with both hands. Don't stop, she demands, breathless. Don't stop. Her excitement fuels mine. I drag my teeth over her teat with increased enthusiasm and push my finger deeper into the well of her cunt. She is impossibly tight, but so slick with juices that my mouth waters. Her little cries tell me that she enjoys this, and she continues to squirm against me until my finger is seated deep inside her. I wish it were my cock. Next time, I tell myself, next time it will be my cock sheathed in her cunt, coated with her juices. Next time it will be my spur dragging along her wet folds. This time we go slow. Slow is both wonderful and maddening, I decide. I pump my finger into her slowly, pressing kisses and licking at her little nipple. She moans low in her throat and pushes her hips against me, meeting my thrusts and my cock aches with increased need. I rock my hips in time with the thrusts rubbing against her thigh. Her little whimpers come faster and so I increase the speed of my hand, thrusting desperately into her body. I need, she pants against me, her hands pulling tight on my hair, need more... Herrick, please. What is it? Tell me and I will give it to you. I am as desperate as she is, my body aching with the need for release. I grind my cock against her thigh, close to the edge. But I will not come without her pleasure first. But she just rocks on my fingers faster and harder, making soft noises of frustration. Tell me, I pant, watching her face. Show me. She whimpers and then puts her hand over mine, between her thighs. My clit, she breathes. Need you to touch it, to come. Is this what she needs? I will give it to her. I shift my thumb, sliding it between her folds, and locate the little nub that she has called a clit. This must be what she referred to. I rub my thumb back and forth, and she gives a choked cry, her body shuddering and contracting against me as if she is trying to pull her legs and arms up to protect herself. I immediately stop, worried I am doing it wrong. 
Kate, keep going, she snarls, so forceful it takes me by surprise. I do not need to be told twice, though. I rub her third nipple, even though it makes thrusting into her with my fingers difficult, and she jerks against me, panting my name over and over again. A moment later, she gives a little cry and crushes me against her teats, her hips working in time with my fingers. I can feel her entire body shudder and quake, and my hand is flooded with her wet release. She has come and come hard. It is the most beautiful thing I have ever seen. I continue to pump inside her, wanting to give her as much pleasure as possible. As I do, I grind my cock against her thigh. I am close to my own release, and I rub my face against her teeth, wanting to drown in her warmth and her scent. She gives a low moan of satisfaction, and her thighs squeeze around my hand. Oh, hark. The way she says my name sends a jolt through my entire body. I cannot help myself. I come hard, erupting in my loincloth with an explosion of breath and a frantic release that has been building for days. Who needs resonance? Not me or my sweet Kate. I collapse in the furs next to her, sated. She clings to me, pressing her teats against my face even as she struggles to catch her breath. I do not mind this. My hand is still wedged between her thighs and I can think of no greater place for it to be. I press a kiss to her teeth and cannot help but ask, Was that slow enough for you, my Kate? She gives a choked laugh and plants a hand on my face. Chapter 10 Kate How do you like this? I ask, holding up the tunic I just finished. Well, to call it a tunic might be insulting to tunics everywhere. It's more like it's a poncho with the sides sewn shut. My sewing skills aren't the best, and we don't have a ton of furs to work with in this cave, so I ended up sewing several smaller furs together to form the body of the tunic. The result is... not pretty, but it's warm. And since Herrick doesn't have much clothing-wise and we're going to be leaving soon, we both need to stock up. On the other side of the fire, across from me, Herrick is whittling bones into spear tips. His lap is covered by a length of leather, white flecks of bone shavings all over the place. I'm in charge of clothing while he makes weapons, since we lost those too. It's not because it's sexist either. I honestly don't know how to make a spear, but I can sew a few furs together. Herrick eyes my creation and then gives a sad shake of his head. I do not like it. You don't? I drop my arms, disappointed. Why not? It covers up your pretty teats. I snort giggle. It's not for me, goofball, it's for you. To cover up my teats. He gives me a playful look. Because you do not wish to share me with others. I erupt with laughter. You're ridiculous. Only to make you smile. I continue chuckling, shaking my head as I smooth the tunic out in my lap. Even if this tunic wasn't for you, I wouldn't go around topless. Disappointing, he says and makes a tisking noise. And I get the giggles again. Crazy man. I'm going to assume this is fine and work on another. Herrick's fine going shirtless in warmer weather, but a sudden storm would mean that both of us would need additional layers, and so I want us to be prepared since it'll take a few days to catch up to the others. I fold the tunic up and set it aside. Do not make your next a complicated project, he warns me. We will leave in the morning, I think. Oh? I'm surprised and a little disappointed to hear that, even though I knew it was coming. Your leg is better? He's able to walk on it, but we've been taking it slow, and he's been staying close to the cave so as not to overtire himself. I was hoping we'd stay for a few more days, but I suppose we eventually have to catch up with the others. The last few days have been... exciting ones. Well, not exciting in a lot of ways, I suppose. The day-to-day -day chores remain the same. Collect fuel, check traps, collect snow, cook... So, tend the fire, scrape skins, blah, blah. But between Herrick and me, things have been... heated. I can feel myself blushing even as I pull out a few of the thicker hides from storage. Being here alone with Herrick means that when we pass by, we can grab and caress the other. 
It means me running my hand along his flicking tail if I want to be kissed, or him putting an arm around my shoulders and pulling me against him to caress me. It means long nights of heavy petting by the fire. I've had so many orgasms in the last two days. So many. Herrick's figured out just how to touch me to get me going, and it doesn't take long before I'm practically crawling all over him, begging for him to make me come. Of course, I give as good as I get, and I've learned that he likes to have his spur stroked almost as much as his cock. It's been two days since he first made me come, and we haven't really done much more than petting. It's been hands and mouths, but I haven't gone down on him, and he hasn't gone down on me. I'm waiting for that moment because he talks about it all the damn time and how he can't wait to taste my pussy. Sometimes I want to shout at him and ask him what he's waiting for, but I know exactly what he's waiting for. He's going slow for me. I suspect that if I asked him to eat me out, he would. I'm just not brave enough to ask yet. I'm still working on getting there. But oh, I want to get there soon. I squeeze my thighs together at the thought. Taking it slow is fun, but I'm also hungry for more. It's a little crazy to think about. In the space of a week, we've gone from bickering constantly to me rescuing him to making out like bunnies at every opportunity. I wonder what another week will bring. And I wonder if we can spend it here. Thoughtful, I put my furs down and sidle over to where he's working by the fire. I move behind him and put my hands on his shoulders, rubbing the knots out of them. He groans and tilts his head back, eyes closed. How did you know I needed this? Lucky guess, I tell him. That, and you've been working hard on weapons all day. I rub at his muscles, letting my fingers play over the blue velvet of his skin. I love touching him, love exploring all of this delicious hardness that I get to crawl all over in the furs every night. Is it possible to become addicted to another person? Because I might be. There is much to be done before we leave tomorrow, he murmurs, eyes still closed with pleasure. I stroke my hands over his shoulders, rubbing hard. That's kind of what I'm wondering. Do we have to leave tomorrow? I am afraid we must. He sounds disappointed. I promised Beck I would not stay away long with you, and I worry if we wait too long it will continue to get warmer. I frown to myself because that doesn't make sense to me. Isn't warm weather good for traveling? He shakes his head. It has not snowed in several days, and today was warmer than expected. If it continues to be warm, it will be sky claw weather. Okay, I'll bite. What's a sky claw? It is a great flying predator, many teeth. He picks up the leather skin on his lap, careful not to spill the bone shards, and folds it carefully, setting it aside. They are dangerous to humans. I swallow hard, imagining enormous birds with lots of sharp teeth. They eat humans? One tried to eat Josie, Herrick agrees. Then he reaches back and puts a hand on my hip. But she is much smaller than you. These long legs would not fit into a sky claw mouth. I give his shoulder a smack at his teasing. Very funny. I step away because that's enough massaging if he's going to make height cracks. He only grins and puts his arms around my waist, dragging me into his lap. I like your long legs, and your long arms, and your long hands, and your long tongue. He presses a kiss to my jaw. I choke back horrified laughter. My long tongue? You sweet talker, you. It's amazing you remained single for so long. I like your tongue, Herrick says, grinning. He puts a hand to my cheek and pulls me in for a quick kiss. It feels delightfully long to me. That's so, because I haven't completely used it to the best of its ability, you know. I slide my arms around his neck and do my best to look innocent, even though my heart is pounding in my chest. That's as bold as I've ever gotten with him. Maybe if I hint that I want to go down on him, he'll go down on me. I swear I'm like a kid that can't wait for Christmas. But he only grunts and gives my hip a pat. 
We will tether together as we journey, just to be safe. They are predators that prefer to scoop up their prey, and as long as they cannot lift you off the ground, you should be safe. Wait, what? I stare at him. How is it I blatantly just offered to tongue his dick, and he's back to talking about sky claws? He just shakes his head and strokes my loose curls, twining one around his finger. Do not worry. I will keep you safe. Great, I say faintly. Then I wonder, he does know what a blowjob is, right? Or is that not done with the Sakwi people? I find that hard to believe. Or maybe, maybe he doesn't want one? Nah, every dude wants his dick sucked. I'm a virgin and even I know that. Maybe I'm just being too subtle. We will leave at first light, Herrick promises. So we will pack our things tonight and rest up. He toys with my curl a bit longer and then nuzzles my throat. Bed soon. Hmm. I guess we should get your practice out of the way soon then, huh? He pulls back and grimaces. Perhaps we should leave that for some other time. Nope. I poke a finger in his chest. It's important. You need this just as much as I need my flirting practice. Though, to be honest, flirting practice has pretty much just turned into making out. I have no issue with this, of course. But after days of working on it, I don't know that Herrick's any better when it comes to his own blood. I've threatened pricking his finger, and that's enough to make the man nearly pass out. Through a lot of talking and soothing, sometimes we're able to get further than that, but every time it has the same result. Herrick gets violently ill. It's no wonder he doesn't want to do it, but I feel like it's vital for his safety and mine. What if he gets cut accidentally while we're traveling? I can't hope that I'll be able to carry him to safety every time. Perhaps we should skip it this evening, Herrick says and presses a kiss to my earlobe. We could go straight to our furs. No, it's important, I tell him, sliding out of his grip. I climb out of his lap and go to get my knife from its spot on the wall. If we're both going to get better, we have to practice, and yours is far more important than mine. He snorts. I do not believe that. Yeah, well, humor me. I turn and hold up my small knife and then point at the stool. Sit. Herrick gets to his feet, and as he does, I can tell he's already getting queasy. There's a sickly cast to his blue skin, and I recognize the expression on his face. This is the opposite of what we wanted to achieve. Instead of him getting worked up when he gets cut, now he just gets worked up at the thought of getting cut. I need to think of a way to change this somehow, to distract him from the blood. I move forward and sit in his lap, just like we have in the past. His arms go around me, and he presses a kiss to my shoulder and I feel a surge of affection for the big lug. I know he's trying hard. It's just not working very well for him. I take his hand in mine and smooth my fingers up and down his big palm rubbing it. This isn't a new development, is it? Your fear of your blood? He shakes his head. What happens when you are hunting and you cut yourself? He gives me a crooked, embarrassed grin. I hope that I land someplace soft. I make an exclamation in my throat. If there's one thing I've learned about this planet, it's that it's not exactly safe. There are wild animals everywhere and rocky cliffs and so much snow that Antarctica would be jealous. I can't imagine Herrick out in the field and passing out cold with no one around to look after him or have his back. That scares the crap out of me, you know. He nods slowly, watching as I trace his palm. I know it can be dangerous, but I cannot be a burden to the tribe. Every able-bodied hunter is needed. All the more reason for you to work past this, I tell him gently. There's a look of utter frustration on his face. You think I have not tried to work past this, to put it beyond my mind? I know you have. I stroke his hand as I hold it. Is it something that's happened to you recently, or have you always been like this? He shrugs. It has been a long, long time. Do you know why? I can guess. 
His hand closes around mine and he grips me tightly. I told you that my parents died on a hunt, yes? At the Salt Lake. They were trying to bring in a Tali, except it pulled them under and capsized their raft. Many died that day. I nod because he's told me this before. I was there on the beach with Eklan and Warwick and the others. His face is carefully blank, no hint of his laughing personality showing. My mother did not want to leave me behind at the cave with the others, so I came with them, even though I was far too young to hunt. I stayed on the shore with Eklan, who was injured and teaching his son Warwick how to catch fish in nets. We were too far away to help out and had to watch as the Tali killed everyone. He shakes his head. It is a bad memory. I bite my lip to keep from exclaiming in horror. Of course it's a bad memory. It sounds like an awful one. He's incredibly strong to even be able to talk about it. It was a very bad time, but worse came that next morning, when the remains of their raft washed back to shore. He closes his eyes, composing himself. My parents were still on it. At least, parts of them. All I remember is blood. Blood and hands. Eklon took me away before I could see more, but the worst was done. Ever since then, I have had trouble with blood. He opens his eyes and gazes down at our locked hands. Not any blood, of course. I can bring down a kill like any hunter. But the sight of my own, I cannot do it. It makes my mind shut down, and I cannot go forward. I think it is because of that day. Oh, Herrick. I breathe, and put my arms around his neck, tucking my head against his shoulder. I'm so sorry you had to go through that. I am as well, he says, rubbing my back. Do not be sad for me, pretty Kate. This is a harsh life at times, but it is also a good one. I am told my parents were very happy for many seasons prior to my birth. They were pleasure mates long before they resonated. So I like to think they lived a life of happiness together and had no regrets. They left this life as they lived it, hunting fiercely and always together. That's a good way of looking at things, I suppose, but it doesn't change the fact that they left behind a scarred and orphaned little boy. So that's why you get so sick when you see your own blood, I murmur. You're picturing that day somehow in your mind. He shrugs and looks uncomfortable again, and it breaks my heart to see my strong, smiling Herrick look so downcast. We just need to make you think of other things, I tell him and sit back. I take his hand in mine again and put it on my breast. Like that. He perks up, giving my breast a little squeeze. I admit, this is to my liking. See? We just need to distract you a bit more. I slide a little closer to him. Instead of thinking about how I'm going to prick your finger, why not think about how I'm going to handle your prick? And I take his hand off my breast and caress his palm again, sliding my fingers over his skin. My prick. He frowns and then gives an ah of realization. My cock. That's right. If you make it through tonight's test, I'll give you special treatment. My heart's racing at being so forward, but I'm excited as much as I am aroused. Oh, what is this special treatment? I take his finger and bring it to my lips. Then slowly and very deliberately, I lick the tip and then take his finger into my mouth and suck on it. His lips part and his gaze becomes unfocused. He stares at my mouth, fascinated. I drag my tongue over his finger as I pull it free from his mouth and then lick my lips. Think you can do this for me? But he just looks shocked and keeps staring at his hand cradled in mine. You would put your mouth on my cock. Is this what you promise? Uh, yeah? I don't know if he's freaking out because it's taboo or not and my confidence sinks a little. Humans do that. I have to laugh a little at that. <laughs> yes, we do. You said you would put your mouth on my cunt. How is that any different than me putting my mouth on your cock? He looks dumbfounded. But it is my job to give my mate pleasure. 
I'll unpack that mate comment in a minute, I decide. For now, I'm too focused on the fact that he's never heard of a blowjob. I can't believe the guys in your tribe don't talk about this. There's a bunch of them with human mates. No one mentioned their mate, you know, going down on them? They would not talk about their mates like that. He shakes his head. A hunter does not share what he does with his mate in the furs once they are mated. It is private. Well, that's nice to hear. Do you not want it then? Because I'm offering, but you certainly don't have to take me up on it. I want, he says immediately, and his hand squeezes mine. Do not doubt that I want. He pulls me closer and presses his mouth to mine in a fervent, intense kiss that leaves me breathless. But perhaps we can skip the finger pricking and go straight to the play. Oh, so that's what this is. A distraction? I push back on his chest. Nice try, but no. This is serious and it could affect your life, Herrick. What if there's another glacier or another dangerous situation? Would you really put me in danger over something like this? Never. Good. It's settled. Then we'll practice. I don't pull out my needle yet, but I give him my most unyielding look. Herrick contemplates for a long time, his focus on my mouth. I remain silent, letting him work through this. I can only push so far, after all. And I know he's going to give in when the hand in mine clenches and sweat breaks out on his forehead. Do it, but be quick. I nod. I'm not going to give him time to chicken out either. I lean over and pick up the awl waiting nearby and hold his hand steady. Count to three for me, please. One. He breathes, ragged. I swiftly jab his finger, just a little prick. He makes a groan like he's dying and his eyes flutter back. Herrick, I call. Stay with me, baby. I move my free hand over his cock and rub the bulge there. If you pass out, we don't get to have fun. He groans again, his head swaying. His color is awful, but he's not passed out. This is good. This is progress. It's just a tiny drop of blood on your finger, I promise him. You've got this. You're doing fantastic. And you're going to love it when I suck on your cock. My cheeks feel hot as fire, but it's important to keep him with me to keep him focused. His eyes flutter again and his throat works as if he's trying mightily not to be sick. Enough? He asks eventually. Enough, I agree, and lick the tiny bead of blood off his finger, sucking on the tip as a reward. You were so good, I coo at him. Herrick growls low in his throat, tail flicking mightily. It is gone. His voice is hoarse. All gone. I promise. I licked it away. He leans forward and cups my face in his hands, then kisses me hard and fast. I'm startled by this and the intensity of his need, but I'm moaning seconds later because his tongue dives against mine in such a perfect way. He knows just how to kiss me every stinking time. Herrick leans forward, and to my surprise, he pushes both of us to the ground, me pinned underneath him. His hand goes between my thighs and he rubs me hard through the leather of my leggings. Are you wet for me, pretty Kate? I give him a squeaky yes because I wasn't expecting him to turn the tables on me. Herrick, I thought, there will be time enough for that, he tells me, tugging at my leggings. You promised me a reward. I will take it now. Oh, he would rather go down on me than have me blow him? Oh, God, why is that so damn sexy? I moan and lift my hips so he can pull my pants off. Then I'm naked from the waist down and I barely have time to say anything before he lifts my hips in his arms and plants his mouth right on my folds. I gasp. I can't help it. There's something so immediate and intense about his mouth there. My hands fly to his horns and I hold onto them tightly. I don't want him to stop. I want him to do whatever he freaking wants. Herrick closes his eyes and groans deep. Your taste. So good, Kate. I can feel his tongue swipe over my pussy. So very good. I I'm glad? I mean, what do you say to a guy who's complimenting you like this? Must have more, he rasps, and drags his tongue up and down, licking up my wetness. 
I squirm at the sensation because it feels good, but not the mind-blowing orgasm machine I've been led to expect. I relax and decide to let him do as he pleases and try not to contort or shove his face too much if he does something right. This is about him, I lie to myself. All about him. Of course, then his tongue goes and flicks against my core and I forget all about my promise to myself. Oh, you like that. I like all of it, I manage to choke out through embarrassment. Do what you please. I shall, he murmurs, and then he licks me slow and thorough, and I admit my legs tremble at the sensation. I'm dying to squirm against him because it's maddeningly ticklish as well as pleasurable, but I'm doing my best to hold still. Herrick gives me another slow, thorough lick, exploring my folds with his tongue. He drags it over my clit and I clench involuntarily because it feels really damn good. He chuckles and then begins to circle my clit with the tip of his tongue. And things go from pleasant and ticklish to mind-blowing after all. I arch, moaning, and when he chuckles again, I can feel his breath against my skin. He braces my thigh against his shoulder and lowers his head once more and continues to lick me with those deep drags of his tongue. I lose myself in the movements of his tongue, and when he begins to speed up, I start to grind against him despite my efforts to stay still. I can't any more than I can stay silent. I'm making wild, strange little noises in my throat that should probably be words, but just end up being incoherent. All the while, he just licks and licks and licks me. I feel need spiraling deep inside my belly, building slowly. Oh, that's really good. I breathe, whimpering when he rewards me with another thoughtful lick. As if his tongue isn't enough to drive me crazy, I feel him press a finger at the entrance of my core. He pushes into me slowly and then begins to thrust, dragging his finger in and out while he makes love to my clit. All of the blood pumping in my veins seems to be rushing between my thighs, and I can feel the orgasm building like an oncoming storm, lingering just on the horizon, close enough to see but not close enough to hit. Then he pushes a second finger inside me, stretching me, and his thrusts become quicker, more intense. His lips close over my clit, and he gives it the gentlest little suck. And that storm that seemed so far away explodes through my body all at once. I'm wailing out his name as I come, my thighs shuddering and clamping around his head, and all the while, he keeps licking and thrusting those fingers into me. By the time he's finished, I'm panting and exhausted, my body boneless and limp on the cave floor. He gently sets my hips down on the ground and then leans in to lick me one last time. So good he murmurs, and presses a kiss to the pale curls covering my sex. He nuzzles me again, and my body feels so sensitive I push his head away with a moan. Not yet. Give me a moment. Herrick chuckles. Only a moment, then. I am hungry for you already. Oh, God, this man is going to kill me. I want to clamp my legs together, but he's already gazing down at my pussy with a proprietary look on his face, as if he's just waiting for my okay to dive back in again. This could be the greatest problem a woman was ever faced with. I reach for him with one limp noodle of an arm touching his skin. What about you? Don't you want me to pleasure you? Time enough for that later, he murmurs, and wipes his wet mouth with the most self-satisfied, toe-curling expression I've ever seen. Have you rested enough? You're serious, aren't you? I shield my pussy with my hands. Babe, that was amazing, but I need a few more moments. Either that or I'm going to turn into goo. He responds by taking my ankle in his hand and lifting it to his mouth, pressing a kiss to the inside. Then he begins to slowly kiss back up toward my thigh and I start to squirm biting back the rising moans in my throat. Maybe I'm ready to go again after all. I nudge him with my other foot. You kissing all the way up? Herrick's possessive grin tells me that yes, yes he is. And I shiver with delight. 
Chapter 11 Harak Three Days Later Do I need to carry you? I tease my mate when her steps start to slow in the snow once more. It is always toward the end of the day that my pretty Kate needs to be goaded into pushing ahead. She grows tired, but our destination is not too far in the distance. Do you need me to shove my boot in your ass? She retorts, and I howl with laughter at the thought. She grins back at me, taking the sting out of her words. I adore this female. So quickly she has my heart in her grasp. She now takes all my jokes in stride, and when I push her, she pushes back. Traveling with her these last few days has been one of the greatest joys I have ever experienced. For so long, I have been content to hunt alone, to do my rounds and bring my food back to the tribe. I would spend a few days in the village when I could, but a great deal of my time is spent alone on the trail. I did not realize how lonely it was until I traveled with Kate. Now, every day is an adventure. I wake her up with kisses all over her body, and we share a quick meal before setting off. She is a strong female, and she does not mind the walking or carrying of heavy packs. She can go for much longer than the other human females can, and even though we tether with our braided leather robe, I do not worry Skyclaws will snatch my strong, fierce Kate. She carries a spear in hand and knows how to use it. If anything, Skyclaws should be afraid of my mate. She is mine, I decide. As much as I have never felt resonance, I have never truly cared if it happened to me or not. I courted Tiffany once only because I was lonely and she was beautiful. I do not mind that she made it to Saluk, and now I am grateful for it because it means I was waiting for my Kate. I still do not care if I ever experience resonance, as long as Kate does not either. I want her in my furs, always. Perhaps that is selfish of me, but I cannot give her up. I will not. She is mine, no matter what my queen decides. We travel all day, and at night we curl up by the fire, sharing mouth matings and touches. We have not fully mated yet. We have all the time in the world to explore all that mating has to offer, and I am in no hurry to rush her. I am enjoying touching her in all ways, and there is no sweeter pleasure, yet, than my tongue buried in her cunt. My cock aches to be inside her, but it will happen soon enough. I pause on the trail, noticing that Kate is breathing heavy, and pretend to scrape ice off my boot so she can have time to recover. She pants, brushing her tangle of white mane away from her face and glances around. It's getting dark. Are we stopping somewhere close by for the night? I nod. I know this area well. It is not too much farther. I gesture at a distant hill. Just over that rise are the old tribal caves. Kate looks surprised to hear this. Old tribal caves? I thought someone said those collapsed. They did. I give her a reluctant smile, feeling a bit foolish. There is enough shelter at the base of the cliff to build a fire. I wanted to stop by and see what our old home looked like. My heart misses it sometimes. Homesick? I get that. She puts her gloved hand in mine, and I'd love to see it. Were you born there? I nod to her, and we set off again once she catches her breath. I tell her about the setup of the old cave, the circle with the warm pool of water in the center for bathing, the small, cozy caves that were private but still felt like one big clan living together. The square huts with their stones have more distance between them and feel more remote. I miss the night noises of hearing the others, of kits crying at night and couples mating quietly in their furs. Sometimes silence feels like too much. I squeeze her hand as we walk. When we return to the village, would you like to have a hut together? With me? She looks over at me in surprise, her mouth wide. Are you asking me to move in? I am. I currently live with the other unmated hunters, but I would love to share furs with you permanently. Kate looks amused. I know where you live, silly. Tauschen and Beck complain about your snoring. She leans in, nudging me with her shoulder, though I don't think it's nearly as bad as they say. That is because by the time you are ready to sleep, I have given you so much pleasure with my tongue that... Harak! Her face turns bright pink in that charming way I love. I mean it, Kate, I tell her soberly. Nothing would make me happier than sharing furs with you, for good. And what if you resonate to someone else? She keeps her voice light, but her smile does not reach her eyes. I will tell her not to steal your blankets. She gives another choked giggle and squeezes my hand. You are the worst, the best. Okay, okay. The best. 
She looks over at me. And yes, I'll move in with you. For once, I run out of jokes and teasing. I just grin at her, pleased. Things feel different even before the old caves come into sight. Trails that were once hard-packed and well-trodden are mushy with drifts of snow. Trees that mark caches nearly have their marks overgrown with the sticky bark that coats them. Bushes that were once constantly denuded of their soap berries hang heavy with fruit. We replenish our supplies and continue, but my heart hurts at the sight. This was home before it was destroyed. Perhaps it is not good to come here again, to see it as it is now, but I cannot help it. I want to look upon it once more. Kate has no memories of this place, but she senses my sober mood and is quiet, leaving me to my thoughts. We head on toward the cave, and the cliffs come into view. The small, remembered tufts of Tiffany's once newly planted trees now a neat, strong row of pink saplings that sway close to the cliff wall. They have grown tall in the intervening seasons, a good food source for any traveler heading in this direction. The sight of them makes me sadder because I know Tiffany would want to see this. The cave entrance is not too far away, I tell Kate. She slips her gloved hand into mine again. You okay? I give her a half-hearted smile. Not as much as I would like. I remember it as it was. The village is pleasant, but this will always be home to me. I understand. Her expression is sympathetic. I'm happy here, but I'm always going to have memories of Earth. You can't help but compare the two because it was all you ever knew. Things change, Harrick. They're not good or bad. They're just different. We can look back at the past, but at the end of the day, that's all that it is. The past. Wise words. I nod at her and pull her close, hugging her against my chest. I nearly knock her pack off her shoulders, and she makes a startled noise, but I ignore it. I need to touch her and hold her close. After a moment, she lets the pack slide to the ground and sinks into my arms. Need a hug, big guy? I suppose I do. I rest my chin on her cloud mane. Do you ache to think about your home? My heart hurts to see our old home in disrepair, and the feeling is a confusing one. The village we live in now is happy and a good place, so why do I feel so lost staring at Tiffany's trees? I can feel her shrug. Sometimes I miss it. I think I get sad when I realize I'll never see another flower bloom or go to the beach or feel a warm summer day. I miss fast food and... She sighs. Sometimes I miss my mom. Her voice grows hoarse, but I know she's safe and loved where she is. And you are safe and loved with me, I promise her, rubbing her back. Kate looks up at me in surprise. You love me? Always. Have you not guessed? For some reason, she looks indignant. I shouldn't have to guess. A girl likes to hear this sort of thing. I grin and cup her pink cheeks, feeling more like myself. I loved you the moment you appeared and stood over the others like a she-mountain. Kate makes an outraged noise, but then ruins it by laughing a moment later. You are the worst with compliments. You know that? Ah, but they all make you smile. Yeah, my standards are pretty low, it seems. She chuckles and gives my waist another squeeze. Now, shall we go see what the cave looks like? I feel better with her in my arms, smiling. She is right. I would not go back to the cave, and that time, if it meant my pretty Kate, was not there. I am. She tilts her head and gazes up at me. I love you too, you big goofball. I just want you to know that. Oh, I knew that long ago. Kate just rolls her eyes at me. Kate. It's strange to me to see how emotional Herrick gets over what looks like nothing more than another rocky cliff, this one lined with trees. But this apparently was their home once upon a time. As we walk, the expression on his face grows more thoughtful and distant until I want to grab him by the hand and do something crazy just to make him smile. Anything. I just hate seeing him hurting. Funny to think that such a happy, laughing guy like Herrick has seen so much misery and still finds a way to wake up every day with a grin. I love that about him. We move farther down into the valley and then I see it. What must have been the entrance to their cave once upon a time. There's a crumble of collapsed rock in the center of one of the cliff walls, halfway down the steep side, and it looks unnatural enough that I can guess what used to be there. 
Interestingly enough, there's a small dark wedge off to the far side that looks to be an entrance back into the cave itself. Is it not totally collapsed? I ask, curious. Not completely. Herrick tells me, releasing my hand and moving forward to examine the entrance. I follow him, plucking off my gloves. It looks pretty collapsed to me, I have to admit. Maybe it's the worry ward in me, but I don't like the look of things. The entrance is not entirely blocked, he says, gesturing at the cliff wall. You can still enter the cave, but it is not a safe home any longer. He puts a hand on the rock, then takes a step back as it tumbles to the ground at his touch. The main chamber has collapsed, and all of the smaller caves as well. We almost lost Pasho that day. He squats close to the entrance, thoughtful, but doesn't go in. If he thought crossing a glacier was safe but this isn't, it must be pretty dangerous. Pashov. He's the one with the horn that's growing back, right? Stacy's husband? I move to stand behind Herrick, keeping my hand on his shoulder. I can't see anything inside the dark cave mouth, but I'm picturing a bunch of the tribesmate moving about the cave in their daily life. If they all lived in one big cave, no wonder he's sad. The village is very different from this. I personally like the stone houses and the plumbing, but I understand his feelings. He grunts and his long face looks even sadder. He lived that day thanks to Malak's healing. We lost Eklan in the cave though. He closes his eyes and shakes his head. I am sad for him. He had many good seasons left. Oh, no. Eklon was Warak's father and the one who looked after Herak. No wonder there are so many memories here. Do you want to say a few words? Herak glances back at me. Eh? Out of respect for the dead, I clarify. To ease his spirit and yours. He looks vaguely uncomfortable. It should be Warak saying words, not me. I am not his son. He still raised you, and you can still mourn him. There's nothing wrong with that. I run a possessive hand down his long black braid. I can leave if you like. No, he says and reaches up to catch my hand. Stay at my side. I have to admit that feels good to hear. I relax next to him, ignoring the fact that my gloveless fingers are cold. Herrick's still staring thoughtfully into the cave entrance, silent. I miss you, my friend, Herrick says quietly. I know you tried to be a father to me after mine was gone, even when I did not appreciate it. Your presence is missed. He is silent for a long moment and then gets to his feet. The tribe is at a good place, and that would make you happy. There are many stone huts for the families and so many kits in the village that it would make your head spin. None from your son, but there are more humans in the tribe now, so perhaps he will resonate very soon. He grins at the cave entrance, and there's a bit of his normal, lively spirit showing. Just the other day, he... Mew. I blink, not entirely sure my brain didn't just imagine that. Did... Did you just hear a kitten? Herrick cocks his head to the side, frowning. There it is again, small and sweet and kitteny. I heard it for sure that time, I tell him. You guys have cats here on Nothoth? Really? I picture a snowy little fluff ball of adorableness. Maybe someone lost a pet cat in the cave and it had kittens. Herrick grabs his knife and steps in front of me, brandishing it. Step back, Kate. Very slowly. His gaze is locked on the cave entrance. Oh, dear. I'm starting to think that Nothoth doesn't have any cute, fluffy snowballs after all. What is it? We shall see soon enough, he promises, gripping his knife at the ready. I take a page out of his book and pull mine out of my belt sheath. He continues to nudge me away from the cave entrance, so I keep trudging backward even if it's difficult with all the snow around. Before I can ask what's going on, I hear it. A low, fierce growl. Slitted eyes, bright blue and glowing, peer from out of the cave. 
my heart leaps into my throat as a creature emerges from the cave that can only be this planet's version of a tiger or a mountain lion. It's a cat, of sorts, with shaggy white hair, long canines, and a short stubby tail. The front paws are enormous, tufted, and the back hindquarters seem to be all muscle. It's like if a bobcat went on steroids on its winter vacation. The thing stands at least as tall as my hip, and as it slinks out of the cave, it circles wide. It is starving, Herak murmurs. It will attack us. It is? It's hard to tell with all that fur, but now that I stare at it, the face looks gaunt, the eyes hollow. It hunches low to the ground in a stalking sort of motion, and I can see that the sides are painfully thin. I'm so busy studying the cat that I almost missed the second growl. Herrick mutters something that sounds like a curse under his breath. Oh, shit. A second cat emerges from the cave, this one skinny and mangy looking. The thing's back leg is crusted with dried blood and it limps as it comes out, fangs bared. A mated pair, Herrick warns, nudging me backward another step. When I tell you to run, I want you to run and not look back, Kate. Go to the hunter cave we were in last night and wait. What? No! Is he going to sacrifice himself for me? Fuck that noise. I'm staying with you. Kate, do not. I'll take the injured one, I tell him quickly. You focus on Big Daddy. We can do this, but we have to work together. Actually, I don't know if we can do this, but it sounds pretty confident to my ears. Plus, it's not like we have a ton of choices. Whatever happens, I'm not leaving him here to die. Kate, he warns again, but the big one snarls and darts toward us before he can finish that thought. Herrick flings himself on me, knocking me out of the way. My scream dies in my throat because there's a rush and the cat is on us. I turn as fast as I can in the snow, desperate to get back on my feet. My knife's a few feet away. I didn't even realize I'd dropped it, and I rush for it, gripping the bone handle and turning around. Nearby, Herrick's grappling with the big cat. The thing swipes at him, but he bats it away as if it's nothing and rolls in the snow with it, trying to pin it underneath him. He's got his knife in hand, and I watch, anxious, waiting for a chance to strike. Out of the corner of my eye, I see the other cat, the wounded one, slink forward, heading toward Herrick and its mate. Oh, no, you don't, I whisper, approaching the cat. I skirt wide around Herrick and his prey, hissing at the other cat to scare it away. It hisses back at me, withdrawing a half step, but no further. Its ears flatten, and it bears its fangs at me, shoulders hunching and ready to strike. Come on, then. The thought goes through my mind a mere second before the cat lunges at me. Panicked, I slash my knife wildly, trying to strike. The cat grabs my arm and wraps its paws around it, sinking its teeth into my sleeve. I feel sharp pricks on my skin despite my thick layers, and I choke back my scream, stabbing at the cat with my knife again. It slams into the cat's side and bounces off bone, my hand jarring backward. The cat snarls and releases me, trying to scramble away. Oh, no, you don't. I repeat under my breath. I chase after it because I'm not letting it get near Herrick. This is Hunter be hunted, and I'm not going to die on this ice ball of a planet to be kitty kibble. The thing limps toward the cliff wall, putting its back to it, and then hisses a warning at me again. I follow, my now bloody knife clutched tight in my hand. My arm burns where I was bitten, and my fingers are freezing without my gloves. Who knows where those are now? But I'm not letting this thing get away. Kate. Herrick says, voice low. I turn toward him, confused. The way he says my name isn't urgent, like that of someone in trouble. When I see him, he's still tussling with the cat, though it's on the ground and he's standing over it, knife raised. There's another ferocious snarl to my side, and then I'm knocked to the ground as the cat I've taken my eyes off of attacks me a second time. I scream as it latches onto me again, raising my arm to protect my face. The thing grabs a hold of me again and the teeth sink into my forearm. It shakes its head back and forth attacking. Kate! Herrick snarls again and then his shadow falls over us. He lifts his knife and stabs. The cat on top of me jerks and goes still and he flings it aside. Oh my God, I'm shaking. It all went so fast I hardly know what to think. 
I turn and look, and the other cat is lying in the blood-spattered snow, dead. There's something hot and sticky drying on my face, and I think it's blood, too. Oh, my God. I say again. We did it. Kate? Herrick says in a curiously sing-song way as he helps me up. Kate, Kate, Kate? I frown at him, confused. I'm here. Kate? He chants again and then focuses on my face as if seeing me for the first time. I did well, did I not? I blink, and then I realize his arms are all scratched up, his chest too. He's covered in blood, and not all of it belongs to the cat. Oh my God, are you hurt? He looks down at his chest and arms. I did well, he repeats again, distant. Kate, 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 Kate sucking on my finger. He collapses to his knees and puts his head between them, breathing deep. Kate, Kate. Oh, he's chanting my name because he's trying desperately hard not to pass out. I kneel next to him, putting my arm around his waist. You did amazing, baby. Kate sucking on my finger, he mutters again. Kate sucking on your cock, I agree. Kate licking your spur. Kate licking your tail. I'll throw all the filthy things I can think of at him if it'll help. Kate's tongue on your... He groans and then sits back in the snow. I think... I think I am good. He glances over at me. My cock is now hard, but I am good. I laugh with relief and then collapse next to him. We lie in the snow on our backs, staring up at the sky. We're both silent, me, because I'm shocked we managed to live through that, and Herrick, well, I guess he's still trying not to barf, maybe. My arms sting with the bites I've received, and I think of the cat and its fangs inches from my face, and I shudder. That was too close. Too close, and I totally panicked. I need to learn to fight better. I need... Mew. The tiny sound echoes again. I sit up, scrambling for my knife. What the fuck? There can't be more of them, can there? Herrick groans and gets to his feet a lot slower than me. They were a mated pair. No others would be with them. Unless. We both look at the entrance of the cave. Oh, I say softly. Now I kind of feel bad. I mean, they were starving, and as much as I don't want to be cat food, I also don't want the babies to die. It is nature, Herrick says. These things happen. Didn't you say that Farley has a pet Divisti? Divisti do not eat, Sa Kui, Herrick tells me. Snow cats will. Humans have cats as pets all the time, though. Not these cats. No, not these. I stare into the cave mouth torn. Every soft-hearted bone in my body can't leave a baby animal behind. I just can't. Herrick. He sighs and then cups my face in his hands and kisses me hard. When I come out, he tells me after I'm dizzy from the intense kiss, we will bandage our wounds and build a fire. I nod. Of course. You wait here. The look he gives me is stern. Right here, I promise. He picks up his knife from the snow and touches a deep scratch on his stomach. Kate. I hear him mutter as he heads toward the cave. Kate with her mouth on my finger. Kate with her mouth on my cock. I bite my knuckle as he disappears into the dark mouth of the cave. It won't collapse now. It won't. That would just be the worst luck. And if the snow cats were living there, it's surely safe enough for him to walk into for a whole minute. But I'm so tense I can't relax. All I can do is stare into the dark and wait. And then he's back, a breath or two later, a small tuft of white in his hand. He approaches me and holds it out, and I take the thing that's no bigger than Herrick's fist, its little ribs showing in its downy fur. It's two tufted ears and big, quee blue eyes and a pink mouth. The kitten looks up at me and mews. 
I don't know what the rules on this ice planet are when it comes to pets, but I do know that from this moment on, this is my cat. Hey, Fluffy, I whisper and hold it close to my chest. Chapter 12 Hark It is biting me again, I warn Kate, as the little snow cat in my hands chews on my finger. Is it supposed to do that? She chuckles and dabs at my chest. It's a kitten. It's playing with you. And those teeth are so small they won't do any damage. Now hold still. I hiss out a breath as she washes the deep scratches, my gaze focused on the tiny snow cat in my hands. I am not looking at my wounds because I do not want to see. Just because I did not pass out earlier does not mean it will not kick in with a second look. It is best to ignore it and think about more pleasant things. I mentally chant to myself the words that helped earlier. Kate. Kate with her hands on my cock. Kate's smile. Kate sucking on my finger. The kit chews on my finger again, its little claws pricking at my skin. Ow! Kate just makes a soothing sound in her throat. Maybe you should feed the little guy. Snowcat? Truly? You would feed him his own parents? The spitted skinned snowcat, the healthy one at least, is our dinner this evening and currently roasting over the fire. What? No! She looks scandalized at the thought. Give him some of your dry rations. Can kids eat that? Soften it with water, maybe? We'll think of something. A stubborn look crosses her face. We are not feeding Mr. Fluffy Puff his own mommy and daddy. I grunt and pull a bit of travel rations, seeds mixed with fat and dried meat, out of my pouch and offer a chunk to the kit. It sniffs it and then begins to lick it, the little pink tongue moving over it rapidly. At least it is no longer chewing on my finger. There, Kate says as she finishes with my chest. The wounds aren't deep and they're clean. Give it a few hours and you'll be right as rain. She hands me a fresh tunic, the spare we have packed away. Put this on so you don't have to look at things. My mate is wise. I do as she commands and she takes the kit out of my hands and murmurs sweet, soothing things to him pressing kisses to his head. Let's set up Mr. Fluffypuff with a bowl of food, shall we? I watch with amusement as she fusses over the kid, warming a bowl of water and then placing the travel rations into it. The kitten picks at the food and eventually curls up in her spread furs to sleep on the opposite side of the fire. Kate moves back to my side, and we eat our dinner, though I cannot help but frown at the bites on her arms where the snowcat managed to pierce her leathers. Do those hurt? She shakes her head. No. The only thing I have to worry about is an infection, like rabies. Do you guys have that here? I shrug, because I have never heard of this. Well, only one way to find out, I suppose, she sighs. If I start foaming at the mouth, might want to take me back to the healer. I shall keep that in mind. I pull her against me and hug her close. I do not like that you got injured. I don't like it either, she teases. But I'm really, really proud of you for not going unconscious, she beams up at me. You did amazingly well. Even though it is a little foolish, I am pleased she is proud of such a small thing. I concentrated on you, not only out of fear for what the snowcats would do to her if I fell, but of what she could do with her mouth. The distraction worked very well. Of course, now my cock gets hard just thinking of such things, but it is a small problem overall. You were very brave. She makes a small, displeased noise. I didn't feel brave. I panicked and lost my knife right at the beginning. I need to learn how to fight better. Well, the first rule to remember is to keep your grip tight. Oh? Kate looks up at me with a speculative glance and then slides her hand over the bulge of my loincloth. Keep my grip tight, you say? I groan low in my throat. That was not what I meant. Should I stop then? I growl low in my throat. No. Kate giggles and rubs my aching cock through my leathers. I thought it might be fun to give you some incentive for the next time you get wounded. Something new to think about. And she licks her lips and continues to drag her hand up and down my hard length. You do not have to, I tell her. She must have heard what I was saying to myself over and over again to stay focused as I fought the snowcats. My imagination works just fine. I want to, she says in a soft voice and puts a hand on my chest. So lean back. I do as she asks. How can I not? How can I refuse this female anything? I will lick your cunt after you are done, I promise her. This isn't tit for tat, Kate tells me, tugging at the ties to my loincloth as I lie back. This is me wanting to give you pleasure. Remember what you said the other day about how you get pleasure just 
putting your mouth on me? Well, that goes the same for me, and I want to do this. I've been looking forward to it for a while now. You just always distract me with other things. Her cheeks are pink. Tonight I want to be the one doing the distracting. Then I welcome this, I tell her, my body aching with want. My cock feels harder than it has ever been. She grins. Thought you might. She pulls apart the final knot on my loincloth and then whips it aside, tossing it into the snow. Her gaze focuses on my stiff cock. Mmm, look at that. I watch in fascination as she boldly bends over me, her thick white braid hanging over her shoulder. The tail of it tickles my thigh as she leans in closer, and then her cold fingers curl around my cock. I give a hiss of breath, but a moment later her fingers warm and she presses her lips to the head. And then I do not care if her fingers are ice. I do not care what she does so long as she puts her lips to my flesh again. Kate licks the head of my cock, capturing a bead of precum from my skin, and then closes her eyes, tasting me. Interesting. That does not sound good. Her taste on my lips is indescribably delicious. You do not like? Oh, I like. It's just not what I expected. And she leans in and gives me another long lick. I shudder, groaning. The image of her leaning over me and her pink tongue against my blue cock will be burned into my mind forever. I have something new to think about when I need to concentrate, it seems. Tell me what you like, Kate says softly, dragging her fingers up and down my length with small motions, exploring the ridges and veins along my shaft. I like all of it. Anything. Do what you like with me, I rasp. I am yours. Her satisfied smile is delightful to see. Tell me if I do something you don't like, then. Fair enough? At my nod, she curls her fingers tighter around my shaft and strokes up and down. I want to tell her to tighten her grip, to let me fuck her curled hand, but I want her to enjoy herself exploring me, so I keep silent. It takes everything I have not to thrust into her fist or to grab her by her braid and pull her mouth back down on my cock. My lungs heave with effort, and I break out in a sweat at the thought. I love how big you are, she murmurs, her voice soft and warm as her mouth skates lower. I can't wrap my fingers completely around you, and I love that. You're so thick that I imagine it must feel really good inside. I will show you, I promise her, soon enough. And then my mind is full of images of pushing Kate's pale thighs apart and sinking my thick cock into her. I groan and another drop of precum beads on my cockhead. She laps it up and then her tongue swirls over the head of my cock, dragging back and forth. Her fingers lightly dance up and down my length, as if she is trying to decide the best way to touch me. After a moment, she presses a kiss to my shaft and then gives me a curious look. Is your spur sensitive? I give her a jerky nod. So you'd like it if I stroked it? There is no breath left in my chest. I groan, my hands clenching to fists at my side. My tail thumps in the snow. If it pleases you... Baby, this is all about pleasing you tonight. Kate murmurs against my skin, her mouth hot and wet. She lightly strokes a finger up and down the length of my spur. My cock jerks, twitching in response to that small touch, because I like the thought of sucking you until you come. Her words are making it difficult for me to concentrate, as is the teasing finger moving along my spur. Then you're doing a good job. She grins and leans in until her face is almost pressed to my stomach, and then she licks my spur from base to tip. The sight of that... There are no words. I groan, my cock jerking again. Tell me what you want, she begs me. I want to see you come. If I touch her, I will not be gentle. I want this too much. Put your mouth on my cock again, I demand. She does so eagerly, closing her fingers around the base of my length to steady it. The head of my cock disappears between her lips, and then I feel her tongue dragging up and down over my skin as she takes me into her mouth. The only thing better than the way it feels is watching her do so, and I cannot help the groan that escapes me. Sweet, pretty Kate, your mouth is incredible. My female makes a sound of pleasure in her throat, and I feel it all down my length. Take me deeper, I tell her. Suck on me. She shivers and begins to pull on my cock with her mouth, and her head bobs up and down as she works my length. I put a hand in her soft hair, unable to help myself, guiding her. She makes another little moan in her throat, and her hand goes between her thighs as if she wants to touch her cunt as she suckles me. It is too much. I feel my sack tighten, feel the need building in my cock. Kate, pull away! 
but she does not, my greedy female. She only grips me tighter, working the base of my shaft as she continues to pump me into her mouth. A hoarse cry escapes me and I thrust into her mouth, unable to help myself. I put a protective hand over my spur so I do not stab her with it and push forward with my hips when her mouth lowers again. She makes a little noise of encouragement, not lifting her head, and with two more pumps I am at the edge. Kate, I pant. Kate, Kate. Then I explode, filling her mouth with my hot seed. She jerks back, the liquid too much for her to swallow, and rests on her haunches as I struggle to breathe, lost in the depths of my pleasure. Did I kill you? She teases and swipes at her chin. If you did, I have died as the happiest of hunters. I lie back on the snow, eyes closed, a smile on my face. She giggles and snuggles up beside me. I'm sorry if I seem like I keep attacking you every chance we get. You make me feel really turned on. I am not sad about this, I tell her, putting my arms around her and holding her close. I much prefer a cake that is hungry for my touch than one that wishes for me to go away. I stroke her cheek, though I hope these will always remain pink for me. If you keep saying stuff like that, they will. Kate, the next day. I'm not sure what I was expecting to see as we arrived at the spaceship. In my head, it would be a big, dark metal starship resting on the ground, like something out of Star Trek that had come to a landing. Instead, I'm surprised when we enter a valley about midday the next morning and Herrick points at a big hill of snow. There it is, the Elder's Cave. I hold Mr. Fluffypuff, who's squirming and restless after hours of travel, and adjust him in my arms. That's your spaceship? Huh. The sides are gently rounded, and it's large and long, but it doesn't match what I thought it would be. See the entrance. He points off to one side. You can smell the smoke of a campfire as well. I sniff the air, and he's right. There's a distinctive smell to a Dvisti dung fire, and it's definitely in the breeze. So where is everyone? Inside, most likely. He takes the kitten from my arms and sets it down in the snow. We will rest here for a moment, and then be on our way. We've taken a few breaks here and there to let the kitten run, since it's a pain having to travel with a small, squirming animal that just wants to play. It doesn't seem to realize that its mama and daddy are gone, and hangs around me and Herrick even when set down in the snow. I suspect he can smell the food we have on us because he's eating our trail rations like their fancy feast. He's darn cute, though, especially at this age. I worry about the size of the claws on his paws and the teeth that his parents had, but I can't abandon him. I'll figure something out. In the meantime, he gets the most ridiculous name possible so he seems less alarming to everyone else who might be worried that I'm bringing a predator home with me. Herrick pulls me against him for another kiss and we make out as the kitten plays for a moment exploring. It's amazing how much I'm attracted to him. Every time he smiles at me, I feel my pulse shoot straight down to my girl parts. Every time he laughs, my thighs squeeze together. And every time he kisses me, I want to tackle him to the snow and demand that he make love to me. It's like he's turning me into a nympho. I've never been like this before, but I'm totally craving Herrick and his touch. I kind of love it. And I'm so happy with him. When we first got here, I couldn't see how Georgie and the others could be so stinking content on an ice ball of a planet living in a hut, but I get it now. When you have the person you love at your side, it doesn't matter what the weather is or if you're sleeping in animal furs instead of thousand thread count sheets. All that matters is the love and the happiness it brings. The only thing I'm not looking forward to at the moment is the crap the other humans are going to give me. I know Summer's going to have a million questions, and Gail and Brooke will probably tease the heck out of me. Ellie won't say much, but I picture her little knowing smile and inwardly cringe. It's going to be hard for them to understand how I came from hating Herrick to being in love with him in such a short time. Sometimes, I hardly believe it myself. Come, little one, Herrick says, kneeling to the ground and putting his hands out. To my surprise, Mr. Fluffypuff scampers through the snow and bounds into his arms. Maybe these cats are smarter than Earth cats. 
Wow, that was impressive. He grins and gets to his feet, stroking the tufted ears. I am good at petting things. Oh, God, was that a sex joke? Please don't say that in front of the others. I can feel myself turning red. He just laughs. I shall save all my mating jokes for when we are in private, I promise. Thank you, I tell him primly. It's not a long walk to the ship itself, and as we get closer, I can see plumes of smoke drifting up from a small fire near the entrance and a few more drifts of smoke coming from the open doorway. Is the ship on fire? Eh? He looks over when I point, then shakes his head. No, it is cold inside, so they build a fire to warm things. With no smoke hole? I wrinkle my nose at the thought, but I guess if his people were living in caves before, it's not a big deal to make the inside of a spaceship into a cave. I'm musing on these thoughts when Herrick cups a hand to his mouth. Ho! Oh, he bellows out, startling both me and the cat, which goes bolting out of his arms. He laughs and scrambles after him, and I shield my eyes with my hand, squinting off into the distance. Ho! Oh, someone else calls back. Voice faint, and then there's a stream of people emerging from the ship. Oh, God. I feel a bit like a spotlight is shining on me, but there's nothing to do about it. Herrick returns to my side with the kitten, and then we head toward the ship and the others waiting to greet us. Beck is the first one out, followed by Vaza. They both meet us before we get close to the entrance, and Beck scowls at the sight of the kitten in Herrick's arms. What is that? My pleasure mate decided she wished to keep it, Herrick boasts proudly, looking over at me. I can feel myself turn beet red as Vaza laughs and Beck's narrowed gaze focuses on me. So, Beck says, his idea to get you alone worked, did it? Um, I'm not answering that. He snorts. <laughs> there is my answer. Herrick puts an arm around my waist. Do not bully my mate, Beck. Go bully your own. I am glad you are back, even though I questioned my support of your plan, Beck says, crossing his arms over his chest. It is becoming something of a tradition, hey? Vaza adds. Take a female away for a few days to woo her and return her to the tribe when she is soft and pleasured. Ew? I say. Ew is right, Gail says, pushing her way forward. Vaza, honey, you ain't a window. Move your ass. She moves through the men and puts her hands out for me, beaming. Girl, I am so glad to see you. I should beat your ass for running off with a man. But I forget that I'm old and gray, and maybe these things make sense when you're young and pretty like you are. I'm sorry, Gail. I really thought it was a shortcut. I shoot Herrick a look, trying not to laugh at his mock innocent expression. I squeeze her hands and then pull her forward in a hug. The tiny woman doesn't even come up to my shoulder. And you're not old and gray, you nut. That's because black don't crack, honey, she chuckles. But I am old. I'm so glad you're back, Brooke squeals, rushing forward. She flings her arms around both me and Gail, wiggling back and forth with enthusiasm. We were so worried about you. I'm fine, really. We just ran into a bit of trouble crossing a glacier. Trouble? Beck asks, turning to look over at Herrick. Herrick grimaces and hands me Mr. Fluffypuff. Perhaps we should talk about this near the fire. Kate is probably cold. She lost her gloves yesterday. Oh my God, is that a kitten? Brooke asks, gasping. Where did you get a kitten? Long story. Well, come and tell it inside. Gail says, taking my elbow and ushering me forward. She makes a shooing motion at the men. I turn and look helplessly at Herrick. He moves toward me and presses a kiss to my brow. I will join you soon, I promise. I need to speak to Beck and Vaza. Okay. I let Gail and Brooke lead me forward, stroking Mr. Fluffypuff's head. I have no idea why I'm nervous, but I am. They lead me toward the ship, and we don't stop at the fire outside, but head toward the ramp that's clear of snow and leads to the interior. Brooke and Gail are chatting casually, talking about the weather and the long walk here, and how glad they are to rest even though we have to leave again soon. 
I try to follow along in their conversation, but I'm still focused on Herrick and I wonder what he's talking to the others about. We go inside and I'm surprised anew at the inside of the ship. I don't remember the one that kidnapped me. I was unconscious the entire time, and I only remember waking up in slave cages. I didn't get to see much of the ship, but I suspect it was nothing like this spacious open interior. It really is like a gigantic cave, complete with high ceiling and dark walls that flicker with a few lights if I peer closer. There are distant doors at the far end of the long room, and in the center there's a fire pit. There's a saqui man sitting with a boy by the fire, a woman off to one side brushing what looks like a divisti, and they look up in surprise when we enter. Ho! the woman calls out in greeting. She pats the flank of the divisti, who returns to chewing, his head dipping into a large basket. She approaches, and as she does, I can see that this must be Farley. She's about my age, but she's bright blue, a fraction taller than I am and has arching horns. Her figure is slim and athletic, and she has a beaming, happy smile on her face. Welcome, sister. You must be the human Kate. And you're Farley, I say, smiling. She extends her hands, but mine are full of kitten, which she notices after a moment. Oh, what is this? This is Mr. Fluffypuff, I announce. Brooke giggles. Did you really call him that? It's ridiculous, I know, but I want them to see him as small and ridiculous. I hand him over to Brooke, who's practically bouncing with anticipation. Just be careful. He's little and scares easily. She presses a kiss to his head, her short pink pigtails bouncing. I love him. Can I have one? Not if you knew what we went through to get him. I give her a crooked smile and then hold my arm out, rolling up my sleeve. I got bit several times while fending off his mom. Farley makes an unhappy noise in her throat. You should have Harlow use the healing machine on you. Oh, they're not bad bites, I protest, a little worried. I don't know what a healing machine is, but I'm not sure it's good. Don't be silly, Gail says with a wave of her hand. They've been looking for excuses to use that thing. She peers past my shoulder over to the fire. Rook, is Harlow in the med bay? The big saqui male by the fire gives a quick nod, not getting up to greet us. The little boy at his side glances at me, but then his gaze goes back to Brooke, who's snuggling my kitten. Aw. Brooke has the same idea I do. I can watch Mr. Fluffypuff for you while you hang out with Harlow. She presses a kiss to the tufted ears. But I think we should call him Puff for short. She kneels down. Want to come see him, Rukar? The little boy gives his father an uncertain look, but the male nods and touches his son's shoulder, and the boy races over to Brooke's side. The father continues to watch me, wary. Don't worry about him, Gail murmurs. Rook's not all that good with people, but he'll warm up to you in time, I promise. He's really good to his woman, too. I think he's shy. Ah, it seems weird to equate the big hulking guy with shyness, but then again, I'm shy and I'm six feet tall, so maybe I'm not one to judge. I flash him a brief smile and let Farley and Gale lead me deeper into the ship, through the double doors that leave the big open area and turn down several twisting hallways. Where's Summer? I didn't see her. She went to the fruit cave with Warwick and Towshin, Gale says. Brooke was supposed to go with them, but bailed at the last moment. Fruit cave? My mouth waters at the thought. Yes, Farley exclaims. Many good things to eat. You will like it. She leads us through the winding hallways, her tail swishing as she walks. She looks very athletic, like a slim, younger version of Kemley. And Ellie? Napping, Gail says. She's been hit hard with morning sickness this week. She's napping a lot lately. I nod and glance speculatively at our escort. Farley's supposed to be pregnant, too, but doesn't look it. She's glowing with health. And you live here with your mate, Farley? For the bitter season, she agrees, glancing back at me. We will be leaving soon to rejoin the tribe for the brutal season. My mate, Mardok, enjoys working on the ship with Harlow, so we stay here when we can to help out. I knew they were staying at the ship for a while because Kemley talked happily about her nonstop back at the village. 
And Mardok, he's the one with the tattoos? I ask, trying to think back to the descriptions I've heard of him. Because he comes from the homeworld. That is correct, Farley says, and then turns to the side, sliding back a door that looks as if it had been mechanized at some point. The interior is brightly lit, I realize for the first time, and that means the ship is up and running to have lights inside. It's bright white in here compared to the dim main cavern of the ship and reminds me of a doctor's office. The walls are lit up with all kinds of flashing panels and one that looks an awful lot like a computer screen. Sitting across from it is a heavily pregnant redhead with a magnifier strapped to her head. She looks up when the door opens, one quee blue eye appearing enormous in the glass. Oh, she says and gets to her feet awkwardly, a hand on her stomach. Hi there. You must be Kate. I guess Herrick brought you back? There's a knowing little smile on her face, and I can feel myself turning beet red again. I would love to know what everyone's been saying about us. I can just imagine all the speculating around the fire at night. Hi. Yep. Kate. Gail chuckles and gives my arm a pat. Why don't I go start a nice stew, honey? You can eat once they're done looking at your bites. Sure, thanks, Gail. I feel a little weird being left with strangers, but that's not Gail's fault. I watch as she leaves, and the moment she walks out the door, another person enters. Harlow, I think I've found what's causing the power fluctuations, the big Saqui male begins, wiping his greasy hands with a bit of fur. I think... He pauses at the sight of me and Farley in the doorway. Oh, greetings. You must be Kate. And then he grins. Wide. I'm totally going to give Herrick a piece of my mind when I see him again. Hi, you must be Farley's mate. It's kind of obvious, given that he's covered in tattoos and his horns are a bright, shiny silver instead of the dark color that the others have. He grins even wider. I am. I would clasp your arm in greeting, but my hands are dirty. He keeps wiping at them while Farley gives him a lovesick smile that makes me wonder if I stare up at Herrick like that. Probably. Farley puts a hand on my shoulder. Kate has a few snowcat bites she needs examined. That is why we brought her, so you can scan her with the healing machine. Harlow and Mardock exchange a look. Oh, they're not bad bites, I say quickly. I'd rather not be a bother. They're healing just fine. It's not that it's a bother, Mardock says, choosing his words thoughtfully. If I thought Herrick and the others had a strange way of pronouncing human speech, Mardok's is a completely different kind of accent, almost as if he's over-enunciating, whereas the Saqui swallow their syllables. It is that the machine won't do much for you right now. Harlow moves to my side, her belly enormous. She gestures with one freckled arm. We can do some bioscans, of course, but the actual machines themselves still need a lot of parts. It's a long, complicated process, and we're not quite there yet. As long as you can check me to see that I won't have rabies, I'm good, I joke. Harlow's eyes widen. I wouldn't imagine you would have rabies, no. The Kui would take care of that, but we can scan you anyhow. Why don't you handle that, and I'll get back to work on the power converter, Mardok tells her. Come see me when you're done. Harlow nods absently, flipping her magnifying glass away from her face. She waddles over to one of the panels and presses her palm to it, activating something. Stuff begins to shift around in the wall, and I gasp at the sight. Holy crap. Behind me, there's a giggle, and I glance over my shoulder to see Farley disappearing out the door, following after Mardok. When I turn around, Harlow's just shaking her head with a grin. Newlyweds, she says. Why don't you come have a seat over here and I'll power things up? She gestures at a nearby chair, well, more like a metal box that's been set up to use as a chair, and I hesitate. Would you rather sit down? Harlow grins and just rubs the curve of her belly again. I've been sitting all morning. The interruption will do me good. I should walk around more as it is. Rook's always telling me I get too lost in my work. Her attention strays to the doorway just as the big male steps in. There he is now, she says, and her voice turns sweeter. Hi, baby. 
He comes to her side and presses a possessive kiss to her brow, then touches her stomach. How are you feeling? I'm fine. I promise. I feel amazing. She pats her stomach. You can feel the baby moving if you stick around. He nods and gives me a half glance, then leans against one of the wall panels, arms crossed. Just ignore him like he's not here, Harlow says absently, heading to my side. You don't have to get undressed or anything. She picks up something that looks a bit like a bare circuit board and carefully pushes two wires into place, then screws something on and leans in. I hear a faint whine from the circuit board, and then Harlow gives a nod. Powering up. Things are kind of rinky-dink because we're working with what we've got, but I should be able to do a medical scan. She hefts the circuit board into her arms, and as she lifts it, I wince. It's the size of a TV monitor and looks twice as heavy. Immediately, Rook pushes himself off the wall and comes to his mate's side. I will hold that for you. He takes it from her arms and holds it out, looking awkward. Tell me where you want it. She gives him a sweet smile and touches his arm as a thank you. Let me attach another wire, and then we should be good to go. She leans over the panel, jiggers with it a bit longer, and then the wine stops. All right, we're good. Hold your wrist out for me, Kate. Which wrist? I ask, rolling my sleeve up. Both arms are injured. Doesn't matter which one, she tells me, her gaze fixed on the circuit board-like thingy. It's going to do a scan of your chemical makeup, and we'll get the results from that. Okay. I bare my wrist and hold it out. Harlow punches a button on the panel, and then a small yellow circle of light swipes up and down my arm, then disappears. All done, Harlow says, beaming. Can you set that down on the table for me, Rook? I fix my sleeve as I wait, and Rook retreats to the far side of the room while Harlow putters over the readings. She makes a few exclamations, but doesn't share the information with me. Minutes pass, and she continues to tap on buttons and adjust settings. Eventually, I can't stand it any longer. What's it say? Harlow gives a little jump of surprise. Oh, I'm sorry. I got distracted. She gives me a sheepish look. I'd love to say it's pregnancy brain, but I focused on how the data was coming out instead of what the data actually was. You don't have rabies or any other bacteria or parasites. She scans over the screen again. All of your levels look good. Then her eyes widen and she looks over at me speculatively. What? I ask, curious. She leans in and drops her voice to a whisper. You didn't resonate while you were out with Herrick, did you? What? No. I can feel myself blushing again. Why? Because you're ovulating and your estrogen levels are high. She bites her lip and then tilts her head, studying me. I might be wrong on this, but from what I can tell, the cootie suppresses a lot of reproductive function unless you're resonating. The fact that all of your hormones are through the roof and you're producing eggs? If you haven't resonated, you're about to. To Herrick? I gasp. It's unexpected, but I'm still delighted. I'd love to be his mate permanently. Harlow blanches. Possibly? That's the bad thing about resonance. You don't choose. It does. I stare at her in horror. Oh my god. What if I started ovulating just now because Herrick brought me back around the others? What if my cootie's getting ready to resonate to Warwick or Taoshen? What happens if I resonate to one of them instead of Herrick the moment they get back? I need to fix this, and soon. I can't resonate to someone else. Not after I've fallen in love with Herrick. Chapter 13 Kate to say that I'm freaking out for the rest of the day would be a gross understatement. Harlow lets me hide in the lab with her for a while so I can compose myself. Some panicked crying was involved, along with a bit of mild hysteria. All I can think is that this is bad. If I was meant to resonate to Herrick, why didn't I resonate when I was alone with him? The obvious answer is that I'm not meant to resonate to him. 
and that has me losing my mind with worry. Resonance means being permanently mated to someone. It means sex with them. It means babies. I don't want anyone but Herrick. The thought of having to touch a stranger makes me want to vomit. At the same time, part of me recognizes that this makes sense. It explains why I've been attacking Herrick every chance we get and why I'm so restless at night. It explains why I feel so possessive when it comes to my kitten. My hormones are out of control. So, resonance is coming. It takes me an hour or two to compose myself. Harlow gives me space, shooting me the occasional sympathetic look as she works on her machines, moving wires and testing connections. Rook doesn't talk to me at all, his focus on his mate. And it's weird, because I'm terrified of telling Herrick what's about to happen, but at the same time, he's the only one I feel I can tell. I know he'd support me no matter what I wanted to do, because he'd want what I want. I think... I think I want to run away. Well, no, that's not quite right. I want to go away with Herrick again, to retreat out into the wild and not return until either the resonance thing is passed or I resonate to him. If I can influence this damn thing, then by golly, that's what I'm going to do. So I need an action plan. I need to talk to Herrick. Unfortunately, when I return to the campfire in the main part of the ship, Herrick isn't around. He's gone hunting with Beck and Vaza, and so I have to sit and wait for him. The others are nice enough, but they don't realize something's wrong. Gail chats up a storm while she makes stew. Either she's oblivious to my mood, or is trying to make it turn around by the sheer power of conversation. Ellie emerges and sits next to me by the fire as quiet as ever, but her smile is friendly and she's content to let Gail fuss over her. Brooke plays with Harlow's solemn little son, Rukar, and both are so obsessed with Mr. Fluffypuff that I feel like an asshole if I ask for him back. I can't exactly take a kitten from a child, can I? So I let him play with my cat, even though I want nothing more than to curl up in the blankets and hug Mr. Fluffypuff until my day gets better. Farley emerges a short time later, disheveled and smiling to herself. She hums as she picks up her weapons, whistles for her pet Divisti, and then heads for the entrance. I'm tired of sitting by the fire, so I watch her head out to leave, moving to stand by the door. You okay? Gail asks me. Just preoccupied. I cross my arms over my chest and do my best to give her a cheerful smile. At least I hope it's cheerful and not full of panic, which is how I feel. It's nothing. Missing that man of yours? She teases. Oh, God, she has no idea. Something like that? I lean against the door jamb, gazing out into the endless white snow. Farley moves fast. She's a distant blue dot already. And coming in from the other direction is... Another cluster of dots. Three figures. My heart pounds. I squint, trying to make out features. Is that two hunters and a human? Or three hunters? What if it's Warwick and Tauschen returning before Herrick does, and I resonate the moment one comes close? Panicked, I race away from the door and grab at my pack. I have to get out of here. I can't let this happen. Um, Kate? You okay? I look over at Brooke, who's sitting with little Rukar. The boy pets the kitten with careful hands, but Brooke's got a confused frown on her face as she regards me. Near the fire, both Ellie and Gail are staring at me, too. I just need to get out for a few. A breath of fresh air, I babble. I'll be back soon, I promise. I sling my outer wraps on over my tunic and pile on the furs, then belt them tight as quick as I can. Honey, do you need to talk? Gail asks, abandoning her spot by the fire to come to my side. I'll worry about you. You seem distracted. I'm fine. I just need a few minutes to myself, okay? I give her an overbright smile and then race away. Brooke, can you keep watching Mr. Fluffypuff for me? Thanks. And before anyone can say anything else, I race out the entrance and down the ramp. My boots sink into the snow. I've forgotten snowshoes. But I plow ahead, not caring. I just have to get away. How far do I need to be to avoid resonating? Fifty feet? A hundred? I follow along the side of the ship, looking for somewhere to hide. 
I know I'm panicking and being ridiculous, but I don't want to stand like an idiot by the fire and wait for the wrong person to show up. If I can help this, I'm going to hide out until the right man shows up. And then I'm going to hold on to him and not let him out of my sight. There's an outcropping of rocks a few hundred feet away, and I trudge toward it, then hunker down to watch the ship. The three dots are gone and, unfortunately, out of my line of sight. Shit. I contemplate getting up from my hiding space and going to see who it was, but it's probably a bad idea. No sense in rushing forward only to fall into the exact trap I'm trying to avoid. So I huddle behind my rock and wait. It's cold out, but not unbearable. The only thing that I miss are my gloves, so I tuck my hands between my thighs to warm them. Of course, that makes me think dirty thoughts because I imagine Herrick's hand there instead of mine. Or his mouth. I moan because I feel myself getting wet between my thighs. This sucks. I mean, it feels good, but it sucks because I want it to be Herrick, not one of the others. Wasn't it just yesterday that I was musing to myself that I could be happy here? That seems so innocent and foolish. No one ever imagines resonating to the wrong person when they picture their happy ever after. I whimper back a sob and bury my head in my hands. This is a nightmare. Footsteps crunch in the snow nearby. I wince inwardly waiting for Gail to come and lecture me about hiding in the snow or for Farley to ask what I'm doing. Or worse, for Taoshen or Warwick to make my chest start going crazy. They're nice guys, but they're not my guy. Kate? It's Herrick. Oh, thank God. A sob escapes my throat and I get to my feet, turning to face him. Hi, I manage, and then ruin my bravado with a big watery sniff. He comes to my side, all concern. Why do you hide out here? Why do you weep? What is wrong? He cups my face in his hands. Tell me. I'm so happy to see you, I weep, doing my best not to bawl. I... I have a bit of a problem. Whatever it is, we will fix it. This I promise. That just makes me want to cry harder. I don't know that we can. I take his hands in mine, an idea hitting me. I know. Let's run away. What? He looks surprised. We just arrived. I know, but that's all right. We can head back the way we came. I'll get the language dump some other time. It's not a big deal. We can say we want to go home and just head out right now ahead of the others. And we can take as many shortcuts as you want. I put my hands on his chest and give him my sexiest look. We can tell them I kidnapped you to have my sexy way with you instead of the other way around. He tilts his head, then leans forward, sniffing at my breath. Have you been in the Sasa? What? No. You are not acting like yourself. He puts a hand on my shoulder. While I like the thought of you and I together in the furs alone, I worry about your safety. Until I can make sure that I do not lose consciousness if I break my leg again, I think it is best if we stay with the others this time. I'm ovulating, I blurt out. Herrick stares at me, then frowns. Off you. I'm about to resonate, I explain, and I worry that it's not going to be you. So I thought if we go away together, we could make sure that it's you. I grab the front of his vest and try for a light, playful laugh and just end up sounding a little hysterical. Want to be my mate? He blinks. Resonance. Are you certain? Harlow scanned me and said so, yeah. I bite my lip. And I've been feeling really frisky lately. So can we please, please get out of here? Just you and me? I know I'm asking for the ridiculous. I know there will be a ton of explaining to do. I know there's a million reasons why it's stupid for us to bail out, and I'm mentally cringing, waiting for him to tell me that it's a terrible idea. But he just leans in and gives my mouth a light kiss. Of course. When shall we leave? I sob out of sheer relief and fling my arms around him. God, I love you so much. Thank you. Why do you thank me? He sounds amused, his big hands stroking my hair. Did you think I would abandon you to another? Do you think I want any other mate than you? 
I press my face against his chest, warm and delicious despite the rough tunic he's wearing. I love him so much. No other man can make me laugh, can push me as much as he does, and no one else makes me feel so perfect and dainty, like a lady. I don't want to be anyone's lady but his. I'm not sure he realizes what he's getting into. I just... What if you're not ready to be a parent? Are you ready? I choke back a half laugh, half sob. No? Then we will be completely unprepared together. He rests his chin on my head. I do not care if we are the tribe's worst parents as long as we are together, my mate. You have been mine since the moment you landed here, standing above all the others like a tree with its head in the clouds. That is a terrible, terrible analogy, and I love you anyhow. He chuckles and caresses my cheek. You have my heart, my sweet mate. Never doubt this. If you wish, we will leave. If we hide away together and we do not resonate, what will you do then? My heart breaks at the thought. Um, live away from the tribe permanently? He nods. I agree with this plan. You do? I lean back to look up at him in surprise. You'd give up your tribe for me? Herrick strokes my cheek, and there's such a loving, intense look on his face that it makes my heart feel as if it's shattering into a thousand pieces. Of course. You are my mate and my heart. How could I do anything less? That just makes me cry harder. But what if you're meant to resonate with Summer or Brooke? What if I'm keeping you from them? Then they will just have to wait until I am tired of you. He leans in and presses a kiss to my nose, which will be never. I'm a sucker for all of these kisses. I tilt my face up so he can claim my lips and swallow my little sigh of pleasure when he does. If he's trying to distract me, it's working. There's nothing more exciting than his mouth on my mouth, unless it's his mouth on my skin. We break apart and I suck lightly on his lower lip, letting him know that I'm more than ready for additional kisses. He groans and gives me another quick, fierce kiss. You are cold. I should get you your furs. And we should be on our way soon if we're going to get to the nearest hunter cave before it's dark. I nod, but I don't release my arms from around his neck. I cling to him, wanting to stay in his embrace for as long as I can. It's already getting dark. Is that bad? We will hurry. He promises me with another kiss and a caress to my butt. I do not want you resonating to another either. I grin at that. What are we going to tell the others? I am going to tell them that you were so hungry for my cock that you tackled me as I approached and demanded that I meet with you in a private cave where you can scream as loud as you want. That's too close to the truth to even be funny. Um. Or you could tell them that I'm shy about us being together and we changed our minds about staying on the ship. If you prefer. The grin he gives me is classic Herrick. So long as this evening ends with you in my arms, I do not care where we go. Oh, I'll be in your arms and in your pants and everywhere in between, I tell him breathlessly. We're sealing the deal tonight. Enough foreplay. I want you inside me. Herrick's teasing smile fades and is replaced by a look of such intense lust that I press my thighs together tightly. All the more reason for me to hurry. Wait here. He turns to head back to the ship, pauses, and then crosses back to me. He pulls me into his arms and hauls me against him for a deep, searing kiss full of tongue and promise. When I'm completely dazed, he releases me, gives a little nod as if to reassure himself, and then marches off toward the ship. I sit down on the rock, my knees weak. Hark. My mind is racing as I storm into the elder's cave and grab our things. It grows dark outside, which means I must return to my cave quickly, but there is so much to take in in order to be prepared. Still, this must happen. I cannot let her go alone. 
I dare not let her return to the cave, not if what she says is true and she will resonate. She wants to be with me. I want her to be with me. It makes sense for us to escape together. My heart feels as if it stops in my chest every time I think of my Kate resonating to another. Smiling at another as he takes her into his furs. My tall, pretty Kate with her cloud mane resting on another male's shoulder. My Kate with her belly rounded with another male's kit. I die inside at the thought and rush to shove more furs into the closest pack. Harak? It is Vaza. I cannot talk now, my friend. I must take Kate away from here. Away? But you just got here. He sounds confused. You are packing already? This makes no sense. I know it does not, I tell him. But my female wishes to leave and I will honor her decision. Phrah, Vaza says. His boot is on the fur I am currently trying to roll up, and I tap on his leg to get him to move. She is young, your female. She will change her mind a dozen times. Tell her to stay. My chael will feed her, and she can get the words put in her mind like the others. Not now, Vaza. I grab up my pouch of rations and shake it. Nearly empty. The kitten has been eating all of it. I curse under my breath and try to think, rubbing my face. I need supplies. You do not. You should stay. We have missed your company on this trip. Vaza tries to take the pack from my hands. Just when we were to enjoy your laughter by the fire once more, surely you will not... Leave him alone. I glance up as Ruch stalks forward, moving to my side. He has a heavy pouch in his hand and offers it to me with a little nod. He has something he must do. I stare at Ruch. He knows. He knows I will take my mate away, so she will remain my mate. Grateful, I take the pouch and stuff it into my pack, clawing at the nearest fur to try and make it fit in. Each moment that passes is another moment that my Kate is left outside alone. Each moment is another that the others might return and someone will resonate to her. I gather the furs into my arms and fling the pack onto my back. I will fold everything neatly later when we are at the hunter cave alone together. I am sorry, I tell them. I cannot stay. Not tonight. But it's dark. Shale protests by the fire. Isn't it dangerous? It will be fine, Rook says. He pulls his knife from his belt sheath and offers it to me. We will watch your poof for you. Poof? I blink, trying to recall what poof is. Then I realize he means the tiny snowcat with the terrible name. I look over and see the others gathered by the fire, all staring at me with wide eyes. Rukar has the kitten in his lap, fast asleep under his small, stroking hand. Ah, yes... You have my thanks, friend. He nods. And when you return, perhaps you will tell me how to get one for my son. I shall. I clasp his shoulder in thanks, juggle my furs, and then rush back out into the cold and the snow. Already the suns go down behind the mountains, and twilight makes the air pick up a chill. My poor Kate will be cold, her hands frosty without her mittens. She will not like the walk to the hunter cave, but we will be fast. I know she can keep up and we have no choice. In the dark I see the faint glow of her eyes in the distance. She sits on the rock still, waiting for me. I come, I shout to her, jogging through the snow as I follow the long wall of the elder's cave. The only response I get is a breathless moan. Worried, I speed up, racing to her side. Are you injured, my pretty Kate? No, she moans again. I think it's starting. As I approach, I can see that she still sits on the rock, but her hands are shoved down the front of her leggings. Her face has a look of intense concentration on it, and at first I think she shivers. Then I realize she is not shivering. She is rubbing herself, her hand on her cunt. I growl low at the sight, a surge of possessiveness rocking through me. My mate, mine. I approach the last few steps slowly, fascinated by the sight before me. Such need and lust as I have never felt before courses through my body, and I watch as her hand moves in her leggings, her mouth forming a perfect circle as she pleasures herself. I did not realize I was gone for so long that you would start without me, I murmur. It's not funny, she half laughs, half sobs. I was thinking about you, and it got me all turned on, and I couldn't help myself. God, this is awful. Then let me do it for you, I tell her, tossing down the pack and the blankets in the snow. Do what for me, she pants nervously. Ease you, pleasure you, whatever you wish to call it. I move to where she is perched on the rock and pull her hand gently from her pants. 
The scent of her wafts up to me, stronger than I have ever experienced, and my mouth floods with hungry saliva. I take her hand and lift it to my mouth, sucking her juices from her fingers. She gasps. Oh, Herrick. You are my mate, I tell her, licking her fingers. Let me ease you. I press a kiss to her palm and then release her hand, tugging on her leggings. Kate moans and lies back on the rock, spreading her legs wide. Right here? Right now? Here, I agree, because I do not think I will be able to walk with how stiff my cock is. It does not matter. My mind is full of nothing but Kate. Kate's scent, Kate's taste, Kate's touch. No one will come to see. They are warm by the fire. She shivers but makes no protest when I pull her leggings down to her knees, exposing her sweet cunt to the air. Sh should we? Do you wish to travel while you are aching? I ask, and press a kiss to the pale curl, shielding her cunt from my gaze. Her response is a low moan. No? Then let me pleasure you. I drag the leggings off of her and then press a kiss to the inside of her thigh. Her flesh is chilled already, and when she shivers I worry that it is not all enjoyment. I give her a teasing flick of my tongue, then get up. Her little protest is delightful to hear, and I pluck one of the thick furs off the ground and toss it over her bare legs. I cannot have my pretty pleasure mate freezing while I try to lick her cunt. Kate gasps when I duck my head under the blankets and pull her down against me. Now both of our bodies are under the blanket, my head entirely covered. This way she is warm, and she is shielded in case anyone should come upon us. My tail flicks with arousal at the thought. Though I know Kate would hate it, I like the thought of the others seeing me claim her, knowing that she is completely and utterly mine. With a low growl, I bury my face into her soft folds and drag my tongue over her wetness. Oh, dear God, she moans. Herrick, please. I know what she wants. I have thought about nothing else. My tongue finds her third nipple, her clit, and I begin slow, steady strokes over it. Her cry tells me that I have indeed hit the mark, and the swift jerk of her hips indicates that she will not last long. Already my Kate is close to the edge, her lush folds wet and ready. I want to lick every drop of her juices, but I know she needs my tongue on her clit. Over and over I lick it in the slow, steady motions that made her so excited last time, and I press a finger to her entrance, testing her reaction. Her thighs jerk near my head, and her hands grip my horns under the blankets. Oh, yes, Herrick, just like that. That is all the signal I need. I thrust a finger into her core, and her breathless little gasp of response makes me nearly spill in my loincloth. I pump into her with my finger, working her with my tongue and hand at once. Over and over I taste her juices on my lips, and it drives me to continue. There is no sweeter taste, and today... She seems to taste better than ever. There is nothing like it, and I could happily spend the rest of my days here under this blanket between her thighs. Kate quivers all over, a moan rising in her throat. Her legs jerk against me, and I can feel her cunt tightening around my finger. I groan into her folds because I want nothing more than to bury my cock where my hand is. I want to claim her as mine, fill her with my seed. Mine, my mate— my lovely, tall, strong, pink Kate with her cloud of hair. Mine. Forever. She gives a low cry, and then I feel a rush of her wetness against my tongue. She comes, hips rocking against my finger, her hands clenched tight on my horns, her clit on my tongue as I continue to lick her, wanting to draw out her pleasure. Eventually she shivers and pushes my head away, and it takes every ounce of my strength to pull back. I want to keep licking her, to have her taste on my tongue for hours. I am craving her like no other. Kate gasps, and I lift my head out from under the blankets. Her hands are clasped over her chest, and she stares, eyes wide. Do you hear it? My heart feels as if it stops in my chest. You are resonating? She nods, a dazed look on her face. It's like a low hum. No. More of a purring. Oh, it feels so strange. Come listen. Instead of doing as she asks, I pull the blanket down over her thighs and cover her. I do not want another to come up and see her nakedness, not when it will embarrass her. As I do, I look around, waiting. Whoever she is resonating to must be near. My cui is silent, and it feels as if there is nothing but ice in my chest. 
Harak? She reaches for me, still sprawled on the rock. Are you okay? I gaze around us, but I see nothing. No one. Only snow in the twilight skies. Who are you resonating to? Do you know? I have this sudden and violent urge to attack whatever male comes close to her. I don't know, Kate says, sitting up. Her hand presses to her breast again, and a look of utter disappointment crosses her face. It's not you? I shake my head. If it were, I would feel it. All I feel is gnawing, furious jealousy, mingled with the ache of my cock and... And... Oh, perhaps it is me after all. Chapter 14 Harak I press a hand to my chest, my heart pounding with hope. There is a small murmur in my body, a flutter against my heart. I wait, holding my breath, willing my emotions to stop going wild so I can concentrate. There it is, soft, steady, and growing louder. Resonance. I grab Kate and drag her off the rock, laughing and triumphant. It is me. It is? She gives a little cry of joy and flings her arms around my neck. Are you sure? Here, listen. I set her down and rip at the strings of my tunic, revealing my chest to the cold air. She presses her face against my skin, and we are both silent, waiting. There it is. The rumbling song of my quee grows greater with every passing moment. I can feel it now, all the way to the tip of my tail and down the length of my cock. Resonance, hard and sure. I thought it would come on like a lightning bolt, but it seems mine is like a wave crashing over my body. Slow to build and then impossible to stop. Mm, I hear it, Kate says happily her voice husky. Her hand slides into my tunic, moving against my skin. She straightens, gazing up at me. And another surge of need rocks through me, another crashing wave of hunger. I grab my mate and pull her against me in a kiss. She moans and tears at my tunic, urgency in her touch. I feel it, too. With the resonance pushing through us, it seems imperative to mate. Right here, right now. No waiting. Time to claim my female, just as I have always wanted. I snarl and bear her down to the snow. Her mouth remains locked on mine, her tongue sliding against my own with frantic need. Her legs are bare, and I can feel the heat of her cunt as I pull my loincloth off, freeing my cock. Blanket, she murmurs between frantic kisses. Need blanket? I grab the fur off the rock and pull her against me with my other arm, hauling her smaller body against mine. Her limbs go around me, arms locked around my neck, legs around my hips. Her need is as great as mine. Within moments I have the fur spread out onto the snow and my loincloth off. I bear her back down and then we are both panting, struggling to pull off our leathers so we can touch skin to skin. Never have I felt such urgency, such need. Harak, faster, she moans, and I know she is feeling the same thing. All rational thought has gone away, leaving only a ravenous beast in its place. A beast that is resonating oh so sweetly for his mate. But this is also my Kate, and even as I fall over her, my weight pressing her down into the furs, I am aware that I do not wish for her to be frightened of me. I claim her mouth with my own, kissing her deeply. I will try to go slow. Fuck slow, she breathes, and digs her nails into my back. Her leg hooks around my waist and she raises her hips. I need you. Yes, I will fuck slow. No, she pants. I mean, don't go slow. Go as fast as you need to. Make me yours. Oh. With a groan, I hold her against me, my hand going to her raised hip. I anchor her body to mine, settling my cock against her. Her cunt is hot and slick, and I drag my length up and down her folds, wetting it. She pants my name as I do, as eager as I am to fulfill resonance. I guide my cock to her entrance and push slightly, testing her reaction. She sucks in a breath and holds tight to me. Is this all right? I ask. Kate nods. Keep going. I'll let you know when to stop. I push forward, and then it feels impossible not to slowly push into her. She is tight and hot and oh, so, so good. I have never felt anything like this before. Not even her mouth compares to the suck of her tight cunt around my length. I go slowly because I know it is her first time and I want her to enjoy this. She makes a little noise of protest, then bites down on her lip. I lean in and kiss that lower lip, wanting to take away her discomfort. 
my mate, my Kate, my female, mine forever. The thought fills me with such intense pleasure that my hips jerk involuntarily. She makes a startled noise and the thrum of her resonance grows louder. Oh, did I hurt you? I think I felt your spur. Her words are choked. I put a hand between our bodies and I can feel my spur nestled in the slick heat of her folds. Is it bet? Fuck no, she breathes. It's hitting my clit when you push forward. Her nails dig into my skin again. I'm going to need you to do that again, baby. This I can do for her. I want to chuckle, but there is no room left in my body for humor. There is only Kate and resonance and the intense need to fill her, to mate with her, to become one with her. I stroke into her again, keeping my movements slow and steady as she likes when her cunt is licked. The air hisses between her teeth. Oh, my God. Her eyes close and she tilts her head back. So good. I grit my teeth because her reactions are making it hard for me to keep control. I want nothing more than to ram into her, to pound her sweet cunt with my cock until I spill violently inside her. To try and calm myself, I think of blood. I think of her pricking my finger with the awl as I slowly thrust into her again, rocking my hips in a smooth motion. But that makes me think of Kate with her mouth on my finger, sucking. Kate with her mouth gliding over my cock, exploring me. And suddenly I am not thinking about blood at all. Just Kate. The resonance song of my quee is so strong it is overwhelming my thoughts. Kate, I... Faster, she breathes. I need you to move faster. Never was a word so sweet. I try to keep control, but my movements begin slow and speed up despite my best efforts. Kate does not seem to mind, though. She meets every thrust of my cock, every surge of my hips, every pound into her body with eager cries, and they drive me on. I move faster, rougher, until I am pounding into her, unable to slow down. We are carried along in resonance, our bodies meeting with a fierce slap of skin each time I rock into her. Kate is senseless with need. Her cries carry through the snowy landscape, and I want to tell her to quiet down, but I am making just as much noise. My groans match hers, and the pleasure is so intense, I do not care if the entire cave is out in the snow watching us. All I care about is my mate writhing under me. She gives a hoarse little cry, and then her thighs lock hard around my waist. I feel it the same moment she does. Not only is the queen in my chest singing so wildly that my entire body shakes with the force of it, but I can feel her cunt tightening around my cock as she comes to her peak. Her cry turns into a wail, and I feel her shuddering as it overtakes her, and her pleasure affects mine. With a fierce surge, I pump into her, on the edge myself. Heat rises in my cock, and I can feel my sack grow tight and heavy. A new sensation. In the next moment, I lose control. With a shout, I pour myself into her, filling my mate with my seed as I thrust deep. Over and over, it feels as if I am emptying my entire self into Kate, until I collapse atop her, spent and panting. She holds me close, silent. The only sound is that of our harsh breathing and the distant call of a hunting scythe beak. My chest still sings its song, my quee as relentless as it was before. Mine has not stopped, I feel I have to point out. Kate giggles. Mine hasn't either. I guess we'll have to do this again. She pushes a sweaty lock of hair off her face. Once we catch our breath, of course. Of course. I press a kiss to her soft shoulder. Are you cold? Not with your body covering me. She tightens her legs around my hips and gives a little wiggle that makes my cock stir. I like the way you feel. I like the way you feel, too. Especially your cunt. She chuckles again. So, what do we do now? I kiss her shoulder again, and when she obligingly tilts her neck so I can kiss it, I continue on, letting my mouth trail over her fragrant, lovely skin. Do you still want to escape to a hunter cave? Seems kind of silly now. I guess we can go inside the ship and do the walk of shame. Walk of shame? Long story. Basically, it's an everyone-knows-you-are-having-sex retreat back to your bunk. Ah, then yes, I will do this walk of shame with you. I twine a curly lock of her mane around my finger, fascinated by it. I will do everything with you, my Kate. She sighs happily, her arms tightening around me. We can go back then. Everyone seemed nice. They are nice. Do not let Ruch or Mardok scare you. I picture the big males. 
Rook is not very friendly, and Mardok, well, he looks odd. Scare me, with his facial art. Oh, his tattoos? She snorts. Those don't scare me. I can't believe you haven't noticed mine yet. I lean back on my elbows, surprised that I have forgotten such a thing. I remember, but I have not seen it. Where? Yep. She wiggles underneath me again, and my cock surges to life. It's on my butt cheek. It's just a flower, though. I shall have to see this and lick this for myself. Kate's mouth quirks in another smile, and then her expression grows serious. I'm glad it was you, Harak. I am glad, too. There is a knot in my throat. The words do not seem like enough. Never have I wanted something so badly. I am the luckiest hunter ever to have received it. I will do my best to be worthy of my glorious mate. She bites her lip. I'm not sure I'm ready to be a parent, though. What about you? I shrug and cannot help but tease. We have just adopted a kitten. How much harder can a kit be? My mate stares at me. Hard. Please tell me you're joking. I let my grin slip. I am joking. I lean down and give her a light kiss. I welcome any kit that we have together. I love the thought. Kate sighs with relief and gives my shoulder a little slap. You're the worst. I am the best. She sighs again, this time happily. You are. Epilogue. Summer. The fruit cave is quiet as heck. It's so quiet I swear I can hear myself thinking. Not that that's a good thing. I like noise. I like conversation. With Warwick, there's neither. I've never met anyone so quiet. He doesn't make a sound when he walks, always choosing his steps carefully. He doesn't bang baskets around or scrape at his weapons all day long like some of the other hunters. He's always so silent. And talking? Out of the question. I think since we left on this stupid little trip, Warwick said three words to me. He pointed at the cave and said, there it is. That's the extent of the conversation I've had in the last day. It sucks. I tried talking to him, but he just stares at me, or worse yet, doesn't even look at me. It makes having a conversation pointless. I never thought I was much of a people person, but I'm definitely not a silence person. I sigh and pick a mango-like pink thing off of a vine and stick it into my basket. I don't know how much fruit we're supposed to be picking, so I just keep filling baskets of stuff that looks ripe. Warak hasn't corrected me. He just hands me another basket and sends me on my way when I fill one. It makes me grumpy. It also makes me grumpy that Tauschen abandoned us the moment we set off. As soon as he heard Brooke bailed out, he shut down and took off on his own. Now I'm stuck with tall, blue, and silent in a cave that feels like a sauna full of fruit that I'm picking instead of eating. This must be what hell is like. What do you suppose this tastes like? I blurt out as I pull another one of the mango things off the vine. Tomato? Apple? Pear? I guess you wouldn't know those because those are earth fruits, but they're kind of sweet and tasty. Well, not the tomato. I guess tomatoes are technically fruit, but they're more acidic and tart and not eaten like a fruit. We tend to slice them up and put them in sandwiches and make sauces out of them, which I suppose is kind of like fruit too. If you think about it, Tomato sauce is just like fruit jelly, but on pasta. Oh, God, what the fuck am I even saying? Shut up, shut up, shut up, Summer. Warwick just makes a grunt to indicate he's heard me, but doesn't contribute to my inane conversation. Why would he? I sound like an idiot to my own ears. I'm just so tired of the silence, though. There's nothing but the drip of condensation falling from the leaves in here, the artificial lights flickering overhead. It's pretty and covered in vines and reminds me of a bird sanctuary from a zoo back at home, minus the birds. I'd welcome birds because then at least there'd be noise. How many more baskets do we need? I pause in my plucking and turn around to face my silent companion. Are we bringing less in since Tauschen left? Or do we need to make up his slack and pick some extra? If we do, how are we going to carry it back? I mean, we could always jig a sled of some kind, but I thought this was going to be a quick excursion. I mean, not that quick since we stayed overnight and all, but you get the drift. 
Warwick looks up from his careful packing of the fruit and blinks at me with those bright blue glowing eyes. He's unfathomable. And he's still silent. God. You know what? I'll just go back to picking, I tell him, mentally shooting darts at both his head and mine. Him for being mute and me for babbling to fill the silence. But he cocks his head animal-like and gets to his feet, a frown of concern on his face. Uh-oh, what's going on? I ask, moving to his side. The fruit cave has a lot of narrow ledges that mean walking close together or worse, rubbing up against each other. I'm a small woman, but Warwick's definitely not on the petite side. He's all muscle, like all of these hulking aliens. Is it Tao Shen? What do you hear? He puts a finger to his lips, indicating silence, and then heads out to the entrance. I set down my basket and follow behind him, frustrated and curious all at once. We step out onto the hidden ledge tucked into the cliff, and immediately, arctic-feeling air blasts my face, making my damp hair ice up and my body shiver. I hug my arms to my chest and gawk at the sky, unable to believe what I'm seeing. It's a spaceship. Not just any spaceship. I'm pretty sure it's the one that brought us and dropped us here. The sleek length of it is the same, as is the black metal and the elegant wings. I watch as it glides down through the valley and then settles down off into the distance, near where the Elder's Cave is parked, if I don't miss my guess. We can see a long way off from here, and while a lot of ice and mountains look the same, I suspect that's the ship's destination. It's the Tranquil Lady, I breathe now that I know the name. Mardok told me. Holy cow, this is unexpected. What is it doing here? I thought they weren't coming back, ever. I glance up at Warwick. Do you know anything about this? He stares at the ship, then shakes his head. Are they bringing more slaves? I press. Slowly, he shakes his head again. I do not think they should be here. Great. The only words he's said in two days are scary ones. This concludes Barbarian's Lady by Ruby Dixon. Narrated by Holly.